Tales of H.P. Lovecraft. Major works by H.P. Lovecraft. Tales of H.P. Lovecraft. Major works by H.P. Lovecraft. Selected and introduced by Joyce Carol Oates. Introduction Copyright 1997 by Ontario Review Incorporated. Read by Conrad Feininger. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Library of Congress Annotation Ten Gothic Tales by Howard Phillips Lovecraft, 1890-1937, of Providence, Rhode Island. In the Rats in the Walls, a man succumbs to cannibalism. In the Dunwich Horror, a father mates his daughter with a creature from another world. Selected and introduced by Joyce Carol Oates. Some Strong Language, 1997. From the Book Jacket After decades of neglect, the extraordinary work of horror writer H.P. Lovecraft is brought to light by one of America's leading novelists. When he died in 1937, destitute and emotionally and physically ruined, H.P. Lovecraft had no idea that he would come to be regarded as the godfather of the modern horror genre, nor that his work would influence an entire generation of writers, including Stephen King and Anne Rice. Now at last, the most important tales of this distinctive American genius are gathered in one volume by National Book Award-winning author Joyce Carol Oates. Combining the 19th-century Gothic sensibility of Edgar Allan Poe with a daring internal vision, Lovecraft's tales foretold a psychically troubled century to come. Set in a meticulously described, historically grounded New England landscape, his harrowing stories explore the collapse of sanity beneath the weight of chaotic events. Lovecraft's universe is a frightening shadow world where reality and nightmare intertwine and redemption can come only from below. In her perceptive and penetrating introduction, Oates, herself a virtuoso of the Gothic style, explains how Lovecraft's singular talents fused the supernatural and the mundane into a terrifying, complex, exquisitely realized vision. Joyce Carol Oates received the Bram Stoker Award from the Horror Writers of America. A member of the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, she is the Roger S. Berlin Distinguished Professor in the Humanities at Princeton University. She lives in Princeton, New Jersey. About the Author H.P. Lovecraft was born in 1890 in Providence, Rhode Island. Best known for his short fiction, Lovecraft is considered by many to be the godfather of the modern horror genre. About the Editor Joyce Carol Oates is the author of numerous works of fiction, poetry, criticism, and drama. Among her most recent books from Echo are What I Lived For, the Perfectionist and Other Plays, George Bellows, American Artist, First Love, and The Essential Dickinson for the Echo Essential Poets series. A past recipient of the National Book Award and a member of the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, she is the Roger S. Berlin Distinguished Professor in the Humanities at Princeton University. Contents Introduction Side 1, Tone 2 the Outsider, Side 1, Tone 3. The Music of Erich Zahn, Side 1, Tone 4. The Rats in the Walls, Side 1, Tone 5. The Shunned House, Side 2, Tone 1. The Call of Thulu, Side 3, Tone 1. The Color Out of Space, Side 3, Tone 2. The Dunwich Horror, Side 4, Tone 1. At the Mountains of Madness, Side 5, Tone 1. The Shadow Over Innsmouth, Side 8, Tone 1. The Shadow Out of Time, Side 10, Tone 1. H.P. Lovecraft, An Introduction The most merciful thing in the world is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. H. P. Lovecraft, The Call of Thulu In writers like Henry James and Edith Wharton, the Gothic tale may compensate a conventional, restrictive life. 
In others, notably Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft, the Gothic tale would seem to be a form of psychic autobiography. The American writer of the 20th century most frequently compared with Poe, both in the quality of his art, bizarre, brilliant, inspired, and original, yet frequently hackneyed, derivative, and repetitive, its thematic preoccupations, the obsessive depiction of psychic disintegration in the face of cosmic horror perceived as truth, and its critical and commercial reception during the writer's truncated lifetime, dismal, is H. P. Lovecraft of Providence, Rhode Island, 1890-1937. Like Poe, Lovecraft created a small but highly distinctive body of work carved by monomaniac passion out of a Gothic tradition already ossified in the mid-nineteenth century. Like Poe, though more systematically than Poe, Lovecraft set forth an aesthetics of the art to which, by temperament and family history, he was fated. Lovecraft's frequently updated essay, Supernatural Horror in Literature, 1927, is a pioneering effort. Both tried to sell their writing and editing skills in a debased and demeaning marketplace with little financial reward, burning themselves out in the process. Both were beset by dreams, nightmares, visions. Both entered upon brief, disastrous marriages, though there are bleakly comical overtones to Lovecraft's marriage to a woman seven years his elder. Both left no heirs. Both died prematurely, poet forty, Lovecraft at forty-seven, having egregiously mistreated their bodies. Though Poe is far more renowned than Lovecraft, indeed and ironically now a canonical figure in American literature, he who had died penniless and scorned, both writers have had an incalculable influence on succeeding generations of writers of horror fiction, and Lovecraft is arguably the more beloved by contemporary Gothic aficionados. Poe is credited with the invention of the mystery detective story, and with the perfection of a certain species of surreal, ahistoric, claustrophobic, and boldly surreal monologue, of which the telltale heart is the masterwork. Lovecraft, with the fusion of the Gothic tale and what would come to be defined as science fiction, and with the development of a species of horror fantasy set in meticulously described, historically grounded places, predominantly in Lovecraft, Providence, Rhode Island, Salem, Massachusetts, and a region in north-central Massachusetts to which he gave the name the Miskatonic Valley, in which a seemingly normal, intelligent scholar or professor, usually a celibate bachelor, pursues a mystery it would be wiser for him to flee. The remarkably detailed, intensely imagined The Dreams in the Witch House, set in Arkham, Salem, The Color Out of Space, set in the Blasted Heath, west of Arkham, and The Shadow Over Innsmouth, set in Innsmouth, Newburyport, Massachusetts, are of this type, in which place itself would seem to generate horror. Where Poe's settings are minimally if hysterically depicted like brushstrokes laid on with a trowel, Lovecraft's most evocative stories are set in regions that seem real enough at the outset, like photographs just perceptibly blurred. Lovecraft's mystical identification with his settings in rural Massachusetts and colonial antiquarian towns like Salem, Marblehead, and Providence suggests a mock transcendentalism in which spirit resides everywhere except possibly in human beings. To all intents and purposes, I am more naturally isolated from mankind than Nathaniel Hawthorne himself, who dwelt alone in the midst of crowds. The people of a place matter absolutely nothing to me except as components of the general landscape and scenery. My life lies not in among people, but among scenes. My local affections are not personal, but topographical and architectural. It is New England I must have, in some form or other. Providence is part of me. I am Providence. From a letter of 1926. In this celebrated opening of The Picture in the House, 1920, the nature of Lovecraft's infatuation with landscape is vividly rendered. Searchers after horror haunt strange, far places. For them are the catacombs of Ptolemaeus and the carven mausolea of the nightmare countries. They climb to the moonlit towers of ruined Rhine castles and falter down through cobwebbed steps beneath the scattered stones of forgotten cities in Asia. The haunted wood and desolate mountain are their shrines, but the true epicure and the terrible, to whom a new thrill of unutterable ghastliness is the chief end and justification of existence, esteems most of all the ancient, lonely farmhouses of backwoods New England. For there the dark elements of strength, 
solitude, grotesqueness, and ignorance combine to form the perfection of the hideous. Howard Phillips Lovecraft, who boasted of having descended from unmixed English gentry, was the only son of an ill-fated marriage between a traveling salesman for a Providence silversmith company and the daughter of a well-to-do Providence businessman. His father began to exhibit symptoms of dementia, paranoia, mania, and depression when Lovecraft was two years old. A victim of untreated syphilis, he died in an insane asylum when Lovecraft was seven. Lovecraft's mother was an emotionally unstable person who seems to have been, according to biographers, both abnormally attached to her only child and critical of him. Her fear of change and of the world beyond her household was extreme. Already in early childhood, Lovecraft suffered from violent dreams and nightmares. He called these afflictions, to which he would give minute expression in his tales, the night gaunts. Many of Lovecraft's stories read like pitilessly transcribed dreams, of which The Dreams in the Witch House is the most elaborate account of a descent into hallucinatory madness. In this nightmare fantasy, a student of mathematics and folklore rents a room once inhabited by a witch fleeing the Salem jail in 1692. Lovecraft seems to have taken for granted that Salem witches existed, not considering if perhaps they were simply victims of others' malevolent misuse of power. Like Poe, Lovecraft focuses upon interiors, the interior of the soul. His subject is the continuous assault of unconscious forces of dissolution, disintegration, the collapse of sanity beneath the weight of chaos, the triumph of mindless entities like the subterranean deities Azathoth and Nyarlathotep, and the mad faceless god who howls blindly in the darkness to the piping of two amorphous idiot flute players, the rats in the walls. It was Lovecraft's observation that the successful Gothic tale replicates the paralysis and horror of a certain kind of dream. I believe that, because of the foundation of most weird concepts and dream phenomena, the best weird tales are those in which the narrator, a central figure, remains, as in actual dreams, largely passive, and witnesses or experiences a stream of bizarre events which flows past him, just touches him, or engulfs him entirely from a letter of 1936. Yet this matter-of-fact statement gives no idea of the remarkable simulacra Lovecraft frequently evokes in his dreamscapes, which linger in the reader's visual memory like those horrific yet somehow natural-seeming monsters of Hieronymus Bosch. Bravely, Lovecraft claimed that his dreams were not personal but cosmic, just as his tales drew upon no personal experience. Again, like Poe, Lovecraft had a mind too pure to be violated by any idea of mere mundane reality. S. T. Joshi's meticulously researched H. P. Lovecraft, A Life, 1996, suggests that Lovecraft, for all his championing of independent thinking, was much enthralled to his widowed, ailing mother Susie, who seems to have made of her son's personal appearance, tall, gaunt, with a long, prognathous jaw and a frequently blemished skin, an image of moral degeneracy. A neighbor recounted that Mrs. Lovecraft spoke continuously of her son, who was so hideous that he hid from everyone and did not like to walk upon the streets where people would gaze at him, a statement the neighbor considered exaggerated. Mrs. Lovecraft was believed not to have been told the specific cause of her husband's syphilitic dementia and death and associated Lovecraft with his father. Yet it must have been she who encouraged her son to wear his deceased father's clothes as a young man. It would not be until Mrs. Lovecraft died while institutionalized when Lovecraft was thirty-one years old that he would try to free himself, at least sporadically, of his housebound, claustrophobic existence. Yet few fathers and mothers appear in Lovecraft's work, with the notable exception of the comically grotesque Mr. Waitley of the Dunwich Horror who consorts with demonic forces and arranges for his daughter to mate with a creature named Yog sototh Virtually no women appear in the work, for to Lovecraft the most asexual of men, for whom Eros manifested itself primarily in landscape and architecture, male and female, have no more vital relationship with one another than atoms. Is Lovecraft's life a tragedy of a stunted, broken-off personality, severely traumatized in childhood and never to mature, or is there a poignant triumph of a kind in the way in which the aggrieved, terrorized child refashions himself, through countless nocturnal insomniac sessions of writing, into a purely cerebral metaphysician? 
I could not write about ordinary people, because I am not in the least interested in them. Without interest there can be no art. Man's relations to man do not captivate my fancy. It is man's relations to the cosmos, to the unknown, which alone arouses in me the spark of creative imagination. The humanocentric pose is impossible to me, for I cannot acquire the primitive myopia which magnifies the earth and ignores the background. From a letter of 1921. This is the resolute, defiant note so frequently struck in the American visionary imagination. The very voice, surely, of Edgar Allan Poe, but also that of Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, the voice we might well imagine of Hawthorne, Melville, Emily Dickinson, even exuberant Walt Whitman, one of the roughs, a cosmos. For how can the merely personal be of galvanizing interest to the imagination? The fascination for the historical past we might interpret in Lovecraft as a profound wish that the present might not yet have happened, that something that did happen in the past might not yet have happened if the clock and calendar be turned back far enough. To love the past, to extol the past, to yearn in some way to inhabit the past, is surely to misread the past, purposefully or otherwise. Above all, it's to select from the past only those aspects that accommodate a self-protective and self-nourishing fantasy. What is past tempts us to reconstruct a world rather like a walled city, finite and contained, and in the most literal sense predictable. For the writer, the selected, edited past is in itself a form of fiction, though the writer will set as his idealized task its coming to life, and credulous readers will respond to its authenticity. Already as a child of eight, by his own account, Lovecraft perceived of time as some especial enemy of mine. Repeatedly he speaks of his art as a defeat of time. As an adult he was irresistibly drawn to those cityscapes, particularly Quebec City, and landscapes in which the past seemed to coexist dreamlike with the present. The continuity from the past was, for Lovecraft, the defeat of time. Yet in many Lovecraft tales, the intellectual protagonist is lured to his doom or disintegration by the prospect of transcending time, attempting a Faustian entry to many unknown and incomprehensible realms of additional or indefinitely multiplied dimensions, be they within or outside the space-time continuum. Despite Lovecraft's ardent proselytizing for the weird fiction of Lord Dunsany, Algernon Blackwood, Arthur Macon, and Ambrose Bierce, he acknowledged Proust as the greatest contemporary writer for the subtlety and beauty of his treatment of time. Such extended adventures as The Shadow Out of Time and the novella length At the Mountains of Madness collapse millennia within the cataclysmic experience of individuals whose lives intersect with those of the great old ones. In the former, a professor at Miskatonic University deduces that he was kidnapped psychically by aliens for purposes of research and hurtled back into prehistory, and in the latter, the surviving members of an expedition to Antarctica, fellow faculty members of Miskatonic, discover the mummified bodies of these fantastical aliens as well as the awesome ruins of their lost civilization. The Rats in the Walls, Lovecraft's most frequently reprinted tale, ironically reverses the much-lauded progress of Homo sapiens as the civilized American hero helplessly descends the evolutionary ladder to become, like his despised ancestors, a cannibal. In attempting to defeat time, such protagonists are defeated by it. They may discover to their horror or mad glee that they are in fact related genetically by blood to monster ancestors and that these ancestors live in them. The ponderous, meandering, yet riveting long story, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, ends with the student hero turning by degrees into a subhuman Innsmouth being, a sort of humanoid fish or fishy humanoid, as one might succumb to madness. Investigating the ancient seaport of Innsmouth, repulsed by its inhabitants, the young man pushes too far. This was the dream in which I saw Shagoth for the first time, and the sight set me awake in a frenzy of screaming. That morning the mirror definitely told me I had acquired the Innsmouth look. By the story's end, however, the mesmerized young man has become converted to Innsmouth ideology, so to speak, rejoicing in his subhuman state. I shall plan my cousin's escape from the Canton madhouse, and together we shall go to marvel-shadowed Innsmouth. We shall swim out to that brooding reef in the sea and dive down through the black abysses, and in that lair of the deep ones we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever. 
the inhabitants of Innsmouth had sacrificed human beings to god things that lived under the sea for bounties of fish and gold. In such a reversal, the tension of resisting madness is abruptly eased. The dreaded night gaunts may be embraced like literal kin. To expunge the drama of having witnessed a parent's descent into madness, one may join the madness oneself, and perhaps time can be defeated only by madness. Unlike Poe's fevered tales, which appear unrelated to one another, isolated in essential ways, Lovecraft's mature work, The Cycle of Horror Science Fiction Tales, to which his disciples have given the title The Thulu Mythos, springs from a common source of invented legend. Lovecraft was one of those accursed or blessed writers who ceaselessly work and rework a small nuclei of scenarios, as if to force a mastery over the unconscious compulsions that guide them. Such mastery for the writer may exist during the composition of the work, but fades immediately afterward so that a new work, a new effort of organization and control, must be undertaken. For the Enlightenment rationalist Lovecraft, proud of his lifelong atheism, the Thulu mythos was an anti-mythology, an ironic inversion of traditional religious faith. As a child, according to his own account, Lovecraft repudiated his mother's family's Baptist faith. The Thulu mythos constitutes an elaborate, detailed working out of an early recurring fantasy of Lovecraft's that an entire alien civilization lurks on the underside of our known world, as a night gaunt may lurk beneath a child's bed in the darkness, or as mankind's tragically divided nature may lurk beneath civilization's veneer. Lovecraft's era was that of World War I in its aftermath. In the mythos there are no gods but only displaced extraterrestrial beings, the great old ones, who journeyed to earth many millions of years ago, bringing with them disastrously the slaves called Shagoths, protoplasmic creatures that gradually overpower and defeat their masters. Deluded human beings mistake the great old ones and their descendants for gods, worshipping them out of ignorance, and there exists that lust for power by the powerless which Nietzsche named the subterranean motive of slave morality, our Judeo-Christian Western heritage. Among the sacred and forbidden texts that chronicle the history of the great old ones is the Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al-Hazred, so frequently cited in Lovecraft that the title becomes a sort of running joke. One can see why Jorge Luis Borges was drawn to Lovecraft and inspired in such Lovecraftian tales as Tlern, Ukbar, Orbis, Tertius, and Funes the Memorius to create his own library of mythical cross-referenced ancient Kabbalistic texts. In the frequently anthologized Grand Guignol, The Dunwich Horror, we learn by degrees that the virgin Lavinia Waitley has been forced by her brutal father to mate with a god creature from another dimension, giving birth to male twins. One of them seems initially a self-parody of the young Lovecraft, seven feet tall by the age of thirteen and haplessly bookish, doomed to be killed by a ferocious guard dog while breaking into the Miskatonic University Library in his search for such classified texts as the Necronomicon. The other, for a time invisible, grows enormous as a barn, an obscene, ravenously hungry, ropey tentacled monstrosity that shouts in its death throes atop Sentinel Hill, F -f F father father yog sothoth this colorful redeemer however fails to be resurrected most of lovecraft's tales are not so luridly sensational as the dunwich horror but rather developed by way of incremental detail beginning with quite plausible situations an expedition to antarctica a trip to an ancient seaside town an investigation of an abandoned eighteenth-century house in providence that still stood in lovecraft's time the shunned house, a novelty in Lovecraft's oeuvre, in that it ends happily with one of the earth's nethermost terrors perished forever, an ordinary springtime commencing. One is drawn into Lovecraft by the very air of plausibility and characteristic understatement of the prose, the question being, when will weirdness strike? Readers of genre fiction, unlike readers of what we presume to call literary fiction, assume a tacit contract between themselves and the writer. They understand that they will be manipulated, but the question is how, and when, and with what skill, and to what purpose. However plot-ridden, fantastical, or absurd, populated by whatever pseudo-characters, genre fiction is always resolved, while literary fiction makes no such promises. 
There is no contract between reader and writer, for, in theory at least, each work of literary fiction is original and, in essence, about its own language. Anything can happen, or, upon occasion, nothing. Genre fiction is addictive. Literary fiction, unfortunately, is not. Lovecraft's simulation of reality was deliberate. In the essay In Defense of Dagon, 1930, he divides literature into romantic, realistic, and imaginative, placing weird fiction in the last category, aligned with realism in terms of human psychology and emotion. In technique, a tale should be plausible, even a bizarre tale, except for the single element where supernaturalism is involved, page 318. Romance is pointedly unreal, but fantasy is something altogether different. Here we have an art based on the imaginative life of the human mind, frankly recognized as such, and in its way as natural and scientific, as truly related to natural, even if uncommon and delicate, psychological processes as the starkest of photographic realism. Despite Lovecraft's reiterated disclaimers that his work was wholly of the imagination, there have been cultists among his readers who insist upon believing in the literal truth of the Thulu mythos, arguing that while Lovecraft believed he was writing fiction, he was in fact transcribing history or prehistory. Weird fiction can only be a product, Lovecraft saw, of an age that has ceased to believe collectively in the supernatural while retaining the primitive instinct to do so in eccentric, atomized ways. Lovecraft would hardly have been surprised, but rather confirmed in a cynicism regarding human intelligence, could he have foreseen how, from the 1950s onward, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of purportedly sane Americans would come to believe in UFOs and extraterrestrial beings with particular, often erotic designs upon them. For all his intelligence and aesthetic theorizing, Lovecraft was, like Poe, a remarkably uneven writer. Read chronologically, his tales stand in bewildering juxtapositions. The inspired The Call of Thulu, followed by the trashy Pickman's Model, both of 1926. The subtly modulated The Color Out of Space, followed by the overwrought sensationalism of the Dunwich Horror. Like Melville, Lovecraft was damned by dollars, except in Lovecraft's case the writer was forced to sell his stories, first-rate and otherwise, usually for no more than one cent a word, to the pulp magazine Weird Tales, launched in 1923 and destined to survive for a surprising 31 years. His work would never be published in book form during his lifetime. Lovecraft's most enduring and haunting tales are those in which atmosphere is predominant and plot subordinate in which a richly detailed, layered narrative circles about a luminous, indefinable image. In the early Poe-inspired The Outsider, the unwittingly monstrous speaker moves as through a dream to confront his own reflection inside a cold and unyielding surface of glass. Even should we know nothing of the thirty-one-year-old author's bleakly cramped life, we respond to the story as a codified cri de coeur, Unhappy is he to whom the memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Wretched is he who looks back upon lone hours in vast and dismal chambers with maddening rows of antique books. Despite Lovecraft's expressed contempt for mysticism, clearly he was a kind of mystic, drawing intuitively upon a cosmology of images that came to him unbidden from the underside of his life. All that was repressed, denied, defeated. There is a melancholy, operatic grandeur in Lovecraft's most passionate work, like The Outsider and At the Mountains of Madness, a curious elegiac poetry of unspeakable loss, of adolescent despair, and an existential loneliness so pervasive that it lingers in the reader's memory like a dream long after the rudiments of Lovecraftian plot have faded. A hybrid of the traditional Gothic and science fiction, Lovecraft is clearly Gothic in temperament, his science is plausible enough, as fictitious science goes, but it is never future-oriented, always directed obsessively into the distant past. In Lovecraft's cosmos, some tragic conjunction of the human and the non-human has contaminated what should have been natural life. There is no logic, no reason for such a fate, any more than there is reason for lightning to strike. In one of Lovecraft's best stories, the parable like The Color Out of Space, with its vivid rendering of a once fertile and now etiolated New England landscape, we see the obverse of American destiny, the repudiation of American transcendentalism optimism, in which the individual participates in the divine and shares in nature's divinity. 
and how prophetic the story seems to us decades later in its depiction of ecological disaster as a powerful, seemingly nuclear toxic force emanating from a meteor fallen to earth on a farmer's land, utterly mysterious and unknowingly deadly. They had uncovered what seemed to be the side of a large colored globule embedded in the meteor. The color which resembled some of the bands of the meteor's strange spectrum was almost impossible to describe. Aside from being almost plastic, having heat, magnetism, and slight luminosity, cooling slightly in powerful acids, possessing an unknown spectrum, wasting away in air, and attacking silicon compounds with mutual destruction as a result, it presented no identifying features whatsoever. It was nothing of the earth, but a piece of the great outside. In the Gothic imagination there is a profound and irreconcilable split between mankind and nature in the romantic sense, and a tragic division between what we wish to know and what may be staring us in the face. So the color out of space ends not melodramatically, but elegiacally. It was just a color out of space, a frightful messenger from unformed realms of all nature as we know it. Lovecraft's fame is entirely, perhaps appropriately, posthumous. No hardcover collection of his tales was published during his lifetime, though Lovecraft had acquired by the time of his premature death at the age of forty-seven a reputation as the leading Gothic writer of the era. Like Poe, he died tragically, believing himself an ignominious failure. In his most fantastical musings, this artist of cosmic pessimism could not have foreseen his posthumous renown. Still less that within a decade of his premature death, the very book he could not get published, Lovecraft's Best Supernatural Tales, would sell more than 67,000 copies in hardcover in a single year. Of the major tales gathered in this volume, it was The Rats in the Walls and The Dunwich Horror I first encountered at about the age of thirteen, and seem not to have forgotten in the intervening years, in the way that recurring nightmares of childhood are never wholly forgotten. Whatever the mythic underpinnings of such wild tales, whatever symbolic and thematic meanings the author may have intended, it can be argued that the surface of a tale is the tale. Myth is its residue, its penumbra. The immediate appeal of the successful Gothic tale is visceral, for, as Lovecraft observed, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Joyce Carol Oates Tales of H. P. Lovecraft The Outsider that night the baron dreamt of many a woe, and all his warrior guests, with shade and form of witch and demon and large coffin worm, were long benightmared. John Keats Unhappy is he to whom the memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Wretched is he who looks back upon lone hours in vast and dismal chambers with brown hangings and maddening rows of antique books, or upon awed watches in twilight groves of grotesque, gigantic, and vine-encumbered trees that silently wave twisted branches far aloft. Such a lot the gods gave to me, to me the dazed, the disappointed, the barren, the broken, and yet I am strangely content and cling desperately to those seer memories when my mind momentarily threatens to reach beyond to the other. I know not where I was born, save that the castle was infinitely old and infinitely horrible, full of dark passages and having high ceilings where the eye could find only cobwebs and shadows. The stones in the crumbling corridors seemed always hideously damp, and there was an accursed smell everywhere, as of the piled-up corpses of dead generations. It was never light, so that I used sometimes to light candles and gaze steadily at them for relief. Nor was there any sun outdoors, since the terrible trees grew high above the topmost accessible tower. There was one black tower which reached above the trees into the unknown outer sky, but that was partly ruined and could not be ascended, save by a well-nigh impossible climb up the sheer wall, stone by stone. I must have lived years in this place, but I cannot measure the time. Beings must have cared for my needs, yet I cannot recall any person except myself, or anything alive but the noiseless rats and bats and spiders. 
I think that whoever nursed me must have been shockingly aged, since my first conception of a living person was that of something mockingly like myself, yet distorted, shriveled, and decaying like the castle. To me there was nothing grotesque in the bones and skeletons that strode some of the stone crypts deep down among the foundations. I fantastically associated these things with everyday events, and thought them more natural than the colored pictures of living beings which I found in many of the moldy books. From such books I learned all that I know. No teacher urged or guided me, and I do not recall hearing any human voice in all those years, not even my own. For although I had read of speech, I had never thought to try to speak aloud. My aspect was a matter equally unthought of, for there were no mirrors in the castle, and I merely regarded myself by instinct as akin to the youthful figures I saw drawn and painted in the books. I felt conscious of youth because I remembered so little. Outside, across the putrid moat and under the dark mute trees, I would often lie and dream for hours about what I read in the books and would longingly picture myself amidst gay crowds in the sunny world beyond the endless forest. Once I tried to escape from the forest, but as I went farther from the castle, the shade grew denser and the air more filled with brooding fear, so that I ran frantically back lest I lose my way in a labyrinth of nighted silence. So through endless twilights I dreamed and waited, though I knew not what I waited for. Then in the shadowy solitude my longing for light grew so frantic that I could rest no more, and I lifted entreating hands to the single black ruined tower that reached above the forest into the unknown outer sky, and at last I resolved to scale that tower, fall though I might, since it were better to glimpse the sky and perish than to live without ever beholding day. In the dank twilight I climbed the worn and aged stone stairs till I reached the level where they ceased, and thereafter clung perilously to small footholds leading upward. Ghastly and terrible was that dead, stairless cylinder of rock, black, ruined, and deserted, and sinister with startled bats whose wings made no noise, but more ghastly and terrible still was the slowness of my progress. For climb as I might, the darkness overhead grew no thinner, and a new chill as of haunted and venerable mold assailed me. I shivered as I wondered why I did not reach the light, and would have looked down had I dared. I fancied that night had come suddenly upon me, and vainly groped with one free hand for a window embrasure that I might peer out and above and try to judge the height I had attained. All at once, after an infinity of awesome, sightless crawling up that concave and desperate precipice, I felt my head touch a solid thing, and I knew that I must have gained the roof, or at least some kind of floor. In the darkness I raised my free hand and tested the barrier, finding it stone and immovable. Then came a deadly circuit of the tower, clinging to whatever holds the slimy wall could give, till finally my testing hand found the barrier yielding, and I turned upward again, pushing the slab or door with my head as I used both hands in my fearful ascent. There was no light revealed above, and as my hands went higher, I knew that my climb was for the nonce ended, since the slab was the trapdoor of an aperture leading to a level stone surface of greater circumference than the lower tower, no doubt the floor of some lofty and capacious observation chamber. I crawled through carefully and tried to prevent the heavy slab from falling back into place, but failed in the latter attempt. As I lay exhausted on the stone floor, I heard the eerie echoes of its fall, but hoped, when necessary, to pry it open again. Believing I was now at a prodigious height, far above the accursed branches of the wood, I dragged myself up from the floor and fumbled about for windows, that I might look for the first time upon the sky and the moon and stars of which I had read. But on every hand I was disappointed." since all that I found were vast shelves of marble bearing odious oblong boxes of disturbing size. More and more I reflected and wondered what hoary secrets might abide in this high apartment so many eons cut off from the castle below. Then unexpectedly my hands came upon a doorway, where hung a portal of stone, rough with strange chiseling. Trying it, I found it locked, but with a supreme burst of strength I overcame all obstacles and dragged it open inward. As I did so there came to me the purest ecstasy I have ever known, 
for shining tranquilly through an ornate grating of iron and down a short stone passageway of steps that ascended from the newly found doorway was the radiant full moon, which I had never before seen save in dreams and in vague visions I dared not call memories. Fancying now that I had attained the very pinnacle of the castle, I commenced to rush up the few steps beyond the door, but the sudden veiling of the moon by a cloud caused me to stumble, and I felt my way more slowly in the dark. It was still very dark when I reached the grating, which I tried carefully and found unlocked, but which I did not open for fear of falling from the amazing height to which I had climbed. Then the moon came out. Most demonical of all shocks is that of the abysmally unexpected and grotesquely unbelievable. Nothing I had before undergone could compare in terror with what I now saw, with the bizarre marvels that sight implied. The sight itself was as simple as it was stupefying, for it was merely this. Instead of a dizzying prospect of treetops seen from a lofty eminence, there stretched around me on a level through the grating nothing less than the solid ground, decked and diversified by marble slabs and columns, and overshadowed by an ancient stone church whose ruined spire gleamed spectrally in the moonlight. Half unconscious, I opened the grating and staggered out upon the white gravel path that stretched away in two directions. My mind, stunned and chaotic as it was, still held the frantic craving for light, and not even the fantastic wonder which had happened could stay my course. I neither knew nor cared whether my experience was insanity, dreaming, or magic, but was determined to gaze on brilliance and gaiety at any cost. I knew not who I was or what I was, or what my surroundings might be, though as I continued to stumble along I became conscious of a kind of fearsome, latent memory that made my progress not wholly fortuitous. I passed under an arch out of that region of slabs and columns, and wandered through the open country, sometimes following the visible road, but sometimes leaving it curiously to tread across meadows where only occasional ruins bespoke the ancient presence of a forgotten road. Once I swam across a swift river where crumbling, mossy masonry told of a bridge long vanished. Over two hours must have passed before I reached what seemed to be my goal, a venerable, ivied castle in a thickly wooded park, maddeningly familiar, yet full of perplexing strangeness to me. I saw that the moat was filled in, and that some of the well-known towers were demolished, whilst new wings existed to confuse the beholder. But what I observed with chief interest and delight were the open windows, gorgeously ablaze with light and sending forth sound of the gayest revelry. Advancing to one of these, I looked in and saw an oddly dressed company indeed, making merry and speaking brightly to one another. I had never seemingly heard human speech before, and could guess only vaguely what was said. Some of the faces seemed to hold expressions that brought up incredibly remote recollections. Others were utterly alien. I now stepped through the low window into the brilliantly lighted room, stepping as I did so from my single bright moment of hope to my blackest convulsion of despair and realization. The nightmare was quick to come, for as I entered there occurred immediately one of the most terrifying demonstrations I had ever conceived. Scarcely had I crossed the sill when there descended upon the whole company a sudden and unheralded fear of hideous intensity, distorting every face and evoking the most horrible screams from nearly every throat. Flight was universal, and in the clamor and panic several fell in a swoon and were dragged away by their madly fleeing companions. Many covered their eyes with their hands and plunged blindly and awkwardly in their race to escape, overturning furniture and stumbling against the walls before they managed to reach one of the many doors. The cries were shocking, and as I stood in the brilliant apartment alone and dazed, listening to their vanishing echoes, I trembled at the thought of what might be lurking near me unseen. At a casual inspection the room seemed deserted, but when I moved toward one of the alcoves I thought I detected a presence there a hint of motion beyond the golden-arched doorway leading to another and somewhat similar room. As I approached the arch I began to perceive the presence more clearly, and then, with the first and last sound I ever uttered, a ghastly ululation that revolted me almost as poignantly as its noxious cause, I beheld in full, frightful vividness the inconceivable, indescribable, and unmentionable monstrosity which had, by its simple appearance, changed a merry company to a herd of delirious fugitives. 
I cannot even hint what it was like, for it was a compound of all that is unclean, uncanny, unwelcome, abnormal, and detestable. It was the ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity, and desolation, the putrid, dripping idolon of unwholesome revelation, the awful bearing of that which the merciful earth should always hide. God knows it was not of this world, or no longer of this world, yet to my horror I saw in its eaten away and bone-revealing outlines and leering abhorrent travesty on the human shape, and in its moldy, disintegrating apparel, an unspeakable quality that chilled me even more. I was almost paralyzed, but not too much so to make a feeble effort toward flight, a backward stumble which failed to break the spell in which the nameless, voiceless monster held me my eyes, bewitched by the glassy orbs which stared loathsomely into them, refused to close, though they were mercifully blurred and showed the terrible object but indistinctly after the first shock. I tried to raise my hand to shut out the sight, yet so stunned were my nerves that my arm could not fully obey my will. The attempt, however, was enough to disturb my balance, so that I had to stagger forward several steps to avoid falling. As I did so, I became suddenly and agonizingly aware of the nearness of the carrion thing, whose hideous, hollow breathing I half fancied I could hear. Nearly mad, I found myself yet able to throw out a hand to ward off the fetid apparition which pressed so close, when in one cataclysmic second of cosmic nightmarishness and hellish accident, my fingers touched the rotting, outstretched paw of the monster beneath the golden arch. I did not shriek but all the fiendish ghouls that ride the night wind shrieked for me, as in that same second there crashed down upon my mind a single and fleeting avalanche of soul-annihilating memory. I knew in that second all that had been. I remembered beyond the frightful castle and the trees, and recognized the altered edifice in which I now stood. I recognized most terrible of all the unholy abomination that stood leering before me as I withdrew my sullied fingers from its own. But in the cosmos there is balm as well as bitterness, and that balm is Nepenthe. In the supreme horror of that second I forgot what had horrified me, and the burst of black memory vanished in a chaos of echoing images. In a dream I fled from that haunted and accursed pile, and ran swiftly and silently in the moonlight. When I returned to the churchyard place of marble and went down the steps, I found the stone trap-door immovable but I was not sorry, for I had hated the antique castle and the trees. Now I ride with the mocking and friendly ghouls on the night wind, and play by day amongst the catacombs of Nephren Ka in the sealed and unknown valley of Hadoth by the Nile. I know that light is not for me, save that of the moon over the rock tombs of Neb, or any gaiety save the unnamed feasts of Natokris beneath the great pyramid, yet in my new wildness and freedom I almost welcome the bitterness of alienage. For although Nepenthe has calmed me, I know always that I am an outsider, a stranger in this century and among those who are still men. This I have known ever since I stretched out my fingers to the abomination within that great gilded frame, stretched out my fingers and touched a cold and unyielding surface of polished glass. THE MUSIC OF Erich ZAHN I have examined maps of the city with the greatest care, yet have never again found the Rue d'Orsay. These maps have not been modern maps alone, for I know that names change. I have, on the contrary, delved deeply into all the antiquities of the place, and have personally explored every region of whatever name which could possibly answer to the street I knew as the Rue d'Orsay. But despite all I have done, it remains an humiliating fact that I cannot find the house, the street, or even the locality where, during the last months of my impoverished life as a student of metaphysics at the university, I heard the music of Erich Zahn. That my memory is broken, I do not wonder, for my health, physical and mental, was gravely disturbed throughout the period of my residence in the Rue d'Orsay, and I recall that I took none of my few acquaintances there, but that I cannot find the place again is both singular and perplexing, for it was within a half-hour's walk of the university and was distinguished by peculiarities which could hardly be forgotten by anyone who had been there. I have never met a person who has seen the Rue d'Orsay. 
The Rue d'Orsay lay across a dark river bordered by precipitous brick, blear-windowed warehouses and spanned by a ponderous bridge of dark stone. It was always shadowy along that river, as if the smoke of neighboring factories shut out the sun perpetually. The river was also odorous, with evil stenches which I have never smelled elsewhere and which may some day help me to find it, since I should recognize them at once. Beyond the bridge were narrow, cobbled streets with rails, and then came the ascent, at first gradual, but incredibly steep, as the Rue d'Orsay was reached. I have never seen another street as narrow and steep as the Rue d'Orsay. It was almost a cliff, closed to all vehicles, consisting in several places of flights of steps, and ending at the top in a lofty, ivied wall. Its paving was irregular, sometimes stone slabs, sometimes cobblestones, and sometimes bare earth with struggling greenish-gray vegetation. The houses were tall, peaked-roofed, incredibly old, and crazily leaning backward, forward, and sidewise. Occasionally an opposite pair, both leaning forward, almost met across the street like an arch, and certainly they kept most of the light from the ground below. There were a few overhead bridges from house to house across the street. The inhabitants of that street impressed me peculiarly. At first I thought it was because they were all silent and reticent, but later I decided it was because they were all very old. I do not know how I came to live on such a street, but I was not myself when I moved there. I had been living in many poor places, always evicted for want of money, until at last I came upon that tottering house in the Rue d'Orsay kept by the paralytic Blandot. It was the third house from the top of the street, and by far the tallest of them all. My room was on the fifth story, the only inhabited room there, since the house was almost empty. On the night I arrived I heard strange music from the peaked garret overhead, and the next day asked old Blandot about it. He told me it was an old German viol player, a strange, dumb man who signed his name Erich Zahn, who played the evenings in a cheap theater orchestra adding that Zahn's desire to play in the night after his return from the theater was the reason he had chosen this lofty and isolated garret room, whose single gable window was the only point on the street from which one could look over the terminating wall at the declivity and panorama beyond. Thereafter I heard Zahn every night, and although he kept me awake, I was haunted by the weirdness of his music. Knowing little of the art myself, I was yet certain that none of his harmonies had any relation to music I had heard before, and concluded that he was a composer of highly original genius. The longer I listened, the more I was fascinated, until after a week I resolved to make the old man's acquaintance. One night, as he was returning from his work, I intercepted Zahn in the hallway and told him that I would like to know him and be with him when he played. He was a small, lean, bent person with shabby clothes, blue eyes, grotesque, satyr-like face, and nearly bald head, and at my first word seemed both angered and frightened. My obvious friendliness, however, finally melted him, and he grudgingly motioned to me to follow him up the dark, creaking, and rickety attic stairs. His room, one of only two in the steeply pitched garret, was on the west side toward the high wall that formed the upper end of the street. Its size was very great and seemed the greater because of its extraordinary bareness and neglect. Of furniture there was only a narrow iron bedstead, a dingy washstand, a small table, a large bookcase, an iron music rack, and three old-fashioned chairs. Sheets of music were piled in disorder about the floor. The walls were of bare boards and had probably never known plaster, whilst the abundance of dust and cobwebs made the place seem more deserted than inhabited. Evidently, Erich Zahn's world of beauty lay in some far cosmos of the imagination. Motioning me to sit down, the dumb man closed the door, turned the large wooden bolt, and lighted a candle to augment the one he had brought with him. He now removed his vial from its moth-eaten covering, and taking it, seated himself in the least uncomfortable of the chairs. He did not employ the music rack but offering no choice and playing from memory, enchanted me for over an hour with strains I had never heard before, strains which must have been of his own devising. To describe their exact nature is impossible for one unversed in music. They were a kind of fugue with recurrent passages of the most captivating quality, but to me were notable for the absence of any of the weird notes I had overheard from my room below on other occasions. Those haunting notes I had remembered, and had often hummed and whistled inaccurately to myself, so when the player at length laid down his bow, I asked him if he would render some of them. 
As I began my request, the wrinkled, satyr-like face lost the bored placidity it had possessed during the playing, and seemed to show the same curious mixture of anger and fright which I had noticed when first I accosted the old man. For a moment I was inclined to use persuasion, regarding rather lightly the whims of senility, and even tried to awaken my host's weirder mood by whistling a few of the strains to which I had listened the night before. But I did not pursue this course for more than a moment, for when the dumb musician recognized the whistled air, his face grew suddenly distorted with an expression wholly beyond analysis, and his long, cold, bony right hand reached out to stop my mouth and silence the crude imitation. As he did this, he further demonstrated his eccentricity by casting a startled glance toward the lone, curtained window, as if fearful of some intruder, a glance doubly absurd since the garret stood high and inaccessible above all the adjacent roofs, this window being the only point on the steep street, as the concierge had told me, from which one could see over the wall at the summit. The old man's glance brought Blandot's remark to my mind, and with a certain capriciousness I felt a wish to look out over the wide and dizzying panorama of moonlit roofs and city lights beyond the hilltop, which of all the dwellers of the Rue d'Orsay only this crabbed musician could see. I moved toward the window, and would have drawn aside the nondescript curtains, when with a frightened rage even greater than before, the dumb lodger was upon me again this time motioning with his head toward the door as he nervously strove to drag me thither with both hands. Now thoroughly disgusted with my host, I ordered him to release me, and told him I would go at once. His clutch relaxed, and as he saw my disgust and offense, his own anger seemed to subside. He tightened his relaxing grip, but this time in a friendly manner, forcing me into a chair— then with an appearance of wistfulness crossing to the littered table, where he wrote many words with a pencil in the labored French of a foreigner. The note which he finally handed me was an appeal for tolerance and forgiveness. Zahn said that he was old, lonely, and afflicted with strange fears and nervous disorders connected with his music and with other things. He had enjoyed my listening to his music, and wished I would come again, and not mind his eccentricities, but he could not play to another his weird harmonies, and could not bear hearing them from another, nor could he bear having anything in his room touched by another. He had not known until our hallway conversation that I could overhear his playing in my room, and now asked me if I would arrange with Blandot to take a lower room where I could not hear him in the night. He would, he wrote, defray the difference in rent. As I sat deciphering the execrable French, I felt more lenient toward the old man. He was a victim of physical and nervous suffering, as was I, and my metaphysical studies had taught me kindness. In the silence there came a slight sound from the window. The shutter must have rattled in the night wind, and for some reason I started almost as violently as did Eric Zahn. So when I had finished reading, I shook my host by the hand and departed as a friend. The next day Blandot gave me a more expensive room on the third floor between the apartments of an aged money-lender and the room of a respectable upholsterer. There was no one on the fourth floor. It was not long before I found that Zahn's eagerness for my company was not as great as it had seemed while he was persuading me to move down from the fifth story. He did not ask me to call on him, and when I did call he appeared uneasy and played listlessly. This was always at night, in the day he slept and would admit no one. My liking for him did not grow, though the attic room and the weird music seemed to hold an odd fascination for me. I had a curious desire to look out of that window, over the wall and down the unseen slope with the glittering roofs and spires which must lie outspread there. Once I went up to the garret during theater hours, when Zahn was away, but the door was locked. What I did succeed in doing was to overhear the nocturnal playing of the dumb old man. At first I would tiptoe up to my old fifth floor, then I grew bold enough to climb the last creaking staircase to the peaked garret. There in the narrow hall outside the bolted door with the covered keyhole I often heard sounds which filled me with an indefinable dread, the dread of vague wonder and brooding mystery. It was not that the sounds were hideous, for they were not, but that they held vibrations suggesting nothing of this globe of earth and that at certain intervals they assumed a symphonic quality which I could hardly conceive as produced by one player. Certainly Eric Zahn was a genius of wild power. As the weeks passed, the playing grew wilder, whilst the old musician acquired an increasing haggardness and furtiveness pitiful to behold. He now refused to admit me at any time, and shunned me whenever we met on the stairs. 
Then one night, as I listened at the door, I heard the shrieking vial swell into a chaotic babble of sound, a pandemonium which would have led me to doubt my own shaking sanity had there not come from behind that barred portal a piteous proof that the horror was real. The awful, inarticulate cry which only a mute can utter, and which rises only in moments of the most terrible fear or anguish. I knocked repeatedly at the door, but received no response. Afterward, I waited in the black hallway, shivering with cold and fear, till I heard the poor musician's feeble effort to rise from the floor by the aid of a chair. Believing him just conscious after a fainting fit, I renewed my rapping, at the same time calling out my name reassuringly. I heard Zahn stumble to the window and close both shutter and sash, then stumble to the door which he falteringly unfastened to admit me. This time his delight at having me present was real, for his distorted face gleamed with relief while he clutched at my coat as a child clutches at its mother's skirts. Shaking pathetically, the old man forced me into a chair whilst he sank into another, beside which his vial and bow lay carelessly on the floor. He sat for some time inactive, nodding oddly, but having a paradoxical suggestion of intense and frightening listening. Subsequently he seemed to be satisfied, and crossing to a chair by the table wrote a brief note, handed it to me, and returned to the table, where he began to write rapidly and incessantly. The note implored me, in the name of mercy and for the sake of my own curiosity, to wait where I was while he prepared a full account in German of all the marvels and terrors which beset him. I waited, and the dumb man's pencil flew. It was perhaps an hour later, while I still waited, and while the old musician's feverishly written sheet still continued to pile up, that I saw Zan start as from the hint of a horrible shock. Unmistakably he was looking at the curtained window and listening shudderingly. Then I half fancied I heard a sound myself, though it was not a horrible sound, but rather an exquisitely low and infinitely distant musical note, suggesting a player in one of the neighboring houses, or in some abode beyond the lofty wall over which I had never been able to look. Upon Zahn the effect was terrible, for dropping his pencil suddenly he rose, seized his vial, and commenced to rend the night with the wildest playing I had ever heard from his bow, save when listening at the barred door. It would be useless to describe the playing of Eric Zahn on that dreadful night. It was more horrible than anything I had ever overheard, because I could now see the expression of his face and could realize that this time the motive was stark fear. He was trying to make a noise, to ward something off or drown something out, what I could not imagine, awesome though I felt it must be. The playing grew fantastic delirious and hysterical, it kept to the last the qualities of supreme genius which I knew this strange old man possessed. I recognized the air, it was a wild Hungarian dance popular in the theaters, and I reflected for a moment that this was the first time I had ever heard Zahn play the work of another composer. Louder and louder, wilder and wilder mounted the shrieking and whining of that desperate vial. The player was dripping with an uncanny perspiration and twisted like a monkey, always looking frantically at the curtained window. In his frenzied strains I could almost see shadowy satyrs and bacchanals dancing and whirling insanely through seething abysses of clouds and smoke and lightning. And then I thought I heard a shriller, steadier note that was not from the vial, a calm, deliberate, purposeful, mocking note from far away in the west. At this juncture the shutter began to rattle in a howling night wind which had sprung up outside as if in answer to the mad playing within. Zahn's screaming vial now outdid itself, emitting sounds I had never thought a vial could emit. The shutter rattled more loudly, unfastened and commenced slamming against the window. Then the glass broke shiveringly under the persistent impacts and the chill wind rushed in, making the candles sputter and rustling the sheets of paper on the table where Zahn had begun to write out his horrible secret. I looked at Zahn and saw that he was past conscious observation. His blue eyes were bulging, glassy and sightless, and the frantic playing had become a blind, mechanical, unrecognizable orgy that no pen could ever suggest. A sudden gust stronger than the others caught up the manuscript and bore it toward the window. I followed the flying sheets in desperation, but they were gone before I reached the demolished panes. Then I remembered my old wish to gaze from this window, the only window in the Rue d'Orsay from which one might see the slope beyond the wall and the city outspread beneath. 
It was very dark, but the city's lights always burned, and I expected to see them there amidst the wind and rain. Yet when I looked from that highest of all gable windows, looked while the candles sputtered and the insane vile howled with the night wind, I saw no city spread below, and no friendly lights gleamed from remembered streets, but only the blackness of space illimitable, unimagined space alive with motion and music and having no semblance to anything on earth. And as I stood there looking in terror, the wind blew out both the candles in that ancient peaked garret, leaving me in savage and impenetrable darkness with chaos and pandemonium before me and the demon madness of that night-baying vial behind me. I staggered back in the dark, without the means of striking a light, crashing against the table, overturning a chair, and finally groping my way to the place where the blackness screamed with shocking music— to save myself and Erich Zahn, I could at least try whatever the powers opposed to me. Once I thought some chill thing brushed me, and I screamed, but my scream could not be heard above that hideous vial. Suddenly out of the blackness the madly sawing bow struck me, and I knew I was close to the player. I felt a head, touched the back of Zahn's chair, and then found and shook his shoulder in an effort to bring him to his senses. He did not respond, and still the vial shrieked on without slackening. I moved my hand to his head, whose mechanical nodding I was able to stop, and shouted in his ear that we must both flee from the unknown things of the night. But he neither answered me nor abated the frenzy of his unutterable music, while all through the garret strange currents of wind seemed to dance in the darkness and babble. When my hand touched his ear, I shuddered, though I knew not why, knew not why till I felt of the still face, the ice-cold, stiffened, unbreathing face whose glassy eyes bulged uselessly into the void. And then by some miracle finding the door and the large wooden bolt, I plunged wildly away from that glassy-eyed thing in the dark and from the ghoulish howling of that accursed vial whose fury increased even as I plunged, leaping, floating, flying down those endless stairs through the dark house, racing mindlessly out into the narrow, steep, and ancient street of steps and tottering houses, clattering down steps and over cobbles to the lower streets and the putrid, canyon-walled river, panting across the great dark bridge to the broader, healthier streets and boulevards we know. All these are terrible impressions that linger with me, and I recall that there was no wind, and that the moon was out, and that all the lights of the city twinkled. Despite my most careful searches and investigations, I have never since been able to find the Rue d'Orsay. But I am not wholly sorry, either for this or for the loss in undreamable abysses of the closely written sheets which alone could have explained the music of Erich Zahn. The Rats and the Walls on July 16, 1923, I moved into Exum Priory after the last workman had finished his labors. The restoration had been a stupendous task, for little had remained of the deserted pile but a shell-like ruin, yet because it had been the seat of my ancestors, I let no expense deter me. The place had not been inhabited since the reign of James I, when a tragedy of intensely hideous, though largely unexplained, nature had struck down the master, five of his children, and several servants, and driven forth under a cloud of suspicion and terror the third son, my lineal progenitor, and the only survivor of the abhorred line. With this sole heir denounced as a murderer, the estate had reverted to the crown. Nor had the accused man made any attempt to exculpate himself or regain his property. Shaken by some horror greater than that of conscience or the law, and expressing only a frantic wish to exclude the ancient edifice from his sight and memory, Walter de la Poor, 11th Baron Exum, fled to Virginia, and there founded the family which by the next century had become known as de la Poor. Exum Priory had remained untenanted, though later allotted to the estates of the Norris family, and much studied because of its peculiarly composite architecture, an architecture involving Gothic towers resting on a Saxon or Romanesque substructure, whose foundation in turn was of a still earlier order or blend of orders, Roman and even Druidic or native Kimric, if legends speak truly. This foundation was a very singular thing, being merged on one side with the solid limestone of the precipice from whose brink the priory overlooked a desolate valley three miles west of the village of Anchester. Architects and antiquarians loved to examine the strange relic of forgotten centuries, but the country folk hated it. 
They had hated it for hundreds of years before, when my ancestors lived there, and they hated it now, with the moss and mold of abandonment on it. I had not been a day in Anchester before I knew I came of an accursed house. And this week workmen have blown up Exum Priory and are busy obliterating the traces of its foundations. The bare statistics of my ancestry I had always known, together with the fact that my first American forebear had come to the colonies under a strange cloud. Of details, however, I have been kept wholly ignorant through the policy of reticence always maintained by the Delapores. Unlike our planter neighbors, we seldom boasted of crusading ancestors or other medieval and renaissance heroes, nor was any kind of tradition handed down except what may have been recorded in the sealed envelope left before the Civil War by every squire to his eldest son for posthumous opening. The glories we cherished were those achieved since the migration, the glories of a proud and honorable, if somewhat reserved and unsocial, Virginia line. During the war our fortunes were extinguished, and our whole existence changed by the burning of Carfax, our home on the banks of the James. My grandfather, advanced in years, had perished in that incendiary outrage, and with him the envelope that bound us all to the past. I can recall that fire today, as I saw it then at the age of seven, with the Federal soldiers shouting, the women screaming, and the Negroes howling and praying. My father was in the army, defending Richmond, and after many formalities my mother and I were passed through the line to join him. When the war ended we all moved north, whence my mother had come, and I grew to manhood, middle age, and ultimate wealth as a stolid Yankee. Neither my father nor I ever knew what our hereditary envelope had contained, and as I merged into the grayness of Massachusetts business life, I lost all interest in the mysteries which evidently lurked far back in my family tree. Had I suspected their nature, how gladly I would have left Exum Priory to its moss, bats, and cobwebs. My father died in 1904, but without any message to leave me, or to my only child, Alfred, a motherless boy of ten. It was this boy who reversed the order of family information, for although I could give him only jesting conjectures about the past, he wrote me of some very interesting ancestral legends when the late war took him to England in 1917 as an aviation officer. Apparently the Delapores had a colorful and perhaps sinister history, for a friend of my son's, Captain Edward Norris of the Royal Flying Corps, dwelt near the family seat at Anchester and related some peasant superstitions which few novelists could equal for wildness and incredibility. Norris himself, of course, did not take them seriously, but they amused my son and made good material for his letters to me. It was this legendary which definitely turned my attention to my transatlantic heritage and made me resolve to purchase and restore the family seat which Norris showed to Alfred in its picturesque desertion and offered to get for him at a surprisingly reasonable figure since his own uncle was the present owner. I bought Exum Priory in 1918, but was almost immediately distracted from my plans of restoration by the return of my son as a maimed invalid. During the two years that he lived, I thought of nothing but his care, having even placed my business under the direction of partners. In 1921, as I found myself bereaved and aimless, a retired manufacturer no longer young, I resolved to divert my remaining years with my new possession. Visiting Anchester in December, I was entertained by Captain Norris, a plump, amiable young man who had thought much of my son and secured his assistance in gathering plans and anecdotes to guide in the coming restoration. Exum Priory itself I saw without emotion, a jumble of tottering medieval ruins covered with lichens and honeycombed with rook's nests, perched perilously upon a precipice and denuded of floors or other interior features save the stone walls of the separate towers. As I gradually recovered the image of the edifice as it had been when my ancestor left it over three centuries before, I began to hire workmen for the reconstruction. In every case I was forced to go outside the immediate locality, for the Anchester villagers had an almost unbelievable fear and hatred of the place. This sentiment was so great that it was sometimes communicated to the outside laborers, causing numerous desertions, whilst its scope appeared to include both the priory and its ancient family. My son had told me that he was somewhat avoided during his visits because he was a de la Poor, and I now found myself subtly ostracized for a like reason until I convinced the peasants how little I knew of my heritage. Even then they sullenly disliked me, so that I had to collect most of the village traditions through the mediation of Norris. What the people could not forgive, perhaps, was that I had come to restore a symbol so abhorrent to them, 
for rationally or not, they viewed Exum Priory as nothing less than a haunt of fiends and werewolves. Piecing together the tales which Norris collected for me, and supplementing them with the accounts of several savants who had studied the ruins, I deduced that Exum Priory stood on the site of a prehistoric temple, a druidical or anti-druidical thing which must have been contemporary with Stonehenge. That indescribable rites had been celebrated there, few doubted, and there were unpleasant tales of the transference of these rites into the Sibylle worship which the Romans had introduced. Inscriptions still visible in the sub-cellar bore such unmistakable letters as Div, Ops, Magna, Mat, sign of the Magna Mater, whose dark worship was once vainly forbidden to Roman citizens. Anchester had been the camp of the Third Augustan Legion, as many remains attest, and it was said that the Temple of Sibylle was splendid and thronged with worshippers who performed nameless ceremonies at the bidding of a Phrygian priest. Tales added that the fall of the old religion did not end the orgies at the temple, but that the priests lived on in the new faith without real change. Likewise was it said that the rites did not vanish with the Roman power, and that certain among the Saxons added to what remained of the temple and gave it the essential outline it subsequently preserved, making it the center of a cult feared through half the heptarchy. About 1000 A.D. the place is mentioned in a chronicle as being a substantial stone priory housing a strange and powerful monastic order and surrounded by extensive gardens which needed no walls to exclude a frightened populace. It was never destroyed by the Danes, though after the Norman conquest it must have declined tremendously, since there was no impediment when Henry III granted the site to my ancestor, Gilbert de la Poure, first Baron Exum, in 1261. Of my family before this date there is no evil report, but something strange must have happened then. In one chronicle there is a reference to Adela Poor as cursed of God in 1307, whilst village legendary had nothing but evil and frantic fear to tell of the castle that went up on the foundations of the old temple and priory. The fireside tales were of the most grisly description, all the ghastlier because of their frightened reticence and cloudy evasiveness. They represented my ancestors as a race of hereditary demons, beside whom Gilles de Retz and the Marquis de Sade would seem the various tyros, and hinted whisperingly at their responsibility for the occasional disappearance of villagers through several generations. The worst characters, apparently, were the barons and their direct heirs. At least most was whispered about these. If of healthier inclinations, it was said, an heir would early and mysteriously die to make way for another more typical scion. There seemed to be an inner cult in the family, presided over by the head of the house, and sometimes closed except to a few members. Temperament rather than ancestry was evidently the basis of this cult, for it was entered by several who married into the family. Lady Margaret Trevor from Cornwall, wife of Godfrey, the second son of the fifth baron, became a favorite bane of children all over the countryside, and the demon heroine of a particularly horrible old ballad not yet extinct near the Welsh border. Preserved in balladry, too, though not illustrating the same point, is the hideous tale of Lady Mary de la Poor, who shortly after her marriage to the Earl of Shrewsfield was killed by him and his mother, both of the slayers being absolved and blessed by the priest to whom they confessed what they dared not repeat to the world. These myths and ballads, typical as they were of crude superstition, repelled me greatly. Their persistence and their application to so long a line of my ancestors were especially annoying whilst the imputations of monstrous habits proved unpleasantly reminiscent of the one known scandal of my immediate forebears, the case of my cousin, young Randolph de la Poor of Carfax, who went among the Negroes and became a voodoo priest after he returned from the Mexican War. I was much less disturbed by the vaguer tales of wails and howlings in the barren, windswept valley beneath the limestone cliff, of the graveyard stenches after the spring rains, of the floundering, squealing white thing on which Sir John Clave's horse had trod one night in a lonely field, and of the servant who had gone mad at what he saw in the priory in the full light of day. These things were hackneyed spectral lore, and I was at that time a pronounced skeptic. The accounts of vanished peasants were less to be dismissed, though not especially significant in view of medieval custom. Prying curiosity meant death, and more than one severed head had been publicly shown on the bastions, now effaced, around Exum Priory. A few of the tales were exceedingly picturesque, and made me wish I had learnt more of comparative mythology in my youth. 
There was, for instance, the belief that a legion of bat-winged devils kept witches Sabbath each night at the Priory, a legion whose sustenance might explain the disproportionate abundance of coarse vegetables harvested in the vast gardens. And, most vivid of all, there was the dramatic epic of the rats, the scampering army of obscene vermin which had burst forth from the castle three months after the tragedy that doomed it to desertion, the lean, filthy, ravenous army which had swept all before it and devoured fowl, cats, dogs, hogs, sheep, and even two hapless human beings before its fury was spent. Around that unforgettable rodent army a whole separate cycle of myths revolves, for it scattered among the village homes and brought curses and horrors in its train. Such was the lore that assailed me as I pushed to completion with an elderly obstinacy the work of restoring my ancestral home. It must not be imagined for a moment that these tales formed my principal psychological environment. On the other hand, I was constantly praised and encouraged by Captain Norris and the antiquarians who surrounded and aided me. When the task was done, over two years after its commencement, I viewed the great rooms, wainscoted walls, vaulted ceilings, mullioned windows, and broad staircases with a pride which fully compensated for the prodigious expense of the restoration. Every attribute of the Middle Ages was cunningly reproduced, and the new parts blended perfectly with the original walls and foundations. The seat of my father's was complete, and I looked forward to redeeming at last the local fame of the line which ended in me. I would reside here permanently, and prove that Adela Poor, for I had adopted again the original spelling of the name, need not be a fiend. My comfort was perhaps augmented by the fact that although Exum Priory was medievally fitted, its interior was in truth wholly new and free from old vermin and old ghosts alike. As I have said, I moved in on July 16, 1923. My household consisted of seven servants and nine cats, of which latter species I am particularly fond. My eldest cat, Niggerman, was seven years old and had come with me from my home in Bolton, Massachusetts. The others I had accumulated whilst living with Captain Norris's family during the restoration of the Priory. For five days our routine proceeded with the utmost placidity, my time being spent mostly in the codification of old family data. I had now obtained some very circumstantial accounts of the final tragedy and flight of Walter de la Poor, which I conceived to be the probable contents of the hereditary paper lost in the fire at Carfax. It appeared that my ancestor was accused with much reason of having killed all the other members of his household except four servant confederates in their sleep about two weeks after a shocking discovery which changed his whole demeanor but which, except by implication, he disclosed to no one save perhaps the servants who assisted him and afterward fled beyond reach. This deliberate slaughter, which included a father, three brothers, and two sisters, was largely condoned by the villagers, and so slackly treated by the law, that its perpetrator escaped honored, unharmed, and undisguised to Virginia, the general whispered sentiment being that he had purged the land of an immemorial curse. What discovery had prompted an act so terrible I could scarcely even conjecture. Walter de la Poor must have known for years the sinister tales about his family, so that this material could have given him no fresh impulse. Had he then witnessed some appalling ancient rite, or stumbled upon some frightful and revealing symbol in the priory or its vicinity? He was reputed to have been a shy, gentle youth in England. In Virginia he seemed not so much hard or bitter as harassed and apprehensive. He was spoken of in the diary of another gentleman adventurer, Francis Harley of Bellevue, as a man of unexampled justice, honor, and delicacy. On July 22nd occurred the first incident which, though lightly dismissed at the time, takes on a preternatural significance in relation to later events. It was so simple as to be almost negligible, and could not possibly have been noticed under the circumstances, for it must be recalled that since I was in a building practically fresh and new except for the walls, and surrounded by a well-balanced staff of servitors, apprehension would have been absurd despite the locality. What I afterward remembered is merely this, that my old black cat, whose moods I know so well, was undoubtedly alert and anxious to an extent wholly out of keeping with his natural character. He roved from room to room, restless and disturbed, and sniffed constantly about the walls which formed part of the old Gothic structure. I realize how trite this sounds, like the inevitable dog in the ghost story which always growls before his master sees the sheeted figure, yet I cannot consistently suppress it. 
The following day a servant complained of restlessness among all the cats in the house. He came to me in my study, a lofty west room on the second story, with groined arches, black oak paneling, and a triple Gothic window overlooking the limestone cliff and desolate valley. And even as he spoke I saw the jetty form of nigger man creeping along the west wall and scratching at the new panels which overlaid the ancient stone. I told the man that there must be some singular odor or emanation from the old stonework, imperceptible to human senses, but affecting the delicate organs of cats, even through the new woodwork. This I truly believed, and when the fellow suggested the presence of mice or rats, I mentioned that there had been no rats there for three hundred years, and that even the field mice of the surrounding country could hardly be found in these high walls, where they had never been known to stray. That afternoon I called on Captain Norris, and he assured me that it would be quite incredible for field mice to infest the priory in such a sudden and unprecedented fashion. That night, dispensing as usual with a valet, I retired in the West Tower chamber which I had chosen as my own, reached from the study by a stone staircase and short gallery, the former partly ancient, the latter entirely restored. This room was circular, very high and without wainscoting being hung with arras which I had myself chosen in London. Seeing that Nigger Man was with me, I shut the heavy Gothic door and retired by the light of the electric bulbs which so cleverly counterfeited candles, finally switching off the light and sinking on the carved and canopied four-poster with the venerable cat in his accustomed place across my feet. I did not draw the curtains, but gazed out at the narrow north window which I faced. There was a suspicion of aurora in the sky, and the delicate traceries of the window were pleasantly silhouetted. At some time I must have fallen quietly asleep, for I recall a distinct sense of leaving strange dreams when the cat started violently from his placid position. I saw him in the faint auroral glow, head strained forward, four feet on my ankles and hind feet stretched behind. He was looking intensely at a point on the wall somewhat west of the window, a point which to my eye had nothing to mark it, but toward which all my attention was now directed. And as I watched, I knew that Nigger Man was not vainly excited. Whether the arras actually moved, I cannot say. I think it did, very slightly. But what I can swear to is that behind it I heard a low, distinct scurrying as of rats or mice. In a moment the cat had jumped bodily on the screening tapestry, bringing the affected section to the floor with his weight and exposing a damp, ancient wall of stone, patched here and there by the restorers and devoid of any trace of rodent prowlers. Nigger Man raced up and down the floor by this part of the wall, clawing the fallen arras, and seemingly trying at times to insert a paw between the wall and the oaken floor. He found nothing, and after a time returned wearily to his place across my feet. I had not moved, but I did not sleep again that night. In the morning I questioned all the servants, and found that none of them had noticed anything unusual, save that the cook remembered the actions of a cat which had rested on her window sill. This cat had howled at some unknown hour of the night, awaking the cook in time for her to see him dart purposefully out of the open door down the stairs. I drowsed away the noontime, and in the afternoon called again on Captain Norris, who became exceedingly interested in what I told him. The odd incidents, so slight yet so curious, appealed to his sense of the picturesque and elicited from him a number of reminiscences of local ghostly lore. We were genuinely perplexed at the presence of rats, and Norris lent me some traps and Paris green, which I had the servants place in strategic localities when I returned. I retired early, being very sleepy, but was harassed by dreams of the most horrible sort. I seemed to be looking down from an immense height upon a twilight grotto, knee-deep with filth, where a white-bearded demon swineherd drove about with his staff a flock of fungus, flabby beasts, whose appearance filled me with unutterable loathing. Then, as the swineherd paused and nodded over his task, a mighty swarm of rats rained down on the stinking abyss and fell to devouring beasts and man alike. From this terrific vision I was abruptly awakened by the motions of Nigger Man, who had been sleeping as usual across my feet. This time I did not have to question the source of his snarls and hisses, and of the fear which made him sink his claws into my ankle, unconscious of their effect. For on every side of the chamber the walls were alive with nauseous sound, the verminous slithering of ravenous, gigantic rats. There was now no aurora to show the state of the arras, the fallen section of which had been replaced, but I was not too frightened to switch on the light. 
As the bulbs leapt into radiance, I saw a hideous shaking all over the tapestry, causing the somewhat peculiar designs to execute a singular dance of death. This motion disappeared almost at once, and the sound with it. Springing out of bed, I poked at the arras with the long handle of a warming pan that rested near, and lifted one section to see what lay beneath. There was nothing but the patched stone wall, and even the cat had lost his tense realization of abnormal presences. When I examined the circular trap that had been placed in the room, I found all of the openings sprung, though no trace remained of what had been caught and had escaped. Further sleep was out of the question, so lighting a candle I opened the door and went out in the gallery toward the stairs to my study, Nigger Man following at my heels. Before we had reached the stone steps, however, the cat darted ahead of me and vanished down the ancient flight. As I descended the stairs myself, I became suddenly aware of sounds in the great room below, sounds of a nature which could not be mistaken. The oak-paneled walls were alive with rats, scampering and milling, whilst Nigger Man was racing about with the fury of a baffled hunter. Reaching the bottom, I switched on the light, which did not this time cause the noise to subside. The rats continued their riot, stampeding with such force and distinctness that I could finally assign to their motions a definite direction. These creatures, in numbers apparently inexhaustible, were engaged in one stupendous migration from inconceivable heights to some depth conceivably or inconceivably below. I now heard steps in the corridor, and in another moment two servants pushed open the massive door. They were searching the house for some unknown source of disturbance which had thrown all the cats into a snarling panic and caused them to plunge precipitately down several flights of stairs and squat yowling before the closed door to the sub-cellar. I asked them if they had heard the rats, but they replied in the negative, and when I turned to call their attention to the sounds in the panels, I realized that the noise had ceased. With the two men, I went down to the door of the sub-cellar, but found the cats already dispersed. Later I resolved to explore the crypt below, but for the present I merely made a round of the traps. All were sprung, yet all were tenantless. Satisfying myself that no one had heard the rats save the felines and me, I sat in my study till morning, thinking profoundly and recalling every scrap of legend I had unearthed concerning the building I inhabited. I slept some in the forenoon, leaning back in the one comfortable library chair which my medieval plan of furnishing could not banish. Later I telephoned to Captain Norris, who came over and helped me explore the sub-cellar. Absolutely nothing untoward was found, although we could not repress a thrill at the knowledge that this vault was built by Roman hands. Every low arch and massive pillar was Roman, not the debased Romanesque of the bungling Saxons, but the severe and harmonious classicism of the age of the Caesars. Indeed, the walls abounded with inscriptions familiar to the antiquarians who had repeatedly explored the place, things like P. Gete, Prope, Temp, Dona, and El Praec versus Pontife Aetis. The reference to Aetis made me shiver, for I had read Catullus and knew something of the hideous rites of the Eastern god, whose worship was so mixed with that of Sibylle. Norris and I, by the light of lanterns, tried to interpret the odd and nearly effaced designs on certain irregularly rectangular blocks of stone generally held to be altars, but could make nothing of them. We remembered that one pattern, a sort of rayed sun, was held by students to imply a non-Roman origin, suggesting that these altars had merely been adopted by the Roman priests from some older and perhaps aboriginal temple on the same site. On one of these blocks were some brown stains which made me wonder. The largest in the center of the room had certain features on the upper surface which indicated its connection with fire, probably burnt offerings. Such were the sights in that crypt before whose door the cats had howled, and where Norris and I now determined to pass the night. Couches were brought down by the servants, who were told not to mind any nocturnal actions of the cats, and Nigger Man was admitted as much for help as for companionship. We decided to keep the great oak door, a modern replica with slits for ventilation, tightly closed, and with this attended to, we retired with lanterns still burning to await whatever might occur. The vault was very deep in the foundations of the priory, and undoubtedly far down on the face of the beetling limestone cliff overlooking the waste valley. That it had been the goal of the scuffling and unexplainable rats I could not doubt, though why I could not tell. 
As we lay there expectantly, I found my vigil occasionally mixed with half-formed dreams, from which the uneasy motions of the cat across my feet would rouse me. These dreams were not wholesome, but horribly like the one I had had the night before. I saw again the twilight grotto and the swineherd with his unmentionable fungus beasts wallowing in filth, and as I looked at these things they seemed nearer and more distinct, so distinct that I could almost observe their features. Then I did observe the flabby features of one of them, and awaked with such a scream that Nigger Man started up, whilst Captain Norris, who had not slept, laughed considerably. Norris might have laughed more, or perhaps less, had he known what it was that made me scream but I did not remember myself till later. Ultimate horror often paralyzes memory in a merciful way. Norris waked me when the phenomena began. Out of the same frightful dream I was called by his gentle shaking and his urging to listen to the cats. Indeed, there was much to listen to, for beyond the closed door at the head of the stone steps was a veritable nightmare of feline yelling and clawing, while Snigger Man, unmindful of his kindred outside, was running excitedly around the bare stone walls, in which I heard the same babble of scurrying rats that had troubled me the night before. An acute terror now rose within me, for here were anomalies which nothing normal could well explain. These rats, if not the creatures of a madness which I shared with the cats alone, must be burrowing and sliding in Roman walls I had thought to be of solid limestone blocks, unless perhaps the action of water through more than seventeen centuries had eaten winding tunnels which rodent bodies had worn clear and ample, but even so the spectral horror was no less. For if these were living vermin, why did not Norris hear their disgusting commotion? Why did he urge me to watch Nigger Man and listen to the cats outside, and why did he guess wildly and vaguely at what could have aroused them? By the time I had managed to tell him, as rationally as I could, what I thought I was hearing, my ears gave me the last fading impression of the scurrying, which had retreated still downward, far underneath this deepest of sub-cellars, till it seemed as if the whole cliff below were riddled with questing rats. Norris was not as skeptical as I had anticipated, but instead seemed profoundly moved. He motioned to me to notice that the cats at the door had ceased their clamor, as if giving up the rats for lost, whilst Nigger Man had a burst of renewed restlessness and was clawing frantically around the bottom of the large stone altar in the center of the room, which was nearer Norris's couch than mine. My fear of the unknown was at this point very great. Something astounding had occurred, and I saw that Captain Norris, a younger, stouter, and presumably more naturally materialistic man, was affected fully as much as myself, perhaps because of his lifelong and intimate familiarity with local legend. We could for the moment do nothing but watch the old black cat as he pawed with decreasing fervor at the base of the altar, occasionally looking up and mewing to me in that persuasive manner which he used when he wished me to perform some favor for him. Norris now took a lantern close to the altar and examined the place where Nigger Man was pawing, silently kneeling and scraping away the lichens of centuries which joined the massive pre-Roman block to the tessellated floor. He did not find anything, and was about to abandon his effort when I noticed a trivial circumstance which made me shudder, even though it implied nothing more than I had already imagined. I told him of it, and we both looked at its almost imperceptible manifestation with the fixedness of fascinated discovery and acknowledgment. It was only this, that the flame of the lantern set down near the altar was slightly but certainly flickering from a draft of air which it had not before received, and which came indubitably from the crevice between floor and altar where Norris was scraping away the lichens. We spent the rest of the night in the brilliantly lighted study, nervously discussing what we should do next. The discovery that some vault deeper than the deepest known masonry of the Romans underlay this accursed pile, some vault unsuspected by the curious antiquarians of three centuries, would have been sufficient to excite us without any background of the sinister. As it was, the fascination became twofold, and we paused in doubt whether to abandon our search and quit the priory forever in superstitious caution, or to gratify our sense of adventure and brave whatever horrors might await us in the unknown depths. By morning we had compromised, and decided to go to London to gather a group of archaeologists and scientific men fit to cope with the mystery. It should be mentioned that before leaving the sub-cellar we had vainly tried to move the central altar, which we now recognized as the gate to a new pit of nameless fear. What secret would open the gate, wiser men than we would have to find? 
During many days in London, Captain Norris and I presented our facts, conjectures, and legendary anecdotes to five eminent authorities, all men who could be trusted to respect any family disclosures which future explorations might develop. We found most of them little disposed to scoff, but instead intensely interested and sincerely sympathetic. It is hardly necessary to name them all, but I may say that they included Sir William Brinton, whose excavations in the Trode excited most of the world in their day. As we all took the train for Anchester, I felt myself poised on the brink of frightful revelations, a sensation symbolized by the air of mourning among the many Americans at the unexpected death of the President on the other side of the world. On the evening of August 7th we reached Exham Priory, where the servants assured me that nothing unusual had occurred. The cats, even old nigger man, had been perfectly placid, and not a trap in the house had been sprung. We were to begin exploring on the following day, awaiting which I assigned well-appointed rooms to all my guests. I myself retired in my own tower chamber, with nigger man across my feet. Sleep came quickly, but hideous dreams assailed me. There was a vision of a Roman feast like that of Trimalchio, with a horror in a covered platter. Then came that damnable recurrent thing about the swineherd and his filthy drove in the twilight grotto. Yet when I awoke it was full daylight, with normal sounds in the house below. The rats, living or spectral, had not troubled me, and Nigger Man was quietly asleep. On going down, I found that the same tranquility had prevailed elsewhere, a condition which one of the assembled savants, a fellow named Thornton, devoted to the psychic, rather absurdly laid to the fact that I had now been shown the thing which certain forces had wished to show me. All was now ready, and at eleven a.m. our entire group of seven men, bearing powerful electric searchlights and implements of excavation, went down to the sub-cellar and bolted the door behind us. Nigger Man was with us, for the investigators found no occasion to despise his excitability, and were indeed anxious that he be present in case of obscure rodent manifestations. We noted the Roman inscriptions and unknown altar designs only briefly, for three of the savants had already seen them, and all knew their characteristics. Prime attention was paid to the momentous central altar, and within an hour Sir William Brinton had caused it to tilt backward, balanced by some unknown species of counterweight. There now lay revealed such a horror as would have overwhelmed us had we not been prepared. Through a nearly square opening in the tiled floor, sprawling on a flight of stone steps so prodigiously worn that it was little more than an inclined plane at the center, was a ghastly array of human or semi-human bones. Those which retained their collocation as skeletons showed attitudes of panic, fear, and overall were the markings of rodent gnawing. The skulls denoted nothing short of utter idiocy, cretinism, or primitive semi apedom Above the hellishly littered steps arched a descending passage seemingly chiseled from the solid rock and conducting a current of air. This current was not a sudden and noxious rush as from a closed vault, but a cool breeze with something of freshness in it. We did not pause long, but shiveringly began to clear a passage down the steps. It was then that Sir William, examining the hewn walls, made the odd observation that the passage, according to the direction of the strokes, must have been chiseled from beneath. I must be very deliberate now, and choose my words. After plowing down a few steps amidst the gnawed bones, we saw that there was light ahead, not any mystic phosphorescence, but a filtered daylight which could not come except from unknown fissures in the cliff that overlooked the waste valley. That such fissures had escaped notice from outside was hardly remarkable, for not only is the valley wholly uninhabited, but the cliff is so high and beetling that only an aeronaut could study its face in detail. A few steps more and our breaths were literally snatched from us by what we saw so literally that Thornton, the psychic investigator, actually fainted in the arms of the dazed man who stood behind him. Norris, his plump face utterly white and flabby, simply cried out inarticulately, whilst I think that what I did was to gasp or hiss and cover my eyes. The man behind me, the only one of the party older than I, croaked the hackneyed, My God, in the most cracked voice I ever heard. Of seven cultivated men, only Sir William Brinton retained his composure, a thing more to his credit because he led the party and must have seen the sight first. It was a twilight grotto of enormous height, stretching away farther than any eye could see, a subterraneous world of limitless mystery and horrible suggestion. 
There were buildings and other architectural remains. In one terrified glance, I saw a weird pattern of tumuli, a savage circle of monoliths, a low-domed Roman ruin, a sprawling Saxon pile, and an early English edifice of wood. But all these were dwarfed by the ghoulish spectacle presented by the general surface of the ground. For yards about the steps extended an insane tangle of human bones, or bones at least as human as those on the steps. Like a foamy sea they stretched, some fallen apart, but others wholly or partly articulated as skeletons, these latter invariably in postures of demonic frenzy, either fighting off some menace or clutching other forms with cannibal intent. When Dr. Trask, the anthropologist, stooped to classify the skulls, he found a degraded mixture which utterly baffled him. They were mostly lower than the Piltdown Man in the scale of evolution, but in every case definitely human. Many were of higher grade, and a very few were the skulls of supremely and sensitively developed types. All the bones were gnawed, mostly by rats, but somewhat by others of the half-human drove. Mixed with them were many tiny bones of rats, fallen members of the lethal army which closed the ancient epic. I wonder that any man among us lived and kept his sanity through that hideous day of discovery. Not Hoffman or Hoysmans could conceive a scene more wildly incredible, more frenetically repellent, or more gothically grotesque than the twilight grotto through which we seven staggered, each stumbling on revelation after revelation, and trying to keep for the nonce from thinking of the events which must have taken place there three hundred years, or a thousand, or two thousand, or ten thousand years ago. It was the antechamber of hell, and poor Thornton fainted again when Trask told him that some of the skeleton things must have descended as quadrupeds through the last twenty or more generations. Horror piled on horror as we began to interpret the architectural remains. The quadruped things, with their occasional recruits from the biped class, have been kept in stone pens, out of which they must have broken in their last delirium of hunger or rat fear. There have been great herds of them, evidently fattened on the coarse vegetables whose remains could be found as a sort of poisonous ensilage at the bottom of huge stone bins older than Rome. I knew now why my ancestors had had such excessive gardens. Would to heaven I could forget. The purpose of the herds I did not have to ask. Sir William, standing with his searchlight in the Roman ruin, translated aloud the most shocking ritual I have ever known and told of the diet of the antediluvian cult which the priests of Sibylle found and mingled with their own. Norris, used as he was to the trenches, could not walk straight when he came out of the English building. It was a butcher shop and kitchen. He had expected that. But it was too much to see familiar English implements in such a place and to read familiar English graffiti there, some as recent as 1610. I could not go in that building, that building whose demon activities were stopped only by the dagger of my ancestor, Walter de la Poor. What I did venture to enter was the low Saxon building, whose oaken door had fallen, and there I found a terrible row of ten stone cells with rusty bars. Three had tenants, all skeletons of high grade, and on the bony forefinger of one I found a seal ring with my own coat of arms. Sir William found a vault with far older cells below the Roman chapel, but these cells were empty. Below them was a low crypt with cases of formally arranged bones, some of them bearing terrible parallel inscriptions carved in Latin, Greek, and the tongue of Phrygia. Meanwhile, Dr. Trask had opened one of the prehistoric tumuli and brought to light skulls which were slightly more human than a gorilla's and which bore indescribable ideographic carvings. Through all this horror, my cat stalked unperturbed. Once I saw him monstrously perched atop a mountain of bones and wondered at the secrets that might lie behind his yellow eyes. Having grasped to some slight degree the frightful revelations of this twilight area, an area so hideously foreshadowed by my recurrent dream, we turned to that apparently boundless depth of midnight cavern where no ray of light from the cliff could penetrate. We shall never know what sightless Stygian worlds yawn beyond the little distance we went, for it was decided that such secrets are not good for mankind. But there was plenty to engross us close at hand, for we had not gone far before the searchlight showed that accursed infinity of pits in which the rats had feasted and whose sudden lack of replenishment had driven the ravenous rodent army first to turn on the living herds of starving things and then to burst forth from the priory in that historic orgy of devastation which the peasants will never forget. 
God, those carrion black pits of sawed, picked bones and open skulls, those nightmare chasms choked with the pithecanthropoid, Celtic, Roman, and English bones of countless unhallowed centuries. Some of them were full, and none can say how deep they had once been. Others were still bottomless to our searchlights and peopled by unnameable fancies. What, I thought, of the hapless rats that stumbled into such traps amidst the blackness of their quests in this grisly Tartarus. Once my foot slipped near a horribly yawning brink, and I had a moment of ecstatic fear. I must have been musing a long time, for I could not see any of the party but the plump Captain Norris. Then there came a sound from that inky, boundless, farther distance that I thought I knew, and I saw my old black cat dart past me like a winged Egyptian god straight into the illimitable gulf of the unknown. But I was not far behind, for there was no doubt after another second. It was the eldritch scurrying of those fiend-born rats, always questing for new horrors and determined to lead me on even unto those grinning caverns of Earth's center, where Nyarlathotep, the mad, faceless god, howls blindly to the piping of two amorphous idiot flute players. My searchlight expired, but still I ran. I heard voices and yowls and echoes, but above all there gently rose that impious, insidious scurrying gently rising, rising as a stiff, bloated corpse gently rises above an oily river that flows under endless onyx bridges to a black, putrid sea. Something bumped into me, something soft and plump. It must have been the rats, the viscous, gelatinous, ravenous army that feast on the dead and the living. Why shouldn't rats eat Adela Poor as Adela Poor eats forbidden things? The war ate my boy, damn them all and the Yanks ate Carfax with flames, and Bert Grandsire Delapore, and the secret. No, no, I tell you, I am not that demon swineherd in the Twilight Grotto. It was not Edward Norris's fat face on that flabby fungus thing. Who says I am a Delapore? He lived, but my boy died. Shall a Norris hold the lands of a Delapore? It's voodoo, I tell you, that spotted snake. Curse you, Thornton, I'll teach you to faint at what my family do. Splud, thou stinkard! I'll learn ye had a gust. Wold ye swinky, me thilky wis? Magna mater! Magna mater! Atis! Dia ad aheid ad auden! Agus bach dunach ort! Donus is dolus ort! Agus leitza! Ung! Ung! Rrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
In this walk, so many times repeated, the world's greatest master of the terrible and the bazaar was obliged to pass a particular house on the eastern side of the street, a dingy, antiquated structure perched on the abruptly rising side hill, with a great unkempt yard dating from a time when the region was partly open country. It does not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet that house, to the two persons in possession of certain information, equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of the genius who so often passed it unknowingly and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. The house was, and for that matter still is, of a kind to attract the attention of the curious. Originally a farm or semi-farm building, it followed the average New England colonial lines of the middle 18th century, the prosperous peaked roof sort, with two stories and dormerless attic, and with the Georgian doorway and interior paneling dictated by the progress of taste at that time. It faced south, with one gable end buried to the lower windows in the eastward rising hill, and the other exposed to the foundations toward the street. Its construction, over a century and a half ago, had followed the grading and straightening of the road in that especial vicinity, for Benefit Street, at first called Back Street, was laid out as a lane winding amongst the graveyards of the first settlers and straightened only when the removal of the bodies to the north burial ground made it decently possible to cut through the old family plots. At the start, the western wall had lain some twenty feet up a precipitous lawn from the roadway, but a widening of the street at about the time of the Revolution sheared off most of the intervening space, exposing the foundations so that a brick basement wall had to be made, giving the deep cellar a street frontage with door and two windows above ground, close to the new line of public travel. When the sidewalk was laid out a century ago, the last of the intervening space was removed, and Poe in his walks must have seen only sheer ascent of dull gray brick flush with the sidewalk and surmounted at a height of ten feet by the antique shingled bulk of the house proper. The farm-like grounds extended back very deeply up the hill, almost to Wheaton Street. The space south of the house, abutting on Benefit Street, was of course greatly above the existing sidewalk level, forming a terrace bounded by a high bank wall of damp, mossy stone, pierced by a steep flight of narrow steps which led inward between canyon-like surfaces to the upper region of mangy lawn, roomy brick walls, and neglected gardens whose dismantled cement urns, rusted kettles fallen from tripods of knotty sticks, and similar paraphernalia set off the weather-beaten front door with its broken fanlight, rotting ionic pilasters, and wormy triangular pediment. What I heard in my youth about the shunned house was merely that people died there in alarmingly great numbers. That, I was told, was why the original owners had moved out some twenty years after building the place. It was plainly unhealthy, perhaps because of the dampness and fungus growth in the cellar, the general sickish smell, the drafts of the hallways, or the quality of the well and pump water. These things were bad enough, and these were all that gained belief among the persons whom I knew. Only the notebooks of my antiquarian uncle, Dr. Elihu Whipple, revealed to me at length the darker, vaguer surmises which formed an undercurrent of folklore among old-time servants and humble folk, surmises which never traveled far and which were largely forgotten when Providence grew to be a metropolis with a shifting modern population. The fact is that the house was never regarded by the solid part of the community as in any real sense haunted. There were no widespread tales of rattling chains, cold currents of air, extinguished lights, or faces at the window. Extremists sometimes said the house was unlucky, but that is as far as even they went. What was really beyond dispute is that a frightful proportion of persons died there, or more accurately, had died there, since after some peculiar happenings over sixty years ago, the building had become deserted through the sheer impossibility of renting it. These persons were not all cut off suddenly by any one cause, rather did it seem that their vitality was insidiously sapped, so that each one died the sooner from whatever tendency to weakness he may have naturally had. And those who did not die displayed, in varying degree, a type of anemia or consumption, and sometimes a decline of the mental faculties, which spoke ill for the salubriousness of the building. Neighboring houses, it must be added, seemed entirely free from the noxious quality. This much I knew before my insistent questioning led my uncle to show me the notes which finally embarked us both on our hideous investigation. 
In my childhood the shunned house was vacant, with barren, gnarled, and terrible old trees, long, queerly pale grass, and nightmarishly misshapen weeds in the high terraced yard where birds never lingered. We boys used to overrun the place, and I can still recall my youthful terror not only at the morbid strangeness of this sinister vegetation, but at the eldritch atmosphere and odor of the dilapidated house whose unlocked front door was often entered in quest of shutters. The small paned windows were largely broken, and a nameless air of desolation hung round the precarious paneling, shaky interior shutters, peeling wallpaper, falling plaster, rickety staircases, and such fragments of battered furniture as still remained. The dust and cobwebs added their touch of the fearful, and brave indeed was the boy who would voluntarily ascend the ladder to the attic, a vast, raftered length lighted only by small, blinking windows in the gable ends, and filled with a massed wreckage of chests, chairs, and spinning wheels, which infinite years of deposit had shrouded and festooned into monstrous and hellish shapes. But after all, the attic was not the most terrible part of the house. It was the dank, humid cellar which somehow exerted the strongest repulsion on us. Even though it was wholly above ground on the street side, with only a thin door and window pierced brick wall to separate it from the busy sidewalk. We scarcely knew whether to haunt it in spectral fashion or to shun it for the sake of our souls and our sanity. For one thing, the bad odor of the house was strongest there, and for another thing, we did not like the white fungus growths which occasionally sprang up in rainy summer weather from the hard earth floor. Those fungi, grotesquely like the vegetation in the yard outside, were truly horrible in their outlines, detestable parodies of toadstools and Indian pipes, whose like we had never seen in any other situation. They rotted quickly, and at one stage became slightly phosphorescent, so that nocturnal passers-by sometimes spoke of witch-fires glowing behind the broken panes of the feeder-spreading windows. We never— even in our wildest Halloween moods visited this cellar by night. But in some of our daytime visits could detect the phosphorescence, especially when the day was dark and wet. There was also a subtler thing we often thought we detected, a very strange thing which was, however, merely suggestive at most. I refer to a sort of cloudy whitish pattern on the dirt floor, a vague shifting deposit of mold or nitre which we sometimes thought we could trace amidst the sparse fungus growths near the huge fireplace of the basement kitchen. Once in a while it struck us that this patch bore an uncanny resemblance to a doubled-up human figure, though generally no such kinship existed, and often there was no whitish deposit whatever. On a certain rainy afternoon, when this illusion seemed phenomenally strong, and when, in addition, I had fancied I glimpsed a kind of thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation rising from the nitrous pattern toward the yawning fireplace, I spoke to my uncle about the matter. He smiled at this odd conceit, but it seemed that his smile was tinged with reminiscence. Later I heard that a similar notion entered into some of the wild ancient tales of the common folk— a notion likewise alluding to ghoulish, wolfish shapes taken by smoke from the great chimney and queer contours assumed by certain of the sinuous tree roots that thrust their way into the cellar through the loose foundation stones. 2. Not till my adult years did my uncle set before me the notes and data which he had collected concerning the shunned house. Dr. Whipple was a sane, conservative physician of the old school— and for all his interest in the place was not eager to encourage young thoughts toward the abnormal. His own view, postulating simply a building and location of markedly unsanitary qualities, had nothing to do with abnormality, but he realized that the very picturesqueness which aroused his own interest would, in a boy's fanciful mind, take on all manner of gruesome imaginative associations. The doctor was a bachelor, a white-haired, clean-shaven, old-fashioned gentleman, and a local historian of note who had often broken a lance with such controversial guardians of tradition as Sidney S. Ryder and Thomas W. Bicknell. He lived with one manservant in a Georgian homestead with knocker and iron-railed steps balanced eerily on a steep ascent of North Court Street beside the ancient brick court and colony house where his grandfather, a cousin of that celebrated privateersman Captain Whipple who burnt His Majesty's armed schooner Gaspee in 1772, had voted in the legislature on May 4, 1776 for the independence of the Rhode Island colony. Around him in the damp, low-sealed library with the musty white paneling, 
heavy carved overmantel, and small paned vine shaded windows were the relics and records of his ancient family, among which were many dubious allusions to the shunned house in Benefit Street. That pest spot lies not far distant, for Benefit runs ledgewise just above the courthouse, along the precipitous hill up which the first settlement climbed. When, in the end, my insistent pestering and maturing years evoked from my uncle the hoarded lore I sought, there lay before me a strange enough chronicle. Long-winded, statistical, and drearily genealogical as some of the matter was, there ran through it a continuous thread of brooding, tenacious horror and preternatural malevolence which impressed me even more than it had impressed the good doctor. Separate events fitted together uncannily, and seemingly irrelevant details held minds of hideous possibilities. A new and burning curiosity grew in me, compared to which my boyish curiosity was feeble and inchoate. The first revelation led to an exhaustive research, and finally to that shuddering quest which proved so disastrous to myself and mine. For at last my uncle insisted on joining the search I had commenced, and after a certain night in that house he did not come away with me. I am lonely without that gentle soul, whose long years were filled only with honor, virtue, good taste, benevolence, and learning. I have reared a marble urn to his memory in St. John's churchyard, the place that Poe loved, the hidden grove of giant willows on the hill where tombs and headstones huddle quietly between the hoary bulk of the church and the houses and bank walls of Benefit Street. The history of the house, opening amidst a maze of dates, revealed no trace of the sinister either about its construction or about the prosperous and honorable family who built it. Yet from the first a taint of calamity soon increased to boding significance was apparent. My uncle's carefully compiled record began with the building of the structure in 1763 and followed the theme with an unusual amount of detail. The shunned house, it seems, was first inhabited by William Harris and his wife, Roby Dexter, with their children, Elkanah, born in 1755, Abigail, born in 1757, William Jr., born in 1759, and Ruth, born in 1761. Harris was a substantial merchant and seaman in the West India trade, connected with the firm of Obadiah Brown and his nephews. After Brown's death in 1761, the new firm of Nicholas Brown and Company made him master of the Brig Prudence, Providence built of 120 tons, thus enabling him to erect the new homestead he had desired ever since his marriage. The site he had chosen, a recently straightened part of the new and fashionable back street, which ran along the side of the hill above crowded Cheapside, was all that could be wished, and the building did justice to the location. It was the best that moderate means could afford, and Harris hastened to move in before the birth of a fifth child, which the family expected. That child, a boy, came in December, but was stillborn. Nor was any child to be born alive in that house for a century and a half. The next April sickness occurred among the children, and Abigail and Ruth died before the month was over. Dr. Job Ives diagnosed the trouble as some infantile fever, though others declared it was more of a mere wasting away or decline. It seemed, in any event, to be contagious, for Hannah Bowen, one of the two servants, died of it in the following June. Eli Ladis and the other servant constantly complained of weakness and would have returned to his father's farm in Rehoboth, but for a sudden attachment from Mehitable Pierce, who was hired to succeed Hannah. He died the next year, a sad year indeed, since it marked the death of William Harris himself, enfeebled as he was by the climate of Martinique, where his occupation had kept him for considerable periods during the preceding decade. The widowed Roby Harris never recovered from the shock of her husband's death, and the passing of her firstborn Elkanah two years later was the final blow to her reason. In 1768 she fell victim to a mild form of insanity, and was thereafter confined to the upper part of the house her elder maiden sister, Mercy Dexter, having moved in to take charge of the family. Mercy was a plain, raw-boned woman of great strength, but her health visibly declined from the time of her advent. She was greatly devoted to her unfortunate sister, and had an especial affection for her only surviving nephew William, who from a sturdy infant had become a sickly, spindling lad. In this year the servant Mehitable died, and the other servant, preserved Smith, left without coherent explanation, or at least with only some wild tales and a complaint that he disliked the smell of the place. 
For a time, Mercy could secure no more help, since the seven deaths and case of madness, all occurring within five years' space, had begun to set in motion the body of fireside rumor which later became so bizarre. Ultimately, however, she obtained new servants from out of town. Anne White, a morose woman from the part of North Kingstown now set off as the township of Exeter, and a capable Boston man named Zenas Lowe. It was Anne White who first gave definite shape to the sinister idle talk. Mercy should have known better than to hire anyone from the Neusneck Hill country, for that remote bit of backwoods was then, as now, a seat of the most uncomfortable superstitions. As late as 1892, an Exeter community exhumed a dead body and ceremoniously burnt its heart in order to prevent certain alleged visitations injurious to the public health and peace, and one may imagine the point of view of the same section in 1768. Anne's tongue was perniciously active, and within a few months Mercy discharged her, filling her place with a faithful and amiable Amazon from Newport, Mariah Robbins. Meanwhile, poor Roby Harris, in her madness, gave voice to dreams and imaginings of the most hideous sort. At times her screams became insupportable, and for long periods she would utter shrieking horrors which necessitated her son's temporary residence with his cousin, Peleg Harris, in Presbyterian Lane near the new college building. The boy would seem to improve after these visits, and had Mercy been as wise as she was well-meaning, she would have let him live permanently with Peleg. Just what Mrs. Harris cried out in her fits of violence, tradition hesitates to say, or rather, presents such extravagant accounts that they nullify themselves through sheer absurdity. Certainly it sounds absurd to hear that a woman educated only in the rudiments of French often shouted for hours in a coarse and idiomatic form of that language, or that the same person, alone and guarded, complained wildly of a staring thing which bit and chewed at her. In 1772 the servant Zenas died, and when Mrs. Harris heard of it, she laughed with a shocking delight utterly foreign to her. The next year she herself died, and was laid to rest in the north burial ground beside her husband. Upon the outbreak of trouble with Great Britain in 1775, William Harris, despite his scant sixteen years and feeble constitution, managed to enlist in the Army of Observation under General Green, and from that time on enjoyed a steady rise in health and prestige. In 1780, as a captain in Rhode Island forces in New Jersey under Colonel Angel, he met and married Phoebe Hetfield of Elizabethtown, whom he brought to Providence upon his honorable discharge in the following year. The young soldier's return was not a thing of unmitigated happiness. The house, it is true, was still in good condition, and the street had been widened and changed in name from Back Street to Benefit Street, but Mercy Dexter's once robust frame had undergone a sad and curious decay, so that she was now a stooped and pathetic figure with hollow voice and disconcerting pallor, qualities shared to a singular degree by the one remaining servant, Mariah. In the autumn of 1782, Phoebe Harris gave birth to a stillborn daughter, and on the 15th of the next May, Mercy Dexter took leave of a useful, austere, and virtuous life. William Harris, at last thoroughly convinced of the radically unhealthful nature of his abode, now took steps toward quitting and closing it forever. Securing temporary quarters for himself and his wife at the newly opened Golden Ball Inn, he arranged for the building of a new and finer house in Westminster Street, in the growing part of the town across the Great Bridge. There, in 1785, his son Duty was born, and there the family dwelt till the encroachments of commerce drove them back across the river and over the hill to Angel Street, in the newer East Side Residence District, where the late Archer Harris built his sumptuous but hideous French-roofed mansion in 1876. William and Phoebe both succumbed to the yellow fever epidemic of 1797, but Duty was brought up by his cousin, Rathbone Harris, Peleg's son. Rathbone was a practical man, and rented the Benefit Street house, despite William's wish to keep it vacant. He considered it an obligation to his ward to make the most of all the boy's property, nor did he concern himself with the deaths and illnesses which caused so many changes of tenants, or the steadily growing aversion with which the house was generally regarded. It is likely that he felt only vexation when, in 1804, the town council ordered him to fumigate the place with sulfur, tar, and gum camphor, on account of the much-discussed deaths of four persons, presumably caused by the then-diminishing fever epidemic. They said the place had a febrile smell. 
Duty himself thought little of the house, for he grew up to be a privateersman and served with distinction on the vigilant under Captain Cahoon in the War of 1812. He returned unharmed, married in 1814, and became a father on that memorable night of September 23, 1815, when a great gale drove the waters of the bay over half the town and floated a tall sloop well up Westminster Street so that its mast almost tapped the Harris windows in symbolic affirmation that the new boy, Welcome, was a seaman's son. Welcome did not survive his father, but lived to perish gloriously at Fredericksburg in 1862. Neither he nor his son Archer knew of the shunned house as other than a nuisance, almost impossible to rent, perhaps on account of the mustiness and sickly odor of unkept old age. Indeed, it never was rented after a series of deaths culminating in 1861, which the excitement of the war tended to throw into obscurity. Carrington Harris, last of the male line, knew it only as a deserted and somewhat picturesque center of legend, until I told him my experience. He had meant to tear it down and build an apartment house on the site, but after my account decided to let it stand, install plumbing, and rent it. Nor has he yet had any difficulty in obtaining tenants. The horror has gone. 3. It may well be imagined how powerfully I was affected by the annals of the Harrises. In this continuous record there seemed to me to brood a persistent evil beyond anything in nature as I had known it an evil clearly connected with the house and not with the family. This impression was confirmed by my uncle's less systematic array of miscellaneous data, legends transcribed from servant gossip, cuttings from the papers, copies of death certificates by fellow physicians and the like. All of this material I cannot hope to give, for my uncle was a tireless antiquarian and very deeply interested in the shunned house but I may refer to several dominant points which earn notice by their recurrence through many reports from diverse sources. For example, the servant gossip was practically unanimous in attributing to the fungus and malodorous cellar of the house a vast supremacy and evil influence. There had been servants, and White especially, who would not use the cellar kitchen, and at least three well-defined legends bore upon the queer, quasi-human or diabolic outlines assumed by tree roots and patches of mold in that region. These latter narratives interested me profoundly, on account of what I had seen in my boyhood, but I felt that most of the significance had in each case been largely obscured by additions from the common stock of local ghost lore. Anne White, with her Exeter superstition, had promulgated the most extravagant and at the same time most consistent tale, alleging that there must lie buried beneath the house one of those vampires, the dead who retain their bodily form and live on the blood or breath of the living, whose hideous legions send their praying shapes or spirits abroad by night. To destroy a vampire one must, the grandmothers say, exhume it and burn its heart, or at least drive a stake through that organ, and Anne's dogged insistence on a search under the cellar had been prominent in bringing about her discharge. Her tales, however, commanded a wide audience, and were the more readily accepted because the house indeed stood on land once used for burial purposes. To me their interest depended less on this circumstance than on the peculiarly appropriate way in which they dovetailed with certain other things— the complaint of the departing servant preserved Smith, who had preceded Anne and never heard of her, that something sucked his breath at night. The death certificates of fever victims of 1804, issued by Dr. Chad Hopkins, and showing the four deceased persons all unaccountably lacking in blood, and the obscure passages of poor Roby Harris's ravings, where she complained of the sharp teeth of a glassy-eyed, half-visible presence. Free from unwarranted superstition though I am, these things produced in me an odd sensation, which was intensified by a pair of widely separated newspaper cuttings relating to deaths in the shunned house, one from the Providence Gazette and Country Journal of April 12, 1815, and the other from the Daily Transcript and Chronicle of October 27, 1845, each of which detailed an appallingly grisly circumstance whose duplication was remarkable. It seems that in both instances the dying person, in 1815 a gentle old lady named Stafford, and in 1845 a schoolteacher of middle age named Eliezer Durfee, became transfigured in a horrible way, glaring glassily and attempting to bite the throat of the attending physician. 
Even more puzzling, though, was the final case which put an end to the renting of the house, a series of anemia deaths preceded by progressive madnesses wherein the patient would craftily attempt the lives of his relatives by incisions in the neck or wrist. This was in 1860 and 1861, when my uncle had just begun his medical practice, and before leaving for the front he heard much of it from his elder professional colleagues. The really inexplicable thing was the way in which the victims, ignorant people, for the ill-smelling and widely shunned house could now be rented to no others, would babble maledictions in French, a language they could not possibly have studied to any extent. It made one think of poor Roby Harris nearly a century before, and so moved my uncle that he commenced collecting historical data on the house after listening, some time subsequent to his return from the war, to the first-hand account of Drs. Chase and Whitmarsh. Indeed, I could see that my uncle had thought deeply on the subject and that he was glad of my own interest, an open-minded and sympathetic interest which enabled him to discuss with me matters at which others would merely have laughed. His fancy had not gone so far as mine, but he felt that the place was rare in its imaginative potentialities and worthy of note as an inspiration in the field of the grotesque and macabre. For my part, I was disposed to take the whole subject with profound seriousness, and began at once not only to review the evidence, but to accumulate as much more as I could. I talked with the elderly Archer Harris, an owner of the house, many times before his death in 1916, and obtained from him and his still-surviving maiden sister Alice an authentic corroboration of all the family data my uncle had collected. When, however, I asked them what connection with France or its language the house could have, they confessed themselves as frankly baffled and ignorant as I. Archer knew nothing, and all that Miss Harris could say was that an old illusion her grandfather, Duty Harris, had heard of might have shed a little light. The old seaman who had survived his son Welcome's death in battle by two years had not himself known the legend, but recalled that his earliest nurse, the ancient Mariah Robbins, seemed darkly aware of something that might have lent a weird significance to the French ravings of Roby Harris, which she had so often heard during the last days of that hapless woman. Mariah had been at the shunned house from 1769 till the removal of the family in 1783, and had seen Mercy Dexter die. Once she hinted to the child duty of a somewhat peculiar circumstance in Mercy's last moments, but he had soon forgotten all about it, save that it was something peculiar. The granddaughter, moreover, recalled even this much with difficulty. She and her brother were not so much interested in the house as was Archer's son Carrington, the present owner, with whom I talked after my experience. Having exhausted the Harris family of all the information it could furnish, I turned my attention to early town records and deeds with a zeal more penetrating than that which my uncle had occasionally shown in the same work. What I wished was a comprehensive history of the site, from its very settlement in 1636, or even before if any Narragansett Indian legend could be unearthed to supply the data. I found at the start that the land had been part of the long strip of home lot granted originally to John Throckmorton, one of many similar strips beginning at the town street beside the river and extending up over the hill to a line roughly corresponding with the modern Hope Street. The Throckmorton lot had later, of course, been much subdivided, and I became very assiduous in tracing that section through which Back or Benefit Street was later run. It had, a rumor indeed said, been the Throckmorton graveyard but as I examined the records more carefully, I found that the graves had all been transferred at an early date to the North Burial Ground on the Pawtucket West Road. Then suddenly I came, by a rare piece of chance, since it was not in the main body of records and might easily have been missed, upon something which aroused my keenest eagerness, fitting in as it did with several of the queerest phases of the affair. It was the record of a lease in 1697 of a small tract of ground to an Etienne Roulet and wife. At last the French element had appeared, that and another deeper element of horror which the name conjured up from the darkest recesses of my weird and heterogeneous reading, and I feverishly studied the platting of the locality as it had been before the cutting through and partial straightening of Back Street between 1747 and 1758. I found what I had half expected, that where the shunned house now stood, the Roulets had laid out their graveyard behind a one-story and attic cottage, and that no record of any transfer of graves existed. The document indeed ended in much confusion, and I was forced to ransack both the Rhode Island Historical Society and Shapley Library before I could find a local door which the name Etienne Roulet would unlock.
In the end I did find something, something of such vague but monstrous import that I set about at once to examine the cellar of the shunned house itself with a new and excited minuteness. The Roulets, it seemed, had come in 1696 from East Greenwich, down the west shore of Narragansett Bay. They were Huguenots from Code, and had encountered much opposition before the Providence select men allowed them to settle in the town. Unpopularity had dogged them in East Greenwich, whither they had come in 1686 after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and rumors said that the cause of dislike extended beyond mere racial and national prejudice, or the land disputes which involved other French settlers with the English and rivalries which not even Governor Andros could quell. But their ardent Protestantism, too ardent, some whispered, and their evident distress when virtually driven from the village down the bay, had moved the sympathy of the town fathers. Here the strangers had been granted a haven, and the swarthy Etienne Roulet, less apt at agriculture than at reading queer books and drawing queer diagrams, was given a clerical post in the warehouse at Pardon Tillinghast's wharf, far south in Town Street. There had, however, been a riot of some sort later on, perhaps forty years later, after old Roulet's death, and no one seemed to hear of the family after that. For a century and more, it appeared, the Roulets had been well remembered and frequently discussed as vivid incidents in the quiet life of a New England seaport. Etienne's son Paul, a surly fellow whose erratic conduct had probably provoked the riot which wiped out the family, was particularly a source of speculation. And though Providence never shared the witchcraft panics of her Puritan neighbors, it was freely intimated by old wives that his prayers were neither uttered at the proper time nor directed toward the proper object. All this had undoubtedly formed the basis of the legend known by old Mariah Robbins. What relation it had to the French ravings of Roby Harris and other inhabitants of the shunned house, imagination or future discovery alone could determine. I wondered how many of those who had known the legends realized that additional link with the terrible which my wide reading had given me, that ominous item in the annals of morbid horror which tells of the creature Jacques Roulet of Code, who in 1598 was condemned to death as a demonic, but afterwards saved from the stake by the Paris Parliament and shut in a madhouse. He had been found covered with blood and shreds of flesh in a wood shortly after the killing and rending of a boy by a pair of wolves. One wolf was seen to lope away unhurt. Surely a pretty hearthside tale with a queer significance as to name and place, but I decided that the Providence gossips could not have generally known of it. Had they known, the coincidence of names would have brought some drastic and frightened action. Indeed, might not its limited whispering have precipitated the final riot which erased the roulets from the town? I now visited the accursed place with increased frequency, studying the unwholesome vegetation of the garden, examining all the walls of the building, and poring over every inch of the earthen cellar floor. Finally, with Carrington Harris's permission, I fitted a key to the disused door opening from the cellar directly upon Benefit Street, preferring to have a more immediate access to the outside world than the dark stairs, ground-floor hall, and front door could give. There, where morbidity lurked most thickly, I searched and poked during long afternoons when the sunlight filtered in through the cobwebbed above-ground windows and a sense of security glowed from the unlocked door which placed me only a few feet from the placid sidewalk outside. Nothing new rewarded my efforts, only the same depressing mustiness and faint suggestions of noxious odors and nitrous outlines on the floor— and I fancy that many pedestrians must have watched me curiously through the broken panes. At length, upon a suggestion of my uncle's, I decided to try the spot nocturnally, and one stormy midnight ran the beams of an electric torch over the moldy floor with its uncanny shapes and distorted, half-phosphorescent fungi. The place had dispirited me curiously that evening, and I was almost prepared when I saw, or thought I saw, amidst the whitish deposits, a particularly sharp definition of the huddled form I had suspected from boyhood. Its clearness was astonishing and unprecedented, and as I watched I seemed to see again the thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation which had startled me on that rainy afternoon so many years before. Above the anthropomorphic patch of mold by the fireplace it rose, a subtle, sickish, almost luminous vapor, which as it hung trembling in the dampness seemed to develop vague and shocking suggestions of form, gradually trailing off into nebulous decay and passing up into the blackness of the great chimney with a feeder in its wake. 
It was truly horrible, and the more so to me because of what I knew of the spot. Refusing to flee, I watched it fade, and as I watched, I felt that it was in turn watching me greedily with eyes more imaginable than visible. When I told my uncle about it, he was greatly aroused, and after a tense hour of reflection, arrived at a definite and drastic decision. Weighing in his mind the importance of the matter and the significance of our relation to it, he insisted that we both test, and if possible destroy, the horror of the house by a joint night or nights of aggressive vigil in that musty and fungus-cursed cellar. 4. On Wednesday, June 25, 1919, after a proper notification of Carrington Harris, which did not include surmises as to what we expected to find, my uncle and I conveyed to the shunned house two camp chairs and a folding camp cot, together with some scientific mechanism of greater weight and intricacy. These we placed in the cellar during the day, screening the windows with paper and planning to return in the evening for our first vigil. We had locked the door from the cellar to the ground floor, and having a key to the outside cellar door, we were prepared to leave our expensive and delicate apparatus, which we had obtained secretly and at great cost, as many days as our vigils might need to be protracted. It was our design to sit up together till very late, and then watch singly till dawn in two-hour stretches, myself first and then my companion, the inactive member resting on the cot. The natural leadership with which my uncle procured the instruments from the laboratories of Brown University and the Cranston Street Armory and instinctively assumed direction of our venture was a marvelous commentary on the potential vitality and resilience of a man of eighty-one. Ella Hugh Whipple had lived according to the hygienic laws he had preached as a physician, and but for what happened later would be here in full vigor today. Only two persons suspect what did happen, Carrington Harris and myself. I had to tell Harris because he owned the house and deserved to know what had gone out of it. Then, too, we had spoken to him in advance of our quest, and I felt after my uncle's going that he would understand and assist me in some vitally necessary public explanations. He turned very pale but agreed to help me and decided that it would now be safe to rent the house. To declare that we were not nervous on that rainy night of watching would be an exaggeration both gross and ridiculous. We were not, as I have said, in any sense childishly superstitious, but scientific study and reflection had taught us that the known universe of three dimensions embraces the merest fraction of the whole cosmos of substance and energy. In this case, an overwhelming preponderance of evidence from numerous authentic sources pointed to the tenacious existence of certain forces of great power and, so far as the human point of view is concerned, exceptional malignancy. To say that we actually believed in vampires or werewolves would be a carelessly inclusive statement. Rather must it be said that we were not prepared to deny the possibility of certain unfamiliar and unclassified modifications of vital force and attenuated matter, existing very infrequently in three-dimensional space because of its more intimate connection with other spatial units, yet close enough to the boundary of our own to furnish us occasional manifestations which we, for lack of a proper vantage point, may never hope to understand. In short, it seemed to my uncle and me that an incontrovertible array of facts pointed to some lingering influence in the shunned house, traceable to one or another of the ill-favored French settlers of two centuries before, and still operative through rare and unknown laws of atomic and electronic motion. That the family of Roulet had possessed an abnormal affinity for outer circles of entity, dark spheres which for normal folk hold only repulsion and terror, their recorded history seemed to prove. Had not then the riots of those bygone 1730s set moving certain kinetic patterns in the morbid brain of one or more of them, notably the sinister Paul Roulet, which obscurely survived the bodies murdered and buried by the mob, and continued to function in some multiple-dimension space along the original lines of force determined by a frantic hatred of the encroaching community? Such a thing was surely not a physical or biochemical impossibility in the light of a newer science which includes the theories of relativity and intraatomic action. One might easily imagine an alien nucleus of substance or energy, formless or otherwise, kept alive by imperceptible or immaterial subtractions from the life force or bodily tissues and fluids of other and more palpably living things into which it penetrates and with whose fabric it sometimes completely merges itself. It might be actively hostile, or it might be dictated merely by blind motives of self-preservation, 
In any case, such a monster must of necessity be in our scheme of things an anomaly and an intruder, whose extirpation forms a primary duty with every man not an enemy to the world's life, health, and sanity. What baffled us was our utter ignorance of the aspect in which we might encounter the thing. No sane person had ever seen it, and few had ever felt it definitely. It might be pure energy, a form ethereal and outside the realm of substance, or it might be partly material, some unknown and equivocal mass of plasticity, capable of changing at will to nebulous approximations of the solid, liquid, gaseous, or tenuously unparticled states. The anthropomorphic patch of mold on the floor, the form of the yellowish vapor, and the curvature of the tree roots and some of the old tales all argued at least a remote and reminiscent connection with the human shape, but how representative or permanent that similarity might be, none could say with any kind of certainty. We had devised two weapons to fight it, a large and specially fitted crook's tube operated by powerful storage batteries and provided with peculiar screens and reflectors in case it proved intangible and opposable only by vigorously destructive ether radiations, and a pair of military flamethrowers of the sort used in the World War in case it proved partly material and susceptible of mechanical destruction, for like the superstitious Exeter rustics, we were prepared to burn the thing's heart out if heart existed to burn. All this aggressive mechanism we set in the cellar and positions carefully arranged with reference to the cot and chairs and to the spot before the fireplace where the mold had taken strange shapes. That suggestive patch, by the way, was only faintly visible when we placed our furniture and instruments and when we returned that evening for the actual vigil. For a moment I half doubted that I had ever seen it in the more definitely limbed form, but then I thought of the legends. Our cellar vigil began at 10 p.m., daylight saving time, and as it continued we found no promise of pertinent developments. A weak, filtered glow from the rain-harassed street lamps outside and a feeble phosphorescence from the detestable fungi within showed the dripping stone of the walls from which all traces of whitewash had vanished, the dank, fetid, and mildew-tainted hard-earth floor with its obscene fungi, the rotting remains of what had been stools, chairs, and tables, and other more shapeless furniture, the heavy planks and massive beams of the ground floor overhead, the decrepit plank door leading to bins and chambers beneath other parts of the house, the crumbling stone staircase with ruined wooden handrail, and the crude and cavernous fireplace of blackened brick where rusted iron fragments revealed the past presence of hooks, and iron, spit, crane, and a door to the Dutch oven. These things, and our austere cot and camp chairs, and the heavy and intricate destructive machinery we had brought. We had, as in my own former explorations, left the door to the street unlocked, so that a direct and practical path of escape might lie open in case of manifestations beyond our power to deal with. It was our idea that our continued nocturnal presence would call forth whatever malign entity lurked there, and that, being prepared, we could dispose of the thing with one or the other of our provided means as soon as we had recognized and observed it sufficiently. How long it might require to evoke and extinguish the thing, we had no notion. It occurred to us, too, that our venture was far from safe, for in what strength the thing might appear no one could tell. But we deemed the game worth the hazard, and embarked on it alone and unhesitatingly, conscious that the seeking of outside aid would only expose us to ridicule and perhaps defeat our entire purpose. Such was our frame of mind as we talked, far into the night, till my uncle's growing drowsiness made me remind him to lie down for his two-hour sleep. Something like fear chilled me as I sat there in the small hours alone. I say alone, for one who sits by a sleeper is indeed alone, perhaps more alone than he can realize. My uncle breathed heavily, his deep inhalations and exhalations accompanied by the rain outside and punctuated by another nerve-wracking sound of distant, dripping water within, for the house was repulsively damp even in dry weather, and in this storm positively swamp-like. I studied the loose, antique masonry of the walls and the fungus light and the feeble rays which stole in from the street through the screened windows, and once, when the noisome atmosphere of the place seemed about to sicken me, I opened the door and looked up and down the street, feasting my eyes on familiar sights and my nostrils on the wholesome air. Still nothing occurred to reward my watching, and I yawned repeatedly, fatigue getting the better of apprehension. Then the stirring of my uncle in his sleep attracted my notice. 
He had turned restlessly on the cot several times during the latter half of the first hour, but now he was breathing with unusual irregularity, occasionally heaving a sigh which held more than a few of the qualities of a choking moan. I turned my electric flashlight on him and found his face averted, so rising and crossing to the other side of the cot, I again flashed the light to see if he seemed in any pain. What I saw unnerved me most surprisingly, considering its relative triviality. It must have been merely the association of any odd circumstance with the sinister nature of our location and mission, for surely the circumstance was not in itself frightful or unnatural. It was merely that my uncle's facial expression, disturbed no doubt by the strange dreams which our situation prompted, betrayed considerable agitation, and seemed not at all characteristic of him. His habitual expression was one of kindly and well-bred calm, whereas now a variety of emotions seemed struggling within him. I think, on the whole, that it was the variety which chiefly disturbed me. My uncle, as he gasped and tossed in increasing perturbation, and with eyes that had now started open, seemed not one but many men, and suggested a curious quality of alienage from himself. All at once he commenced to mutter, and I did not like the look of his mouth and teeth as he spoke. The words were at first indistinguishable, and then, with a tremendous start, I recognized something about them which filled me with icy fear, till I recalled the breadth of my uncle's education and interminable translations he had made from anthropological and antiquarian articles in the Revue des Deux Mondes, for the venerable Elihu Whipple was muttering in French, and the few phrases I could distinguish seemed connected with the darkest myths he had ever adapted from the famous Paris magazine. Suddenly a perspiration broke out on the sleeper's forehead, and he leaped abruptly up half awake. The tumble of French changed to a cry in English, and the hoarse voice shouted excitedly, My breath! My breath! Then the awakening became complete, and with a subsidence of facial expression to the normal state, my uncle seized my hand and began to relate a dream whose nucleus of significance I could only surmise with a kind of awe. He had, he said, floated off from a very ordinary series of dream pictures into a scene whose strangeness was related to nothing he had ever read. It was of this world, and yet not of it, a shadowy geometrical confusion in which could be seen elements of familiar things in most unfamiliar and perturbing combinations. There was a suggestion of queerly disordered pictures superimposed one upon another, an arrangement in which the essentials of time as well as of space seemed dissolved and mixed in the most illogical fashion. In this kaleidoscopic vortex of phantasmal images were occasional snapshots, if one might use the term, of singular clearness but unaccountable heterogeneity. Once my uncle thought he lay in a carelessly dug open pit with a crowd of angry faces framed by straggling locks and three-cornered hats frowning down on him. Again he seemed to be in the interior of a house, an old house, apparently, but the details and inhabitants were constantly changing, and he could never be certain of the faces or the furniture, or even of the room itself, since doors and windows seemed in just as great a state of flux as the more presumably mobile objects. It was queer, damnably queer, and my uncle spoke almost sheepishly as if half expecting not to be believed when he declared that of the strange faces many had unmistakably borne the features of the Harris family. And all the while there was a personal sensation of choking, as if some pervasive presence had spread itself through his body and sought to possess itself of his vital processes. I shuddered at the thought of those vital processes, worn as they were by eighty-one years of continuous functioning, in conflict with unknown forces of which the youngest and strongest system might well be afraid, but in another moment reflected that dreams are only dreams, and that these uncomfortable visions could be, at most, no more than my uncle's reaction to the investigations and expectations which had lately filled our minds to the exclusion of all else. Conversation also soon tended to dispel my sense of strangeness, and in time I yielded to my yawns and took my turn at slumber. My uncle seemed now very wakeful and welcomed his period of watching, even though the nightmare had roused him far ahead of his allotted two hours. Sleep seized me quickly, and I was at once haunted with dreams of the most disturbing kind. I felt in my visions a cosmic and abysmal loneliness, with hostility surging from all sides upon some prison where I lay confined. 
I seemed bound and gagged and taunted by the echoing yells of distant multitudes who thirsted for my blood. My uncle's face came to me with less pleasant associations than in waking hours, and I recall many futile struggles and attempts to scream. It was not a pleasant sleep, and for a second I was not sorry for the echoing shriek which clove through the barriers of dream and flung me to a sharp and startled awakeness in which every actual object before my eyes stood out with more than natural clearness and reality. 5. I had been lying with my face away from my uncle's chair, so that in this sudden flash of awakening I saw only the door to the street, the more northerly window, and the wall and floor and ceiling toward the north of the room, all photographed with morbid vividness on my brain and a light brighter than the glow of the fungi or the rays from the street outside. It was not a strong or even a fairly strong light, certainly not nearly strong enough to read an average book by, but it cast a shadow of myself and the cot on the floor and had a yellowish penetrating force that hinted at things more potent than luminosity. This I perceived with unhealthy sharpness, despite the fact that two of my other senses were violently assailed, for on my ears rang the reverberations of that shocking scream, while my nostrils revolted at the stench which filled the place. My mind, as alert as my senses, recognized the gravely unusual, and almost automatically I leaped up and turned about to grasp the destructive instruments which we had left trained on the moldy spot before the fireplace. As I turned, I dreaded what I was to see, for the scream had been in my uncle's voice, and I knew not against what menace I should have to defend him and myself. Yet after all, the sight was worse than I had dreaded. There are horrors beyond horrors, and this was one of those nuclei of all dreamable hideousness which the cosmos saves to blast an accursed and unhappy few. Out of the fungus-ridden earth steamed up a vaporous corpse light, yellow and diseased, which bubbled and lapped to a gigantic height in vague outlines, half human and half monstrous, through which I could see the chimney and fireplace beyond. It was all eyes, wolfish and mocking, and the rugose insect-like head dissolved at the top to a thin stream of mist which curled putridly about and finally vanished up the chimney. I say that I saw this thing, but it is only in conscious retrospection that I ever definitely traced its damnable approach to form. At the time it was to me only a seething, dimly phosphorescent cloud of fungus loathsomeness, enveloping and dissolving to an abhorrent plasticity the one object to which all my attention was focused. That object was my uncle, the venerable Elihu Whipple, who with blackening and decaying features leered and gibbered at me and reached out dripping claws to rend me in the fury which this horror had brought. It was a sense of routine which kept me from going mad. I had drilled myself in preparation for the crucial moment, and blind training saved me. Recognizing the bubbling evil as no substance reachable by matter or material chemistry, and therefore ignoring the flamethrower which loomed on my left, I threw on the current of the crook's tube apparatus and focused toward that scene of immortal blasphemousness, the strongest ether radiations which man's art can arouse from the spaces and fluids of nature. There was a bluish haze and a frenzied sputtering, and the yellowish phosphorescence grew dimmer to my eyes but I saw the dimness was only that of contrast, and that the waves from the machine had no effect whatever. Then, in the midst of that demonic spectacle, I saw a fresh horror which brought cries to my lips and sent me fumbling and staggering toward that unlocked door to the quiet street, careless of what abnormal terrors I loosed upon the world or what thoughts or judgments of men I brought down upon my head. In that dim blend of blue and yellow, the form of my uncle had commenced a nauseous liquefaction, whose essence eludes all description, and in which there played across his vanishing face such changes of identity as only madness can conceive. He was at once a devil and a multitude, a charnel house and a pageant. Lit by the mixed and uncertain beams, that gelatinous face assumed a dozen, a score, a hundred aspects, grinning as it sank to the ground on a body that melted like tallow in the caricatured likeness of legions strange and yet not strange. I saw the features of the Harris line, masculine and feminine, adult and infantile, and other features old and young, coarse and refined, familiar and unfamiliar. For a second there flashed a degraded counterfeit of a miniature of poor mad Roby Harris that I had seen in the School of Design Museum, 
and another time I thought I caught the raw-boned image of Mercy Dexter, as I recalled her from a painting in Carrington Harris's house. It was frightful beyond conception. Toward the last, when a curious blend of servant and baby visages flickered close to the fungus floor where a pool of greenish grease was spreading, it seemed as though the shifting features fought against themselves and strove to form contours like those of my uncle's kindly face. I liked to think that he existed at that moment, and that he tried to bid me farewell. It seems to me I hiccuped a farewell from my own parched throat as I lurched out into the street, a thin stream of grease following me through the door to the rain-drenched sidewalk. The rest is shadowy and monstrous. There was no one in the soaking street, and in all the world there was no one I dared tell. I walked aimlessly south past College Hill and the Athenaeum, down Hopkins Street, and over the bridge to the business section where tall buildings seemed to guard me as the modern material things guard the world from ancient and unwholesome wonder. Then gray dawn unfolded wetly from the east, silhouetting the archaic hill and its venerable steeples, and beckoning me to the place where my terrible work was still unfinished. And in the end I went, wet, hatless, and dazed in the morning light, and entered that awful door in Benefit Street which I had left ajar, and which still swung cryptically in full sight of the early householders to whom I dared not speak. The grease was gone, for the moldy floor was porous, and in front of the fireplace was no vestige of the giant doubled-up form and nitre. I looked at the cot, the chairs, the instruments, my neglected hat, and the yellowed straw hat of my uncle. Dazedness was uppermost, and I could scarcely recall what was dream and what was reality. Then thought trickled back, and I knew that I had witnessed things more horrible than I had dreamed. Sitting down, I tried to conjecture as nearly as sanity would let me just what had happened, and how I might end the horror, if indeed it had been real. Matter it seemed not to be, nor ether, nor anything else conceivable by mortal mind. What, then, but some exotic emanation, some vampirish vapor such as Exeter rustics tell of as lurking over certain churchyards? This, I felt, was the clue, and again I looked at the floor before the fireplace where the mold and nitre had taken strange forms. In ten minutes my mind was made up, and taking my hat I set out for home, where I bathed, ate, and gave by telephone an order for a pickaxe, a spade, a military gas mask, and six carboys of sulfuric acid, all to be delivered the next morning at the cellar door of the shunned house in Benefit Street. After that I tried to sleep, and failing, passed the hours in reading and in the composition of inane verses to counteract my mood. At eleven a.m. the next day I commenced digging. It was sunny weather, and I was glad of that. I was still alone, for as much as I feared the unknown horror I sought, there was more fear in the thought of telling anybody. Later I told Harris, only through sheer necessity, and because he had heard odd tales from old people which disposed him ever so little toward belief. As I turned up the stinking black earth in front of the fireplace, my spade causing a viscous yellow ichor to ooze from the white fungi which it severed, I trembled at the dubious thoughts of what I might uncover. Some secrets of inner earth are not good for mankind, and this seemed to me one of them. My hand shook perceptibly, but still I delved, after a while standing in the large hole I had made. With the deepening of the hole, which was about six feet square, the evil smell increased, and I lost all doubt of my imminent contact with the hellish thing whose emanations had cursed the house for over a century and a half. I wondered what it would look like, what its form and substance would be, and how big it might have waxed through long ages of life-sucking. At length I climbed out of the hole and dispersed the heaped-up dirt, then arranging the great carboys of acid around and near two sides, so that when necessary I might empty them all down the aperture in quick succession. After that I dumped earth only along the other two sides, working more slowly and donning my gas mask as the smell grew. I was nearly unnerved at my proximity to a nameless thing at the bottom of a pit. Suddenly my spade struck something softer than earth. I shuddered and made a motion as if to climb out of the hole which was now as deep as my neck. Then courage returned, and I scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch I had provided. The surface I uncovered was fishy and glassy, a kind of semi-putrid congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. I scraped further and saw that it had form. There was a rift where a part of the substance was folded over. 
The exposed area was huge and roughly cylindrical, like a mammoth, soft, blue-eyed stovepipe doubled in two, its largest part some two feet in diameter. Still more I scraped, and then abruptly I leaped out of the hole and away from the filthy thing, frantically unstopping and tilting the heavy carboys and precipitating their corrosive contents one after another down that charnel gulf and upon the unthinkable abnormality whose tightened elbow I had seen. The blinding maelstrom of greenish-yellow vapor which surged tempestuously up from that hole as the floods of acid descended will never leave my memory. All along the hill people tell of the yellow day, when virulent and horrible fumes arose from the factory waste dumped in the Providence River, but I know how mistaken they are as to the source. They tell, too, of the hideous roar which at the same time came from some disordered water pipe or gas main underground, but again I could correct them if I dared. It was unspeakably shocking, and I do not see how I lived through it. I did faint after emptying the fourth carboy, which I had to handle after the fumes had begun to penetrate my mask. But when I recovered, I saw that the hold was emitting no fresh vapors. The two remaining carboys I emptied down without particular result, and after a time I felt it safe to shovel the earth back into the pit. It was twilight before I was done, but fear had gone out of the place. The dampness was less fetid and all the strange fungi had withered to a kind of harmless grayish powder which blew ash-like along the floor. One of Earth's nethermost terrors had perished forever, and if there be a hell, it had received at last the demon soul of an unhallowed thing. And as I patted down the last spadeful of mold, I shed the first of the many tears with which I have paid unaffected tribute to my beloved uncle's memory. The next spring no more pale grass and strange weeds came up in the shunned house's terraced garden, and shortly afterward Carrington Harris rented the place. It is still spectral, but its strangeness fascinates me, and I shall find, mixed with my relief, a queer regret when it is torn down to make way for a tawdry shop or vulgar apartment building. The barren old trees in the yard have begun to bear small, sweet apples, and last year the birds nested in their gnarled boughs. The Call of Thulu Found among the papers of the late Francis Wayland Thurston of Boston Of such great powers or beings there may be conceivably a survival a survival of a hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested perhaps in the shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity, forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods, monsters, mythical beings of all sorts and kinds. Algernon Blackwood 1. The Horror in Clay The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by a bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden eons which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things, in this case an old newspaper item and the notes of a dead professor. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out, Certainly, if I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link in so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926-27 to 27, with the death of my granduncle, George Gamel Angel, Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages in Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. 
Professor Angel was widely known as an authority on ancient inscriptions and had frequently been resorted to by the heads of prominent museums, so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat, falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled by a nautical-looking negro who had come from one of the queer dark courts on the precipitous hillside which formed a shortcut from the waterfront to the deceased's home in Williams Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded, after perplexed debate, that some obscure lesion of the heart, induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man, was responsible for the end. At the time I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but latterly I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder. As my granduncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness, and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will be later published by the American Archaeological Society, but there was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling, and which I felt much averse from showing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor carried always in his pocket. Then, indeed, I succeeded in opening it, but when I did so seemed only to be confronted by a greater and more closely locked barrier. For what could be the meaning of the queer clay bas-relief and the disjointed jottings, ramblings, and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle in his latter years become credulous of the most superficial impostures? I resolved to search out the eccentric sculptor responsible for this apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The bas-relief was a rough rectangle less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing. And writing of some kind the bulk of these designs seemed certainly to be. Though my memory, despite much familiarity with the papers and collections of my uncle, failed in any way to identify this particular species, or even to hint at its remotest affiliations. Above these apparent hieroglyphics was a figure of evidently pictorial intent, though its impressionistic execution forbade a very clear idea of its nature. It seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole which made it most shockingly frightful. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. The writing accompanying this oddity was, aside from a stack of press cuttings, in Professor Angel's most recent hand, and made no pretense to literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed, Thulu cult, and characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. The manuscript was divided into two sections, the first of which was headed 1925, Dream and Dream Work of H. A. Wilcox, 7 Thomas Street, Providence, Rhode Island, and the second, Narrative of Inspector John R. Legrasse, 121 Bienville Street, New Orleans, Louisiana. At 1908 AAS meeting, notes on same, and Professor Webb's account. The other manuscript papers were all brief notes, some of them accounts of the queer dreams of different persons, some of them citations from theosophical books and magazines, notably W. Scott Eliot's Atlantis and the Lost Lemuria, and the rest comments on long-surviving secret societies and hidden cults with references to passages in such mythological and anthropological source books as Fraser's Golden Bough and Miss Murray's Witch Cult in Western Europe. The cuttings largely alluded to outre mental illnesses and outbreaks of group folly or mania in the spring of 1925. The first half of the principal manuscript told a very peculiar tale. 
It appears that on March 1, 1925, a thin, dark young man of neurotic and excited aspect had called upon Professor Angel, bearing the singular clay bas-relief, which was then exceedingly damp and fresh. His card bore the name of Henry Anthony Wilcox, and my uncle had recognized him as the youngest son of an excellent family slightly known to him, who had latterly been studying sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design and living alone at the Fleur de Lis building near that institution. Wilcox was a precocious youth of known genius but great eccentricity, and had from childhood excited attention through the strange stories and odd dreams he was in the habit of relating. He called himself psychically hypersensitive, but the staid folk of the ancient commercial city dismissed him as merely queer. Never mingling much with his kind, he had dropped gradually from social visibility and was now known only to a small group of esthetes from other towns. Even the Providence Art Club, anxious to preserve its conservatism, had found him quite hopeless. On the occasion of the visit, ran the professor's manuscript, the sculptor abruptly asked for the benefit of his host's archaeological knowledge in identifying the hieroglyphics on the bas-relief. He spoke in a dreamy, stilted manner which suggested pose and alienated sympathy, and my uncle showed some sharpness in replying, for the conspicuous freshness of the tablet implied kinship with anything but archaeology. Young Wilcox's rejoinder, which impressed my uncle enough to make him recall and record it verbatim, was of a fantastically poetic cast, which must have typified his whole conversation, and which I have since found highly characteristic of him. He said, It is new indeed, for I made it last night in a dream of strange cities, and dreams are older than brooding Tyre, or the contemplative Sphinx, or garden-girdled Babylon. It was then that he began that rambling tale which suddenly played upon a sleeping memory and won the fevered interest of my uncle. There had been a slight earthquake tremor the night before, the most considerable felt in New England for some years, and Wilcox's imagination had been keenly affected. Upon retiring, he had had an unprecedented dream of great cyclopean cities, of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths, all dripping with green ooze and sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics had covered the walls and pillars, and from some undetermined point below had come a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation which only fancy would transmute into sound, but which he attempted to render by the almost unpronounceable jumble of letters, Thulu Fatagan. This verbal jumble was the key to the recollection which excited and disturbed Professor Angel. He questioned the sculptor with scientific minuteness and studied with almost frantic intensity the bas-relief on which the youth had found himself working, chilled and clad only in his nightclothes, when waking had stolen bewilderingly over him. My uncle blamed his old age, Wilcox afterward said, for his slowness in recognizing both hieroglyphics and pictorial design. Many of his questions seemed highly out of place to his visitor, especially those which tried to connect the latter with strange cults or societies, and Wilcox could not understand the repeated promises of silence which he was offered in exchange for an admission of membership in some widespread mystical or paganly religious body. When Professor Angel became convinced that the sculptor was indeed ignorant of any cult or system of cryptic lore, he besieged his visitor with demands for future reports of dreams. This bore regular fruit, for after the first interview the manuscript records daily calls of the young man, during which he related startling fragments of nocturnal imagery whose burden was always some terrible cyclopean vista of dark and dripping stone, with a subterrene voice or intelligence shouting monotonously in enigmatical sense impacts, uninscribable save as gibberish. The two sounds most frequently repeated are those rendered by the letters Thulu and Rilje. On March 23rd, the manuscript continued, Wilcox failed to appear, and inquiries at his quarters revealed that he had been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and taken to the home of his family in Waterman Street. He had cried out in the night, arousing several other artists in the building, and had manifested since then only alternations of unconsciousness and delirium. My uncle had once telephoned the family, and from that time forward kept close watch of the case calling often at the Thayer Street office of Dr. Toby, whom he learned to be in charge. The youth's febrile mind, apparently, was dwelling on strange things, and the doctor shuddered now and then as he spoke of them. 
They included not only a repetition of what he had formerly dreamed, but touched wildly on a gigantic thing miles high which walked or lumbered about. He had no time fully described this object, but occasional frantic words, as repeated by Dr. Toby, convinced the professor that it must be identical with the nameless monstrosity he had sought to depict in his dream sculpture. Reference to this object, the doctor added, was invariably a prelude to the young man's subsidence into lethargy. His temperature, oddly enough, was not greatly above normal, but his whole condition was otherwise such as to suggest true fever rather than mental disorder. On April 2nd, at about 3 p.m., every trace of Wilcox's malady suddenly ceased. He sat upright in bed, astonished to find himself at home, and completely ignorant of what had happened in dream or reality since the night of March 22nd. Pronounced well by his physician, he returned to his quarters in three days. But to Professor Angel, he was of no further assistance. All traces of strange dreaming had vanished with his recovery, and my uncle kept no record of his night thoughts after a week of pointless and irrelevant accounts of thoroughly usual visions. Here the first part of the manuscript ended, but references to certain of the scattered notes gave me much material for thought, so much, in fact, that only the ingrained skepticism then forming my philosophy can account for my continued distrust of the artist. The notes in question were those descriptive of the dreams of various persons covering the same period as that in which young Wilcox had had his strange visitations. My uncle, it seems, had quickly instituted a prodigiously far-flung body of inquiries amongst nearly all the friends whom he could question without impertinence, asking for nightly reports of their dreams and the dates of any notable visions for some time past. The reception of his request seems to have been varied, but he must, at the very least, have received more responses than any ordinary man could have handled without a secretary. This original correspondence was not preserved, but his notes formed a thorough and really significant digest. Average people in society and business, New England's traditional salt of the earth, gave an almost completely negative result, though scattered cases of uneasy but formless nocturnal impressions appeared here and there, always between March 23rd and April 2nd, the period of young Wilcox's delirium. Scientific men were little more affected, though four cases of vague descriptions suggest fugitive glimpses of strange landscapes, and in one case there is mentioned a dread of something abnormal. It was from the artists and poets that the pertinent answers came, and I know that panic would have broken loose had they been able to compare notes. As it was lacking their original letters, I half suspected the compiler of having asked leading questions, or of having edited the correspondence in corroboration of what he had latently resolved to see. That is why I continued to feel that Wilcox, somehow cognizant of the old data which my uncle had possessed, had been imposing on the veteran scientist. These responses from esthetes told a disturbing tale. From February 28th to April 2nd, a large proportion of them had dreamed very bizarre things, the intensity of the dreams being immeasurably the stronger during the period of the sculptor's delirium. Over a fourth of those who reported anything reported scenes and half-sounds not unlike those which Wilcox had described, and some of the dreamers confessed acute fear of the gigantic nameless thing visible toward the last. One case, which the note describes with emphasis, was very sad. The subject, a widely known architect with leanings toward theosophy and occultism, went violently insane on the date of young Wilcox's seizure and expired several months later after incessant screamings to be saved from some escaped denizen of hell. Had my uncle referred to these cases by name instead of merely by number, I should have attempted some corroboration and personal investigation, but as it was, I succeeded in tracing down only a few. All of these, however, bore out the notes in full. I have often wondered if all the objects of the professor's questioning felt as puzzled as did this fraction. It is well that no explanation shall ever reach them. The press cuttings, as I have intimated, touched on cases of panic, mania, and eccentricity during the given period. Professor Angel must have employed a cutting bureau, for the number of extracts was tremendous and the sources scattered throughout the globe. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London, where a lone sleeper had leaped from a window after a shocking cry. Here, likewise, a rambling letter to the editor of a paper in South America, where a fanatic deduces a dire future from visions he has seen. A dispatch from California describes a theosophist colony as donning white robes en masse for some glorious fulfillment which never arrives, 
whilst items from India speak guardedly of serious native unrest toward the end of March. Voodoo orgies multiply in Haiti, and African outposts report ominous mutterings. American officers in the Philippines find certain tribes bothersome about this time, and New York policemen are mobbed by hysterical Levantines on the night of March 22nd to 23rd. The west of Ireland, too, is full of wild rumor and legendary, and a fantastic painter named Ardois Bonneau hangs a blasphemous dream landscape in the Paris Spring Salon of 1926. And so numerous are the recorded troubles in insane asylums that only a miracle can have stopped the medical fraternity from noting strange parallelisms and drawing mystified conclusions. A weird bunch of cuttings, all told, and I can at this date scarcely envisage the callous rationalism with which I set them aside. But I was then convinced that young Wilcox had known of the older matters mentioned by the professor. 2. The Tale of Inspector Legrasse The older matters which had made the sculptor's dream and bas-relief so significant to my uncle formed the subject of the second half of his long manuscript. Once before, it appears, Professor Angel had seen the hellish outlines of the nameless monstrosity, puzzled over the unknown hieroglyphics, and heard the ominous syllables which can be rendered only as Thulu and all this in so stirring and horrible a connection that it is small wonder he pursued young Wilcox with queries and demands for data. The earlier experience had come in 1908, seventeen years before, when the American Archaeological Society held its annual meeting in St. Louis. Professor Angel, as befitted one of his authority and attainments, had had a prominent part in all the deliberations, and was one of the first to be approached by the several outsiders who took advantage of the convocation to offer questions for correct answering and problems for expert solution. The chief of these outsiders, and in a short time the focus of interest for the entire meeting, was a commonplace-looking middle-aged man who had traveled all the way from New Orleans for certain special information unobtainable from any local source. His name was John Raymond Legrasse, and he was by profession an inspector of police. With him he bore the subject of his visit, a grotesque, repulsive, and apparently very ancient stone statuette whose origin he was at a loss to determine. It must not be fancied that Inspector Legrasse had the least interest in archaeology. On the contrary, his wish for enlightenment was prompted by purely professional considerations. The statuette, idol, fetish, or whatever it was, had been captured some months before in the wooded swamps south of New Orleans during a raid on a supposed voodoo meeting, and so singular and hideous were the rites connected with it that the police could not but realize that they had stumbled on a dark cult totally unknown to them, and infinitely more diabolic than even the blackest of the African voodoo circles. Of its origin, apart from the erratic and unbelievable tales extorted from the captured members, absolutely nothing was to be discovered. Hence the anxiety of the police for any antiquarian lore which might help them to place the frightful symbol, and through it track down the cult to its fountainhead. Inspector Legrasse was scarcely prepared for the sensation which his offering created. One sight of the thing had been enough to throw the assembled men of science into a state of tense excitement, and they lost no time in crowding around him to gaze at the diminutive figure whose utter strangeness and air of genuinely abysmal antiquity hinted so potently at unopened and archaic vistas. No recognized school of sculpture had animated this terrible object, yet centuries and even thousands of years seemed recorded in its dim and greenish surface of unplaceable stone. The figure, which was finally passed slowly from man to man for close and careful study, was between seven and eight inches in height, and of exquisitely artistic workmanship. It represented a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. This thing, which seemed instinct with a fearsome and unnatural malignancy, was of a somewhat bloated corpulence and squatted evilly on a rectangular block or pedestal covered with undecipherable characters. The tips of the wings touched the back edge of the block, the seat occupied the center, whilst the long curved claws of the doubled-up crouching hind legs gripped the front edge and extended a quarter of the way down toward the bottom of the pedestal. 
The cephalopod head was bent forward so that the ends of the facial feelers brushed the backs of huge forepaws which clasped the croucher's elevated knees. The aspect of the whole was abnormally lifelike and the more subtly fearful because its source was so totally unknown. Its vast, awesome, and incalculable age was unmistakable, yet not one link did it show with any known type of art belonging to civilization's youth, or indeed to any other time. Totally separate and apart, its very material was a mystery, for the soapy, greenish-black stone with its golden or iridescent flecks and striations resembled nothing familiar to geology or mineralogy. The characters along the base were equally baffling, and no member present, despite a representation of half the world's expert learning in this field, could form the least notion of even the remotest linguistic kinship. They, like the subject and material, belonged to something horribly remote and distinct from mankind as we know it, something frightfully suggestive of old and unhallowed cycles of life in which our world and our conceptions have no part. And yet, as the members severally shook their heads and confessed defeat at the inspector's problem, there was one man in that gathering who suspected a touch of bizarre familiarity in the monstrous shape and writing, and who presently told with some diffidence of the odd trifle he knew. This person was the late William Channing Webb, professor of anthropology in Princeton University and an explorer of no slight note. Professor Webb had been engaged, forty-eight years before, in a tour of Greenland and Iceland in search of some runic inscriptions which he failed to unearth, and whilst high up on the West Greenland coast had encountered a singular tribe or cult of degenerate Eskimos whose religion, a curious form of devil worship, chilled him with its deliberate bloodthirstiness and repulsiveness. It was a faith of which other Eskimos knew little, and which they mentioned only with shudders, saying that it had come down from horribly ancient eons before ever the world was made. Besides nameless rites and human sacrifices, there were certain queer hereditary rituals addressed to a supreme elder devil or Tornasuk, and of this Professor Webb had taken a careful phonetic copy from an aged Angicoc, or wizard priest, expressing the sounds in Roman letters as best he knew how. But just now of prime significance was the fetish which this cult had cherished, and around which they danced when the aurora leaped high over the ice cliffs. It was, the professor stated, a very crude bas-relief of stone, comprising a hideous picture and some cryptic writing and so far as he could tell, it was a rough parallel in all essential features of the bestial thing now lying before the meeting. This data, received with suspense and astonishment by the assembled members, proved doubly exciting to Inspector Legrasse, and he began at once to ply his informant with questions. Having noted and copied an oral ritual among the swamp cult worshippers his men had arrested, he besought the professor to remember as best he might the syllables taken down amongst the diabolist Eskimos. There then followed an exhaustive comparison of details and a moment of really awed silence when both detective and scientist agreed on the virtual identity of the phrase common to two hellish rituals so many worlds of distance apart. What, in substance, both the Eskimo wizards and the Louisiana swamp priests had chanted to their kindred idols was something very like this. The word divisions being guessed at from traditional breaks in the phrase as chanted aloud. Fengui, Mglonaf, Thulu, Rilye, Ga, Nagel, Ftagen. Legrasse had one point in advance of Professor Webb, for several among his mongrel prisoners had repeated to him what older celebrants had told them the words meant. This text as given ran something like this. In his house at Rilje, dead Thulu waits dreaming. And now, in response to a general and urgent demand, Inspector Legrasse related as fully as possible his experience with the swamp worshippers, telling a story to which I could see my uncle attached profound significance. It savored of the wildest dreams of myth-maker and theosophist, and disclosed an astonishing degree of cosmic imagination among such half-castes and pariahs as might be expected to possess it. On November 1, 1907, there had come to the New Orleans police a frantic summons from the swamp and lagoon country to the south. The squatters there, mostly primitive but good-natured descendants of Lafitte's men, were in the grip of stark terror from an unknown thing which had stolen upon them in the night. 
It was voodoo, apparently, but voodoo of a more terrible sort than they had ever known, and some of their women and children had disappeared since the malevolent tom-tom had begun its incessant beating far within the black-haunted woods where no dweller ventured. There were insane shouts and harrowing screams, soul-chilling chants and dancing devil flames, and the frightened messenger added the people could stand it no more. So a body of twenty police, filling two carriages and an automobile, had set out in the late afternoon with the shivering squatter as a guide. At the end of the passable road they alighted, and for miles splashed on in silence through the terrible cypress woods where day never came. Ugly roots and malignant hanging nooses of Spanish moss beset them, and now and then a pile of dank stones or fragment of a rotting wall intensified by its hint of morbid habitation, a depression which every malformed tree and every fungus islet combined to create. At length the squatter settlement, a miserable huddle of huts, hove in sight, and hysterical dwellers ran out to cluster around the group of bobbing lanterns. The muffled beat of tom-toms was now faintly audible far, far ahead, and a curdling shriek came at infrequent intervals when the wind shifted. A reddish glare, too, seemed to filter through the pale undergrowth beyond endless avenues of forest night. Reluctant even to be left alone again, each one of the cowed squatters refused point-blank to advance another inch toward the scene of unholy worship, so Inspector Legrasse and his nineteen colleagues plunged on unguided into black arcades of horror that none of them had ever trod before. The region now entered by the police was one of traditionally evil repute, substantially unknown and untraversed by white men. There were legends of a hidden lake unglimpsed by mortal sight in which dwelt a huge, formless, white polypus thing with luminous eyes, and squatters whispered that bat-winged devils flew up out of caverns in inner earth to worship it at midnight. They said it had been there before D'Iberville, before La Salle, before the Indians, and before even the wholesome beasts and birds of the woods. It was nightmare itself, and to see it was to die. But it made men dream, and so they knew enough to keep away. The present voodoo orgy was, indeed, on the merest fringe of this abhorred area, but that location was bad enough. Hence, perhaps, the very place of the worship had terrified the squatters more than the shocking sounds and incidents. Only poetry or madness could do justice to the noises heard by Legrasse's men as they plowed on through the black morass toward the red glare and the muffled tom-toms. There are vocal qualities peculiar to men and vocal qualities peculiar to beasts, and it is terrible to hear the one when the source should yield the other. Animal fury and orgiastic license here whipped themselves to demoniac heights by howls and squawking ecstasies that tore and reverberated through those nighted woods like pestilential tempests from the gulfs of hell. Now and then the less organized ululation would cease, and from what seemed a well-drilled chorus of hoarse voices would rise and sing-song chant that hideous phrase or ritual, Fengui, Mglonaf, Thulu, Rilye, Ga, Nagel, Ftagen. Then the men, having reached a spot where the trees were thinner, came suddenly in sight of the spectacle itself. Four of them reeled, one fainted, and two were shaken into a frantic cry which the mad cacophony of the orgy fortunately deadened. Legrasse dashed swamp water on the face of the fainting man, and all stood trembling and nearly hypnotized with horror. In a natural glade of the swamp stood a grassy island of perhaps an acre's extent, clear of trees and tolerably dry. On this now leaped and twisted a more indescribable horde of human abnormality than any but a seam or an angarola could paint. Void of clothing, this hybrid spawn were braying, bellowing, and writhing about a monstrous ring-shaped bonfire, in the center of which, revealed by occasional rifts in the curtain of flame, stood a great granite monolith some eight feet in height, on top of which, incongruous with its diminutiveness, rested the noxious carven statuette. From a wide circle of ten scaffolds set up at regular intervals with the flame-girt monolith as a center, hung head downward the oddly marred bodies of the helpless squatters who had disappeared. It was inside this circle that the ring of worshippers jumped and roared, the general direction of the mass motion being from left to right, in endless bacchanal between the ring of bodies and the ring of fire.
It may have been only imagination, and it may have been only echoes which induced one of the men, an excitable Spaniard, to fancy he heard antiphonal responses to the ritual from some far and unillumined spot deeper within the wood of ancient legendary and horror. This man, Joseph D. Galvez, I later met and questioned, and he proved distractingly imaginative. He indeed went so far as to hint of the faint beating of great wings and of a glimpse of shining eyes and a mountainous white bulk beyond the remotest trees, but I suppose he had been hearing too much native superstition. Actually, the horrified pause of the men was of comparatively brief duration. Duty came first, and although there must have been nearly a hundred mongrel celebrants in the throng, the police relied on their firearms and plunged determinedly into the nauseous rout. For five minutes the resultant din and chaos were beyond description. Wild blows were struck, shots were fired, and escapes were made, but in the end Legrasse was able to count some forty-seven sullen prisoners whom he forced to dress in haste and fall into line between two rows of policemen. Five of the worshippers lay dead, and two severely wounded ones were carried away on improvised stretchers by their fellow prisoners. The image on the monolith, of course, was carefully removed and carried back by Legrasse. Examined at headquarters after a trip of intense strain and weariness, the prisoners all proved to be men of a very low, mixed-blooded, and mentally aberrant type. Most were seamen, and a sprinkling of Negroes and mulattoes, largely West Indians or Brava Portuguese from the Cape Verde Islands, gave a coloring of voodooism to the heterogeneous cult. But before many questions were asked, it became manifest that something far deeper and older than Negro fetishism was involved. Degraded and ignorant as they were, the creatures held with surprising consistency to the central idea of their loathsome faith. They worshipped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men, and who came to the young world out of the sky. Those old ones were gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies had told their secrets and dreams to the first men, who formed a cult which had never died. This was that cult, and the prisoners said it had always existed and always would exist, hidden in distant wastes and dark places all over the world until the time when the great priest Thulu, from his dark house in the mighty city of Rilia, under the waters, should rise and bring the earth again beneath his sway. Some day he would call when the stars were ready, and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. Meanwhile no more must be told. It was a secret which even torture could not extract. Mankind was not absolutely alone among the conscious things of earth, for shapes came out of the dark to visit the faithful few. But these were not the great old ones. No man had ever seen the old ones. The carven idol was great Thulu, but none might say whether or not the others were precisely like him. No one could read the old writing now, but things were told by word of mouth. The chanted ritual was not the secret, that was never spoken aloud, only whispered. The chant meant only this. In his house at Rilje, dead Thulu waits dreaming. Only two of the prisoners were found sane enough to be hanged, and the rest were committed to various institutions. All denied a part in the ritual murders, and averred that the killing had been done by black-winged ones, which had come to them from their immemorial meeting place in the haunted wood. But of those mysterious allies, no coherent account could ever be gained. What the police did extract came mainly from an immensely aged mestizo named Castro, who claimed to have sailed to strange ports and talked with undying leaders of the cult in the mountains of China. Old Castro remembered bits of hideous legend that paled the speculations of theosophists and made man and the world seem recent and transient indeed. There had been eons when other things ruled on the earth, and they had had great cities. Remains of them, he said the deathless Chinamen had told him, were still to be found as Cyclopean stones on islands in the Pacific. They all died vast epochs of time before men came, but there were arts which could revive them when the stars had come round again to the right positions in the cycle of eternity. They had indeed come themselves from the stars and brought their images with them. These great old ones, Castro continued, were not composed altogether of flesh and blood. They had shape, for did not this star-fashioned image prove it? But that shape was not made of matter. When the stars were right, they could plunge from world to world through the sky, but when the stars were wrong, they could not live. 
but although they no longer lived, they would never really die. They all lay in stone houses in their great city of Rilia, preserved by the spells of mighty Thulu for a glorious resurrection when the stars and the earth might once more be ready for them. But at that time some force from outside must serve to liberate their bodies. The spells that preserved them intact likewise prevented them from making an initial move, and they could only lie awake in the dark and think whilst uncounted millions of years rolled by. They knew all that was occurring in the universe, but their mode of speech was transmitted thought. Even now they talked in their tombs. When, after infinities of chaos, the first men came, the great old ones spoke to the sensitive among them by molding their dreams, for only thus could their language reach the fleshly minds of mammals. Then, whispered Castro, those first men formed the cult around small idols which the great ones showed them. Idols brought in dim eras from dark stars. That cult would never die till the stars came right again, and the secret priests would take great Thulu from his tomb to revive his subjects and resume his rule of earth. The time would be easy to know, for then mankind would have become as the great old ones, free and wild and beyond good and evil, with laws and morals thrown aside, and all men shouting and killing and reveling in joy. Then the liberated old ones would teach them new ways to shout and kill and revel and enjoy themselves, and all the earth would flame with a holocaust of ecstasy and freedom. Meanwhile, the cult, by appropriate rites, must keep alive the memory of those ancient ways and shadow forth the prophecy of their return. In the elder time, chosen men had talked with the entombed old ones in dreams, but then something had happened. The great stone city, Rilia, with its monoliths and sepulchres, had sunk beneath the waves, and the deep waters, full of the one primal mystery through which not even thought can pass, had cut off the spectral intercourse. But memory never died, and high priests said that the city would rise again when the stars were right. Then came out of the earth the black spirits of earth, moldy and shadowy, and full of dim rumors picked up in caverns beneath forgotten sea-bottoms but of them old Castro dared not speak much. He cut himself off hurriedly, and no amount of persuasion or subtlety could elicit more in this direction. The size of the old ones, too, he curiously declined to mention. Of the cult, he said that he thought the center lay amid the pathless deserts of Arabia, where Iram, the city of pillars, dreams hidden and untouched. It was not allied to the European witch cult, and was virtually unknown beyond its members. No book had ever really hinted of it, though the deathless Chinaman said that there were double meanings in the Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al-Hazred, which the initiated might read as they chose, especially the much-discussed couplet, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Legrasse, deeply impressed and not a little bewildered, had inquired in vain concerning the historic affiliations of the cult. Castro apparently had told the truth when he said that it was wholly secret. The authorities at Tulane University could shed no light upon either cult or image, and now the detective had come to the highest authorities in the country and met with no more than the Greenland tale of Professor Webb. The feverish interest aroused at the meeting by Legrasse's tale, corroborated as it was by the statuette, is echoed in the subsequent correspondence of those who attended, although scant mention occurs in the formal publications of the society. Caution is the first care of those accustomed to face occasional charlatanry and imposture. Legrasse for some time lent the image to Professor Webb, but at the latter's death it was returned to him and remains in his possession, where I viewed it not long ago. It is truly a terrible thing, and unmistakably akin to the dream sculpture of young Wilcox. That my uncle was excited by the tale of the sculpture I did not wonder. For what thoughts must arise upon hearing, after a knowledge of what Legrasse had learned of the cult, of a sensitive young man who had dreamed not only the figure and exact hieroglyphics of the swamp-found image and the Greenland devil tablet, but had come in his dreams upon at least three of the precise words of the formula uttered alike by Eskimo diabolists and mongrel Louisianans. Professor Angel's instant start on an investigation of the utmost thoroughness was eminently natural. 
though privately I suspected young Wilcox of having heard of the cult in some indirect way and of having invented a series of dreams to heighten and continue the mystery at my uncle's expense. The dream narratives and cuttings collected by the professor were, of course, strong corroboration, but the rationalism of my mind and the extravagance of the whole subject led me to adopt what I thought the most sensible conclusions. So, after thoroughly studying the manuscript again and correlating the theosophical and anthropological notes with the cult narrative of Legrasse, I made a trip to Providence to see the sculptor and give him the rebuke I thought proper for so boldly imposing upon a learned and aged man. Wilcox still lived alone in the fleur-de-lis building in Thomas Street, a hideous Victorian imitation of seventeenth-century Breton architecture which flaunts its stuccoed front amidst the lovely colonial houses on the ancient hill and under the very shadow of the finest Georgian steeple in America. I found him at work in his rooms, and at once conceded from the specimens scattered about that his genius is indeed profound and authentic. He will, I believe, sometime be heard from as one of the great decadents, for he has crystallized in clay and will one day mirror in marble those nightmares and fantasies which Arthur Machen evokes in prose and Clark Ashton Smith makes visible in verse and in painting. Dark, frail, and somewhat unkempt in aspect, he turned languidly at my knock and asked me my business without rising. When I told him who I was, he displayed some interest for my uncle had excited his curiosity in probing his strange dreams, yet had never explained the reason for the study. I did not enlarge his knowledge in this regard, but sought with some subtlety to draw him out. In a short time I became convinced of his absolute sincerity, for he spoke of the dreams in a manner none could mistake. They and their subconscious residuum had influenced his art profoundly, and he showed me a morbid statue whose contours almost made me shake with the potency of its black suggestion. He could not recall having seen the original of this thing, except in his own dream bas-relief, but the outlines had formed themselves insensibly under his hands. It was no doubt the giant shape he had raved of in delirium. That he really knew nothing of the hidden cult, save from what my uncle's relentless catechism had let fall, he soon made clear, and again I strove to think of some way in which he could possibly have received the weird impressions. He talked of his dreams in a strangely poetic fashion making me see with terrible vividness the damp cyclopean city of slimy green stone whose geometry he oddly said was all wrong and here with frightened expectancy the ceaseless half-mental calling from underground thulu fatagan thulu fatagan these words had formed part of that dread ritual which told of dead thulu's dream vigil in his stone vault at rilje and i felt deeply moved despite my rational beliefs Wilcox, I was sure, had heard of the cult in some casual way, and had soon forgotten it amidst the mass of his equally weird reading and imagining. Later, by virtue of its sheer impressiveness, it had found subconscious expression in dreams, in the bas-relief and in the terrible statue I now beheld, so that his imposture upon my uncle had been a very innocent one. The youth was of a type, at once slightly affected and slightly ill-mannered, which I could never like, but I was willing enough now to admit both his genius and his honesty. I took leave of him amicably, and wish him all the success his talent promises. The matter of the cult still remained to fascinate me, and at times I had visions of personal fame from researches into its origin and connections. I visited New Orleans, talked with Legrasse and others of that old-time raiding party, saw the frightful image, and even questioned such of the mongrel prisoners as still survived. Old Castro, unfortunately, had been dead for some years. What I now heard so graphically at first hand, though it was really no more than a detailed confirmation of what my uncle had written, excited me afresh, for I felt sure that I was on the track of a very real, very secret, and very ancient religion whose discovery would make me an anthropologist of note. My attitude was still one of absolute materialism, as I wish it still were, and I discounted with almost inexplicable perversity the coincidence of the dream notes and odd cuttings collected by Professor Angel. One thing I began to suspect, and which I now fear I know, is that my uncle's death was far from natural. He fell on a narrow hill street leading up from an ancient waterfront swarming with foreign mongrels after a careless push from a negro sailor. I did not forget the mixed blood and marine pursuits of the cult members in Louisiana, and would not be surprised to learn of secret methods and poison needles as ruthless and as anciently known as the cryptic rites and beliefs. 
Lagrasse and his men, it is true, have been let alone. But in Norway a certain seaman who saw things is dead. Might not the deeper inquiries of my uncle after encountering the sculptor's data have come to sinister ears? I think Professor Angel died because he knew too much, or because he was likely to learn too much. Whether I shall go as he did remains to be seen, for I have learned much now. 3. The Madness from the Sea If heaven ever wishes to grant me a boon, it will be a total effacing of the results of a mere chance which fixed my eyes on a certain stray piece of shelf paper. It was nothing on which I would naturally have stumbled in the course of my daily round, for it was an old number of an Australian journal, the Sydney Bulletin, for April 18, 1925. It had escaped even the cutting bureau, which had at the time of its issuance been avidly collecting material for my uncle's research. I had largely given over my inquiries into what Professor Angel called the Thulu cult, and was visiting a learned friend in Patterson, New Jersey, the curator of a local museum and a mineralogist of note. Examining one day the reserve specimens roughly set on the storage shelves in a rear room of the museum, my eye was caught by an odd picture in one of the old papers spread beneath the stones. It was the Sydney Bulletin I have mentioned, for my friend has wide affiliations in all conceivable foreign parts, and the picture was a half-tone cut of a hideous stone image almost identical with that which Lagrasse had found in the swamp. Eagerly clearing the sheet of its precious contents, I scanned the item in detail and was disappointed to find it of only moderate length. What it suggested, however, was of portentous significance to my flagging quest, and I carefully tore it out for immediate action. It read as follows. Mystery derelict found at sea. Vigilant arrives with helpless armed New Zealand yacht in tow. One survivor and dead man found aboard. Tale of desperate battle and deaths at sea. Rescued seaman refuses particulars of strange experience. Odd idol found in his possession. Inquiry to follow. The Morrison Company's freighter Vigilant, bound from Valparaiso, arrived this morning at its wharf in Darling Harbor, having in tow the battled and disabled but heavily armed steam yacht Alert of Dunedin, New Zealand, which was sighted April 12th in south latitude 34 degrees 21 minutes, west longitude 152 degrees 17 minutes, with one living and one dead man aboard. The vigilant left Valparaiso March 25th, and on April 2nd was driven considerably south of her course by exceptionally heavy storms and monster waves. On April 12th the derelict was sighted, and though apparently deserted, was found upon boarding to contain one survivor in a half-delirious condition and one man who had evidently been dead for more than a week. The living man was clutching a horrible stone idol of unknown origin, about a foot in height, regarding whose nature authorities at Sydney University, the Royal Society, and the Museum in College Street all profess complete bafflement, and which the survivor says he found in the cabin of the yacht in a small carved shrine of common pattern. This man, after recovering his senses, told an exceedingly strange story of piracy and slaughter. He is Gustav Johansson, a Norwegian of some intelligence, and had been second mate of the two-masted schooner Emma of Auckland, which sailed for Kayao February 20th with a complement of eleven men. The Emma, he says, was delayed and thrown widely south of her course by the great storm of March 1st, and on March 22nd, in south latitude 49 degrees 51 minutes, west longitude 128 degrees 34 minutes, encountered the alert, manned by a queer and evil-looking crew of Kanakas and half-castes. Being ordered peremptorily to turn back, Captain Collins refused, whereupon the strange crew began to fire savagely and without warning upon the schooner with a peculiarly heavy battery of brass cannon forming part of the yacht's equipment. The Emma's men showed fight, says the survivor, and though the schooner began to sink from shots beneath the waterline, they managed to heave alongside their enemy and board her, grappling with the savage crew on the yacht's deck and being forced to kill them all, the number being slightly superior because of their particularly abhorrent and desperate, though rather clumsy mode of fighting. Three of the Emma's men, including Captain Collins and First Mate Green, were killed, and the remaining eight, under Second Mate Johansson, proceeded to navigate the captured yacht, going ahead in their original direction to see if any reason for their ordering back had existed. 
The next day, it appears, they raised and landed on a small island, although none is known to exist in that part of the ocean, and six of the men somehow died ashore, though Johansen is queerly reticent about this part of his story and speaks only of their falling into a rock chasm. Later, it seems, he and one companion boarded the yacht and tried to manage her, but were beaten about by the storm of April 2nd. From that time till his rescue on the 12th, the man remembers little, and he does not even recall when William Bryden, his companion, died. Bryden's death reveals no apparent cause and was probably due to excitement or exposure. Cable advises from Dunedin report that the Alert was well known there as an island trader and bore an evil reputation along the waterfront. It was owned by a curious group of half-castes whose frequent meetings and night trips to the woods attracted no little curiosity, and it had set sail in great haste just after the storm and earth tremors of March 1st. Our Auckland correspondent gives the Emma and her crew an excellent reputation, and Johansen is described as a sober and worthy man. The Admiralty will institute an inquiry on the whole matter beginning tomorrow, at which every effort will be made to induce Johansen to speak more freely than he has done hitherto. This was all, together with the picture of the hellish image, but what a train of ideas it started in my mind. Here were new treasuries of data on the Thulu cult, and evidence that it had strange interests at sea as well as on land. What motive prompted the hybrid crew to order back the Emma as they sailed about with their hideous idol? What was the unknown island on which six of the Emma's crew had died, and about which the mate Johansen was so secretive? What had the vice-admiralty's investigation brought out, and what was known of the noxious cult in Dunedin? And most marvelous of all, what deep and more than natural linkage of dates was this which gave a malign and now undeniable significance to the various turns of events so carefully noted by my uncle? March 1st, our February 28th, according to the international dateline, the earthquake and storm had come. From Dunedin the alert and her noisome crew had darted eagerly forth as if imperiously summoned, and on the other side of the earth poets and artists had begun to dream of a strange, dank, cyclopean city, whilst a young sculptor had molded in his sleep the form of the dreaded Thulu. March 23rd the crew of the Emma landed on an unknown island and left six men dead, and on that date the dreams of sensitive men assumed a heightened vividness and darkened with dread of a giant monster's malign pursuit, whilst an architect had gone mad and a sculptor had lapsed suddenly into delirium. And what of this storm of April 2nd, the date on which all dreams of the dank city ceased and Wilcox emerged unharmed from the bondage of strange fever? What of all this? And of those hints of old Castro about the sunken, star-born old ones and their coming reign, their faithful cult, and their mastery of dreams, was I tottering on the brink of cosmic horrors beyond man's power to bear? If so, they must be horrors of the mind alone, for in some way the 2nd of April had put a stop to whatever monstrous menace had begun its siege of mankind's soul. That evening, after a day of hurried cabling and arranging, I bade my host adieu and took a train for San Francisco. In less than a month I was in Dunedin, where, however, I found that little was known of the strange cult members who had lingered in the old sea taverns. Waterfront scum was far too common for special mention, though there was vague talk about one inland trip these mongrels had made, during which faint drumming and red flame were noted on the distant hills. In Auckland I learned that Johansen had returned with yellow hair turned white after a perfunctory and inconclusive questioning at Sydney, and had thereafter sold his cottage in West Street and sailed with his wife to his old home in Oslo. Of his stirring experience he would tell his friends no more than he had told the Admiralty officials, and all they could do was to give me his Oslo address. After that I went to Sydney and talked profitlessly with seamen and members of the Vice-Admiralty Court. I saw the alert, now sold and in commercial use, at Circular Quay in Sydney Cove, but gained nothing from its non-committal bulk. The crouching image with its cuttlefish head, dragon body, scaly wings, and hieroglyphed pedestal was preserved in the museum at Hyde Park, and I studied it long and well, finding it a thing of balefully exquisite workmanship, and with the same utter mystery, terrible antiquity, and unearthly strangeness of material which I had noted in Legrasse's smaller specimen. Geologists, the curator told me, had found it a monstrous puzzle, for they vowed that the world held no rock like it. 
Then I thought with a shudder of what old Castro had told Legrasse about the primal great ones. They had come from the stars and had brought their images with them. Shaken with such a mental revolution as I had never before known, I now resolved to visit mate Johansen in Oslo. Sailing for London, I re-embarked at once for the Norwegian capital, and one autumn day landed at the trim wharves in the shadow of the Egberg. Johansen's address, I discovered, lay in the old town of King Harald Haroda, which kept alive the name of Oslo during all the centuries that the greater city masqueraded as Christiana. I made the brief trip by taxicab and knocked with palpitant heart at the door of a neat and ancient building with plastered front. A sad-faced woman in black answered my summons, and I was stung with disappointment when she told me in halting English that Gustav Johansen was no more. He had not survived his return, said his wife, for the doings at sea in 1925 had broken him. He had told her no more than he had told the public, but had left a long manuscript of technical matters, as he said, written in English, evidently in order to safeguard her from the peril of casual perusal. During a walk through a narrow lane near the Gothenburg dock, a bundle of papers falling from an attic window had knocked him down. Two Lasker sailors at once helped him to his feet, but before the ambulance could reach him, he was dead. Physicians found no adequate cause for the end and laid it to heart trouble and a weakened constitution. I now felt gnawing at my vitals that dark terror which will never leave me till I, too, am at rest, accidentally or otherwise. Persuading the widow that my connection with her husband's technical matters was sufficient to entitle me to his manuscript, I bore the document away and began to read it on the London boat. It was a simple, rambling thing, a naive sailor's effort at a post-facto diary, and strove to recall day by day that last awful voyage. I cannot attempt to transcribe it verbatim, in all its cloudiness and redundance, but I will tell its gist enough to show why the sound of the water against the vessel's sides became so unendurable to me that I stopped my ears with cotton. Johansen, thank God, did not know quite all, even though he saw the city and the thing but I shall never sleep calmly again when I think of the horrors that lurk ceaselessly behind life in time and in space, and of those unhallowed blasphemies from elder stars which dream beneath the sea, known and favored by a nightmare cult, ready and eager to loose them on the world whenever another earthquake shall heave their monstrous stone city again to the sun and air. Johansen's voyage had begun just as he told it to the vice-admiralty. The Emma, in ballast, had cleared Auckland on February 20th, and had felt the full force of that earthquake-born tempest which must have heaved up from the sea-bottom the horrors that filled men's dreams. Once more under control, the ship was making good progress when held up by the alert on March 22nd, and I could feel the mate's regret as he wrote of her bombardment and sinking. Of the swarthy cult fiends on the alert, he speaks with significant horror. There was some peculiarly abominable quality about them which made their destruction seem almost a duty, and Johansen shows ingenuous wonder at the charge of ruthlessness brought against his party during the proceedings of the court of inquiry. Then, driven ahead by curiosity in their captured yacht under Johansen's command, the men sight a great stone pillar sticking out of the sea, and in south latitude 47 degrees 9 minutes, west longitude 126 degrees 43 minutes, come upon a coastline of mingled mud, ooze, and weedy cyclopean masonry, which can be nothing less than the tangible substance of Earth's supreme terror, the nightmare corpse city of Rilia that was built in measureless eons beyond history by the vast, loathsome shapes that seeped down from the dark stars. There lay great Thulu and his hordes, hidden in green, slimy vaults, and sending out at last, after cycles incalculable, the thoughts that spread fear to the dreams of the sensitive, and called imperiously to the faithful to come on a pilgrimage of liberation and restoration. All this Johansen did not suspect, but God knows he soon saw enough. I suppose that only a single mountain top, the hideous, monolith-crowned citadel whereon Great Thulu was buried, actually emerged from the waters. When I think of the extent of all that may be brooding down there, I almost wish to kill myself forthwith. Johansen and his men were awed by the cosmic majesty of this dripping Babylon of elder demons, and must have guessed without guidance that it was nothing of this or of any sane planet. 
awe at the unbelievable size of the greenish stone blocks, at the dizzying height of the great carven monolith, and at the stupefying identity of the colossal statues and bas-reliefs with the queer image found in the shrine on the alert is poignantly visible in every line of the mate's frightened description. Without knowing what futurism is like, Johansson achieved something very close to it when he spoke of the city, for instead of describing any definite structure or building, he dwells only on broad impressions of vast angles and stone surfaces, surfaces too great to belong to anything right or proper for this earth, and impious with horrible images and hieroglyphs. I mention his talk about angles because it suggests something Wilcox had told me of his awful dreams. He has said that the geometry of the dream place he saw was abnormal, non-Euclidean, and loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from ours. Now an unlettered seaman felt the same thing whilst gazing at the terrible reality. Johansen and his men landed at a sloping mud bank on this monstrous acropolis and clambered slipperily up over tightened oozy blocks which could have been no mortal staircase. The very sun of heaven seemed distorted when viewed through the polarizing miasma welling out from the sea-soaked perversion, and twisted menace and suspense lurked leeringly in those crazily elusive angles of carven rock where a second glance showed concavity after the first showed convexity. Something very like fright had come over all the explorers before anything more definite than rock and ooze and weed was seen. Each would have fled had he not feared the scorn of the others, and it was only half-heartedly that they searched, vainly as it proved, for some portable souvenir to bear away. It was Rodriguez, the Portuguese, who climbed up the foot of the monolith and shouted of what he had found. The rest followed him and looked curiously at the immense carved door with the now familiar squid dragon bas-relief. It was, Johansen said, like a great barn door, and they all felt that it was a door because of the ornate lintel, threshold, and jams around it, though they could not decide whether it lay flat like a trap door or slantwise like an outside cellar door. As Wilcox would have said, the geometry of the place was all wrong. One could not be sure that the sea and the ground were horizontal, hence the relative position of everything else seemed phantasmally variable. Bryden pushed the stone in several places without result. Then Donovan felt over it delicately around the edge, pressing each point separately as he went. He climbed interminably along the grotesque stone molding, that is, one would call it climbing if the thing was not, after all, horizontal, and the men wondered how any door in the universe could be so vast. Then, very softly and slowly, the acre-great panel began to give inward at the top, and they saw that it was balanced. Donovan slid or somehow propelled himself down or along the jam and rejoined his fellows, and everyone watched the queer recession of the monstrously carven portal. In this fantasy of prismatic distortion, it moved anomalously in a diagonal way, so that all the rules of matter and perspective seemed upset. The aperture was black with a darkness almost material. That tenebrousness was indeed a positive quality, for it obscured such parts of the inner walls as ought to have been revealed, and actually burst forth like smoke from its eon-long imprisonment, visibly darkening the sun as it slunk away into the shrunken and gibbous sky on flapping, membranous wings. The odor arising from the newly opened depths was intolerable, and at length the quick-eared Hawkins thought he heard a nasty, slopping sound down there. Everyone listened, and everyone was listening still, when it lumbered slobberingly into sight and gropingly squeezed its gelatinous green immensity through the black doorway into the tainted outside air of that poisoned city of madness. Poor Johansen's handwriting almost gave out when he wrote of this. Of the six men who never reached the ship, he thinks two perished of pure fright in that accursed instant. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God! What wonder that across the earth a great architect went mad, and poor Wilcox raved with fever in that telepathic instant. The thing of the idols, the green, sticky spawn of the stars, had awaked to claim his own. The stars were right again, and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design, a band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After Vigentillions of years, great Thulu was loose again and ravening for delight. 
Three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. God rest them, if there be any rest in the universe. They were Donovan, Guerrera, and Angstrom. Parker slipped as the other three were plunging frenziedly over endless vistas of green-crusted rock to the boat, and Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute but behaved as if it were obtuse. So only Bryden and Johansson reached the boat and pulled desperately for the alert as the mountainous monstrosity flopped down the slimy stones and hesitated, floundering at the edge of the water. Steam had not been suffered to go down entirely, despite the departure of all hands for the shore, and it was the work of only a few moments of feverish rushing up and down between wheel and engines to get the alert under way. Slowly, amidst the distorted horrors of that indescribable scene, she began to churn the lethal waters, whilst on the masonry of that charnel shore that was not of earth, the titan thing from the stars slavered and gibbered like Polyphemy cursing the fleeing ship of Odysseus. Then, Bolder than the storied Cyclops, Great Thulu slid greasily into the water and began to pursue with vast, wave-raising strokes of cosmic potency. Bryden looked back and went mad, laughing shrilly as he kept on laughing at intervals, till death found him one night in the cabin whilst Johansson was wandering deliriously. But Johansson had not given out yet, knowing that the thing could surely overtake the alert until steam was fully up. He resolved on a desperate chance— and setting the engine for full speed, ran lightning-like on deck and reversed the wheel. There was a mighty eddying and foaming in the noisome brine, and as the steam mounted higher and higher, the brave Norwegian drove his vessel head-on against the pursuing jelly, which rose above the unclean froth like the stern of a demon galleon. The awful squid head with writhing feelers came nearly up to the bowsprit of the sturdy yacht, but Johansen drove on relentlessly. There was a bursting as of an exploding bladder, a slushy nastiness as of a cloven sunfish, a stench as of a thousand open graves, and a sound that the chronicler would not put on paper. For an instant the ship was befouled by an acrid and blinding green cloud, and then there was only a venomous seething astern, where, God in heaven, the scattered plasticity of that nameless sky-spawn was nebulously recombining in its hateful original form, whilst its distance widened every second as the alert gained impetus from its mounting steam. That was all. After that Johansen only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the laughing maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after the first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. Then came the storm of April 2nd, and a gathering of the clouds about his consciousness. There is a sense of spectral whirling through liquid gulfs of infinity, of dizzying rides through reeling universes on a comet's tail, and of hysterical plunges from the pit to the moon, and from the moon back again to the pit, all livened by a cacinating chorus of the distorted, hilarious elder gods and the green, bat-winged, mocking imps of Tartarus. Out of that dream came rescue— the Vigilant, the Vice-Admiralty Court, the streets of Dunedin, and the long voyage back home to the old house by the Eggeberg. He could not tell. They would think him mad. He would write of what he knew before death came, but his wife must not guess. Death would be a boon if only it could blot out the memories. That was the document I read, and now I have placed it in the tin box beside the bas-relief and the papers of Professor Angel. With it shall go this record of mine, this test of my own sanity, wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poisoned to me. But I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansen went, so I shall go. I know too much, and the cult still lives." Thulu still lives, too, I suppose, again in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young. His accursed city is sunken once more, for the vigilant sailed over the spot after the April storm, but his ministers on earth still bellow and prance and slay around idle-capped monoliths in lonely places. He must have been trapped by the sinking whilst within his black abyss, or the world would by now be screaming with fright and frenzy. Who knows the end? What has risen may sink, and what has sunk may rise. 
Loathsomeness waits in dreams in the deep, and decay spreads over the tottering cities of men. A time will come, but I must not and cannot think. Let me pray that if I do not survive this manuscript, my executors may put caution before audacity and see that it meets no other eye. The Color Out of Space West of Arkham, the hills rise wild, and there are valleys with deep woods that no axe has ever cut. There are dark, narrow glens where the trees slope fantastically and where thin brooklets trickle without ever having caught the glint of sunlight. On the gentler slopes there are farms, ancient and rocky, with squat, moss-coated cottages brooding eternally over old New England secrets in the lee of great ledges. But these are all vacant now, the wide chimneys crumbling and the shingled sides bulging perilously beneath low, gambrel roofs. The old folk have gone away, and foreigners do not like to live there. French Canadians have tried it, Italians have tried it, and the Poles have come and departed. It is not because of anything that can be seen or heard or handled, but because of something that is imagined. The place is not good for the imagination, and does not bring restful dreams at night. It must be this which keeps the foreigners away, for old Amy Pierce has never told them of anything he recalls from the strange days. Amy, whose head has been a little queer for years, is the only one who still remains, or whoever talks of the strange days, and he dares to do this because his house is so near the open fields and the traveled roads around Arkham. There was once a road over the hills and through the valleys that ran straight where the blasted heath is now, but people ceased to use it, and a new road was laid curving far toward the south. Traces of the old one can still be found amidst the weeds of a returning wilderness, and some of them will doubtless linger even when half the hollows are flooded for the new reservoir. Then the dark woods will be cut down, and the blasted heath will slumber far below blue waters, whose surface will mirror the sky and ripple in the sun. And the secrets of the strange days will be one with the deep secrets, one with the hidden lore of old ocean and all the mystery of primal earth. When I went into the hills and vales to survey for the new reservoir, they told me the place was evil. They told me this in Arkham, and because that is a very old town full of witch legends, I thought the evil must be something which grandams had whispered to children through centuries. The name Blasted Heath seemed to me very odd and theatrical, and I wondered how it had come into the folklore of a Puritan people. Then I saw that dark westward tangle of glens and slopes for myself, and ceased to wonder at anything besides its own elder mystery. It was morning when I saw it, but shadow lurked always there. The trees grew too thickly, and the trunks were too big for any healthy New England wood. There was too much silence in the dim alleys between them, and the floor was too soft with the dank moss and mattings of infinite years of decay. In the open spaces, Mostly along the line of the old road, there were little hillside farms, sometimes with all the buildings standing, sometimes with only one or two, and sometimes with only a lone chimney or fast-filling cellar. Weeds and briars reigned, and furtive wild things rustled in the undergrowth. Upon everything was a haze of restlessness and oppression, a touch of the unreal and the grotesque, as if some vital element of perspective or chiaroscuro were awry. I did not wonder that the foreigners would not stay, for this was no region to sleep in. It was too much like a landscape of Salvatore Rosa, too much like some forbidden woodcut in a tale of terror. But even all this was not so bad as the blasted heath. I knew it the moment I came upon it at the bottom of a spacious valley, for no other name could fit such a thing, or any other thing fit such a name. It was as if the poet had coined the phrase from having seen this one particular region. It must, I thought as I viewed it, be the outcome of a fire. But why had nothing new ever grown over those five acres of gray desolation that sprawled open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields? It lay largely to the north of the ancient road line, but encroached a little on the other side. I felt an odd reluctance about approaching, and did so at last only because my business took me through and past it. There was no vegetation of any kind on that broad expanse, but only a fine gray dust or ash which no wind seemed ever to blow about. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and many dead trunks stood or lay rotting at the rim. 
As I walked hurriedly by, I saw the tumbled bricks and stones of an old chimney and cellar on my right, and the yawning black maw of an abandoned well whose stagnant vapors played strange tricks with the hues of the sunlight. Even the long, dark woodland climb beyond seemed welcome in contrast, and I marveled no more at the frightened whispers of Arkham people. There had been no house or ruin near. Even in the old days, the place must have been lonely and remote. And at twilight, dreading to repass that ominous spot, I walked circuitously back to the town by the curving road on the south. I vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for an odd timidity about the deep, skyey voids above had crept into my soul. In the evening I asked old people in Arkham about the blasted heath and what was meant by that phrase, strange days, which so many evasively muttered. I could not, however, get any good answers, except that all the mystery was much more recent than I had dreamed. It was not a matter of old legendary at all, but something within the lifetime of those who spoke. It had happened in the eighties, and a family had disappeared or was killed. Speakers would not be exact, and because they all told me to pay no attention to old Amy Pierce's crazy tales, I sought him out the next morning, having heard that he lived alone in the ancient, tottering cottage where the trees first begin to get thick. It was a fearsomely archaic place, and had begun to exude the faint miasmal odor which clings about houses that have stood too long. Only with persistent knocking could I rouse the aged man, and when he shuffled timidly to the door, I could tell he was not glad to see me. He was not so feeble as I had expected, but his eyes drooped in a curious way, and his unkempt clothing and white beard made him seem very worn and dismal. Not knowing just how he could best be launched on his tales, I feigned a matter of business, told him of my surveying, and asked vague questions about the district. He was far brighter and more educated than I had been led to think, and before I knew it had grasped quite as much of the subject as any man I had talked with in Arkham. He was not like other rustics I had known in the sections where reservoirs were to be. From him there were no protests at the miles of old wood and farmland to be blotted out, though perhaps there would have been had not his home lain outside the bounds of the future lake. Relief was all that he showed— relief at the doom of the dark ancient valleys through which he had roamed all his life. They were better under water now, better under water since the strange days. And with this opening his husky voice sank low while his body leaned forward and his right forefinger began to point shakily and impressively. It was then that I heard the story, and as the rambling voice scraped and whispered on, I shivered again and again despite the summer day. Often I had to recall the speaker from ramblings, piece out scientific points which he knew only by a fading parrot memory of Professor's talk, or bridge over gaps where his sense of logic and continuity broke down. When he was done, I did not wonder that his mind had snapped a trifle, or that the folk of Arkham would not speak much of the blasted heath. I hurried back before sunset to my hotel, unwilling to have the stars come out above me in the open, and the next day returned to Boston to give up my position. I could not go into that dim chaos of old forest and slope again, or face another time that grey-blasted heath where the black well yawned deep beside the tumbled bricks and stones. The reservoir will soon be built now, and all those elder secrets will be safe forever under watery fathoms. But even then I do not believe I would like to visit that country by night, at least not when the sinister stars are out, and nothing could bribe me to drink the new city water of Arkham. It all began, old Amy said, with the meteorite. Before that time there had been no wild legends at all since the witch trials, and even then these western woods were not feared half so much as the small island in the Miskatonic where the devil held court beside a curious stone altar older than the Indians. These were not haunted woods, and their fantastic dusk was never terrible till the strange days. Then there had come that white noontide cloud, that string of explosions in the air, and that pillar of smoke from the valley far in the wood. And by night all Arkham had heard of the great rock that fell out of the sky and bedded itself in the ground beside the well at the Nahum Gardner place. That was the house which had stood where the blasted heath was to come, the trim, white Nahum Gardner house amidst its fertile gardens and orchards. Nahum had come to town to tell people about the stone, and had dropped in at Amy Pierce's on the way. Amy was forty then, and all the queer things were fixed very strongly in his mind. 
He and his wife had gone with the three professors from Miskatonic University who hastened out the next morning to see the weird visitor from unknown stellar space and had wondered why Nahum had called it so large the day before. It had shrunk, Nahum said, as he pointed out the big brownish mound above the ripped earth and charred grass near the archaic well sweep in his front yard. But the wise men answered that stones do not shrink. Its heat lingered persistently, and Nahum declared it had glowed faintly in the night. The professors tried it with a geologist's hammer and found it was oddly soft. It was, in truth, so soft as to be almost plastic, and they gouged rather than chipped a specimen to take back to the college for testing. They took it in an old pail borrowed from Nahum's kitchen, for even the small piece refused to grow cool. On the trip back they stopped at Amy's to rest, and seemed thoughtful when Mrs. Pierce remarked that the fragment was growing smaller and burning the bottom of the pail. Truly it was not large, but perhaps they had taken less than they thought. The day after that, all this was in June of 82, the professors had trooped out again in a great excitement. As they passed Amy's, they told him what queer things the specimen had done, and how it had faded wholly away when they put it in a glass beaker. The beaker had gone, too, and the wise men talked of the strange stone's affinity for silicon. It had acted quite unbelievably in that well-ordered laboratory, doing nothing at all and showing no occluded gases when heated on charcoal, being wholly negative in the borax bead, and soon proving itself absolutely non-volatile at any producible temperature, including that of the oxyhydrogen blowpipe. On an anvil it appeared highly malleable, and in the dark its luminosity was very marked. Stubbornly refusing to grow cool, it soon had the college in a state of real excitement, and when upon heating before the spectroscope it displayed shining bands unlike any known colors of the normal spectrum, there was much breathless talk of new elements, bizarre optical properties, and other things which puzzled men of science are wont to say when faced by the unknown. Hot as it was, they tested it in a crucible with all the proper reagents. Water did nothing. Hydrochloric acid was the same— Nitric acid and even aqua regia merely hissed and spattered against its torrid invulnerability. Amy had difficulty in recalling all these things, but recognized some solvents as I mentioned them in the usual order of use. There were ammonia and caustic soda, alcohol and ether, nauseous carbon disulfide, and a dozen others. But although the weight grew steadily less as time passed, and the fragments seemed to be slightly cooling, there was no change in the solvents to show that they had attacked the substance at all. It was a metal, though, beyond a doubt. It was magnetic, for one thing, and after its immersion in the acid solvents, there seemed to be faint traces of the Widmenstatten figures found on meteoric iron. When the cooling had grown very considerable, the testing was carried on in glass— and it was in a glass beaker that they left all the chips made of the original fragment during the work. The next morning both chips and beaker were gone without trace, and only a charred spot marked the place on the wooden shelf where they had been. All this the professors told Amy as they paused at his door, and once more he went with them to see the stony messenger from the stars, though this time his wife did not accompany them. It had now most certainly shrunk, and even the sober professors could not doubt the truth of what they saw. All around the dwindling brown earth had caved in, and whereas it had been a good seven feet across the day before, it was now scarcely five. It was still hot, and the sages studied its surface curiously as they detached another and larger piece with hammer and chisel. They gouged deeply this time, and as they pried away the smaller mass, they saw that the core of the thing was not quite homogeneous. They had uncovered what seemed to be the side of a large colored globule embedded in the substance. The color, which resembled some of the bands in the meteor's strange spectrum, was almost impossible to describe, and it was only by analogy that they called it color at all. Its texture was glossy, and upon tapping it appeared to promise both brittleness and hollowness. One of the professors gave it a smart blow with a hammer, and it burst with a nervous little pop. Nothing was emitted, and all trace of the thing vanished with the puncturing. It left behind a hollow spherical space about three inches across, and all thought it probable that others would be discovered as the enclosing substance wasted away. Conjecture was vain, so after a futile attempt to find additional globules by drilling, the seekers left again with their new specimen, which proved, however, as baffling in the laboratory as its predecessor had been. 
aside from being almost plastic, having heat, magnetism, and slight luminosity, cooling slightly in powerful acids, possessing an unknown spectrum, wasting away in air, and attacking silicon compounds with mutual destruction as a result, it presented no identifying features whatsoever. And at the end of the tests, the college scientists were forced to own that they could not place it. It was nothing of this earth, but a piece of the great outside, and as such dowered with outside properties and obedient to outside laws. That night there was a thunderstorm, and when the professors went out to Nahum's the next day, they met with a bitter disappointment. The stone, magnetic as it had been, must have had some peculiar electrical property, for it had drawn the lightning, as Nahum said, with a singular persistence. Six times within an hour the farmer saw the lightning strike the furrow in the front yard, and when the storm was over nothing remained but a ragged pit by the ancient well sweep, half choked with caved-in earth. Digging had borne no fruit, and the scientists verified the fact of the utter vanishment. The failure was total, so that nothing was left to do but go back to the laboratory and test again the disappearing fragment left carefully encased in lead. That fragment lasted a week, at the end of which nothing of value had been learned of it. When it had gone, no residue was left behind, and in time the professors felt scarcely sure they had indeed seen with waking eyes that cryptic vestige of the fathomless gulfs outside, that lone, weird message from other universes and other realms of matter, force, and entity. As was natural, the Arkham paper made much of the incident with its collegiate sponsoring, and sent reporters to talk with Nahum Gardner and his family. At least one Boston Daily also sent a scribe, and Nahum quickly became a kind of local celebrity. He was a lean, genial person of about fifty, living with his wife and three sons on the pleasant farmstead in the valley. He and Amy exchanged visits frequently, as did their wives, and Amy had nothing but praise for him after all these years. He seemed slightly proud of the notice his place had attracted, and talked often of the meteorite in the succeeding weeks. That July and August were hot, and Nahum worked hard at his haying in the ten-acre pasture across Chapman's Brook, his rattling wain wearing deep ruts in the shadowy lanes between. The labor tired him more than it had in other years, and he felt that age was beginning to tell on him. Then fell the time of fruit and harvest. The pears and apples slowly ripened, and Nahum vowed that his orchards were prospering as never before. The fruit was growing to phenomenal size and unwanted gloss, and in such abundance that extra barrels were ordered to handle the future crop. But with the ripening came sore disappointment, for of all that gorgeous array of specious lusciousness not one single jot was fit to eat. Into the fine flavor of the pears and apples had crept a stealthy bitterness and sickishness, so that even the smallest of bites induced a lasting disgust. It was the same with the melons and tomatoes, and Nahum sadly saw that his entire crop was lost. Quick to connect events, he declared that the meteorite had poisoned the soil, and thanked heaven that most of the other crops were in the upland lot along the road. Winter came early, and was very cold. Amy saw Nahum less often than usual, and observed that he had begun to look worried. The rest of his family, too, seemed to have grown taciturn, and were far from steady in their church-going or their attendance at the various social events of the countryside. For this reserve or melancholy no cause could be found, though all the household confessed now and then to poorer health and a feeling of vague disquiet. Nahum himself gave the most definite statement of anyone when he said he was disturbed about certain footprints in the snow. They were the usual winter prints of red squirrels, white rabbits, and foxes, but the brooding farmer professed to see something not quite right about their nature and arrangement. He was never specific, but appeared to think that they were not as characteristic of the anatomy and habits of squirrels and rabbits and foxes as they ought to be. Amy listened without interest to this talk, until one night when he drove past Nahum's house in his sleigh on the way back from Clark's Corners. There had been a moon, and a rabbit had run across the road, and the leaps of the rabbit were longer than either Amy or his horse liked. The latter, indeed, had almost run away when brought up by a firm rain. Thereafter Amy gave Nahum's tales more respect, and wondered why the gardener dogs seemed so cowed and quivering every morning. They had, it developed, nearly lost the spirit to bark. In February, the McGregor boys from Meadow Hill were out shooting woodchucks, and not far from the gardener place bagged a very peculiar specimen. 
the proportions of its body seemed slightly altered, in a queer way impossible to describe, while its face had taken on an expression which no one ever saw in a woodchuck before. The boys were genuinely frightened, and threw the thing away at once, so that only their grotesque tales of it ever reached the people of the countryside. But the shying away of the horses near Nahum's house had now become an acknowledged thing, and all the basis for a cycle of whispered legend was fast taking form. People vowed that the snow melted faster around Nahum's than it did anywhere else, and early in March there was an awed discussion in Potter's general store in Clark's Corners. Stephen Rice had driven past Gardner's in the morning and had noticed the skunk cabbages coming up through the mud by the woods across the road. Never were things of such size seen before, and they had held strange colors that could not be put into any words. Their shapes were monstrous, and the horse had snorted at an odor which struck Stephen as wholly unprecedented. That afternoon several persons drove past to see the abnormal growth, and all agreed that plants of that kind ought never to sprout in a healthy world. The bad fruit of the fall before was freely mentioned, and it went from mouth to mouth that there was poison in Nahum's ground. Of course it was the meteorite, and remembering how strange the men from the college had found that stone to be, several farmers spoke about the matter to them. One day they paid Nahum a visit, but having no love of wild tales and folklore, were very conservative in what they inferred. The plants were certainly odd, but all skunk cabbages are more or less odd in shape and odor and hue. Perhaps some mineral element from the stone had entered the soil, but it would soon be washed away. And as for the footprints and frightened horses, of course this was mere country talk, which such a phenomenon as the aerolite would be certain to start. There was really nothing for serious men to do in cases of wild gossip, for superstitious rustics will say and believe anything. And so all through the strange days the professors stayed away in contempt. Only one of them, when given two files of dust for analysis in a police job over a year and a half later, recalled that the queer color of that skunk cabbage had been very like one of the anomalous bands of light shown by the meteor fragment in the college spectroscope, and like the brittle globule found embedded in the stone from the abyss. The samples in this analysis case gave the same odd bands at first, though later they lost the property. The trees budded prematurely around Nahum's, and at night they swayed ominously in the wind. Nahum's second son Thaddeus, a lad of fifteen, swore that they swayed also when there was no wind, but even the gossips would not credit this. Certainly, however, restlessness was in the air. The entire Gardner family developed the habit of stealthy listening, though not for any sound which they could consciously name. The listening was, indeed, rather a product of moments when consciousness seemed half to slip away. Unfortunately, such moments increased week by week, till it became common speech that something was wrong with all Nahum's folks. When the early saxifrage came out, it had another strange color, not quite like that of the skunk cabbage, but plainly related and equally unknown to anyone who saw it. Nahum took some blossoms to Arkham and showed them to the editor of the Gazette, but that dignitary did no more than write a humorous article about them, in which the dark fears of rustics were held up to polite ridicule. It was a mistake of Nahum's to tell a stolid city man about the way the great, overgrown, morning cloak butterflies behaved in connection with these saxifrages. April brought a kind of madness to the country folk, and began that disuse of the road past Nahum's which led to its ultimate abandonment. It was the vegetation— all the orchard trees blossomed forth in strange colors, and through the stony soil of the yard and adjacent pasturage there sprang up a bizarre growth which only a botanist could connect with the proper flora of the region. No sane, wholesome colors were anywhere to be seen except in the green grass and leafage, but everywhere those hectic and prismatic variants of some diseased, underlying primary tone without a place among the known tints of earth. The Dutchman's breeches became a thing of sinister menace, and the bloodroots grew insolent in their chromatic perversion. Amy and the gardeners thought that most of the colors had a sort of haunting familiarity, and decided that they reminded one of the brittle globule in the meteor. Nahum plowed and sowed the ten-acre pasture and the upland lot, but did nothing with the land around the house. He knew it would be of no use, and hoped that the summer's strange growths would draw all the poison from the soil. He was prepared for almost anything now, and had grown used to the sense of something near him waiting to be heard. The shunning of his house by neighbors told on him, of course, but it told on his wife more. 
The boys were better off being at school each day, but they could not help being frightened by the gossip. Thaddeus, an especially sensitive youth, suffered the most. In May the insects came, and Nahum's place became a nightmare of buzzing and crawling. Most of the creatures seemed not quite usual in their aspects and motions, and their nocturnal habits contradicted all former experience. The gardeners took to watching at night, watching in all directions at random for something. They could not tell what. It was then that they all owned that Thaddeus had been right about the trees. Mrs. Gardner was the next to see it from the window as she watched the swollen boughs of a maple against a moonlit sky. The boughs surely moved, and there was no wind. It must be the sap. Strangeness had come into everything growing now, yet it was none of Nahum's family at all who made the next discovery. Familiarity had dulled them, and what they could not see was glimpsed by a timid woodmill salesman from Bolton, who drove by one night in ignorance of the country legends. What he told in Arkham was given a short paragraph in the Gazette, and it was there that all the farmers, Nahum included, saw it first. The night had been dark, and the buggy lamps faint, but around a farm in the valley, which everyone knew from the account must be Nahum's, the darkness had been less thick. A dim, though distinct, luminosity seemed to inhere in all the vegetation, grass, leaves, and blossoms alike, while at one moment a detached piece of the phosphorescence appeared to stir furtively in the yard near the barn. The grass had so far seemed untouched, and the cows were freely pastured in the lot near the house, but toward the end of May the milk began to be bad. Then Nahum had the cows driven to the uplands, after which the trouble ceased. Not long after this, the change in grass and leaves became apparent to the eye. All the verdure was going gray and was developing a highly singular quality of brittleness. Amy was now the only person who ever visited the place, and his visits were becoming fewer and fewer. When school closed, the gardeners were virtually cut off from the world, and sometimes let Amy do their errands in town. They were failing curiously both physically and mentally, and no one was surprised when the news of Mrs. Gardner's madness stole around. It happened in June, about the anniversary of the meteor's fall, and the poor woman screamed about things in the air which she could not describe. In her raving there was not a single specific noun, but only verbs and pronouns. Things moved and changed and fluttered, and ears tingled to impulses which were not wholly sounds. Something was taken away. She was being drained of something. Something was fastening itself on her that ought not to be. Someone must make it keep off. Nothing was ever still in the night. The walls and windows shifted. Nahum did not send her to the county asylum, but let her wander about the house as long as she was harmless to herself and others. Even when her expression changed, she did nothing. But when the boys grew afraid of her, and Thaddeus nearly fainted at the way she made faces at him, he decided to keep her locked up in the attic. By July she had ceased to speak and crawled on all fours, and before that month was over Nahum got the mad notion that she was slightly luminous in the dark, as he now clearly saw was the case with the nearby vegetation. It was a little before this that the horses had stampeded. Something had aroused them in the night, and their neighing and kicking in the stall had been terrible. There seemed virtually nothing to do to calm them, and when Nahum opened the stable door they all bolted out like frightened woodland deer. It took a week to track all four, and when found they were seen to be quite useless and unmanageable. Something had snapped in their brains, and each one had to be shot for its own good. Nahum borrowed a horse from Amy for his haying, but found it would not approach the barn. It shied, balked, and whinnied, and in the end he could do nothing but drive it into the yard while the men used their own strength to get the heavy wagon near enough the hayloft for convenient pitching. And all the while the vegetation was turning gray and brittle. Even the flowers, whose hue had been so strange, were graying now, and the fruit was coming out gray and dwarfed and tasteless. The asters and goldenrod bloomed gray and distorted, and the roses and zinnias and hollyhocks in the front yard were such blasphemous-looking things that Nahum's eldest boy, Zenus, cut them down. The strangely puffed insects died about that time, even the bees that had left their hives and taken to the woods. By September all the vegetation was fast crumbling to a grayish powder, and Nahum feared that the trees would die before the poison was out of the soil. His wife now had spells of terrific screaming, and he and the boys were in a constant state of nervous tension. 
They shunned people now, and when school opened, the boys did not go. But it was Amy, on one of his rare visits, who first realized that the well water was no longer good. It had an evil taste that was not exactly fetid nor exactly salty, and Amy advised his friend to dig another well on higher ground to use till the soil was good again. Nahum, however, ignored the warning, for he had by that time become callous to strange and unpleasant things. He and the boys continued to use the tainted supply, drinking it as listlessly and mechanically as they ate their meager and ill-cooked meals and did their thankless and monotonous chores through the aimless days. There was something of stolid resignation about them all, as if they walked half in another world between lines of nameless guards to a certain and familiar doom. Thaddeus went mad in September after a visit to the well. He had gone with a pail and had come back empty-handed, shrieking and waving his arms and sometimes lapsing into an inane titter or a whisper about the moving colors down there. Two in one family was pretty bad, but Nahum was very brave about it. He let the boy run about for a week until he began stumbling and hurting himself, and then he shut him in an attic room across the hall from his mother's. The way they screamed at each other from behind their locked doors was very terrible, especially to little Merwin, who fancied they talked in some terrible language that was not of earth. Merwin was getting frightfully imaginative, and his restlessness was worse after the shutting away of the brother who had been his greatest playmate. Almost at the same time, the mortality among the livestock commenced. Poultry turned grayish and died very quickly, their meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew inordinately fat, then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. Their meat was, of course, useless, and Nahum was at his wit's end. No rural veterinary would approach his place, and the city veterinary from Arkham was openly baffled. The swine began growing gray and brittle and falling to pieces before they died, and their eyes and muzzles developed singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas, or sometimes the whole body, would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, there would be a graying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites of prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast of earth can pass through solid obstacles? It must only be natural disease, yet what disease could wreak such results was beyond any mind's guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place, for the stock and poultry were dead, and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night, and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed, since there now seemed to be no mice, and only Mrs. Gardner had made pets of the graceful felines. On the 19th of October, Nahum staggered into Amy's house with hideous news. The death had come to poor Thaddeus in his attic room, and it had come in a way which could not be told. Nahum had dug a grave in the railed family plot behind the farm, and had put therein what he found. There could have been nothing from outside, for the small barred window and locked door were intact, but it was much as it had been in the barn. Amy and his wife consoled the stricken man as best they could, but shuddered as they did so. Stark terror seemed to cling around the gardeners, and all they touched, and the very presence of one in the house was a breath from regions unnamed and unnameable. Amy accompanied Nahum home with the greatest reluctance, and did what he might to calm the hysterical sobbing of little Merwin. Zenas needed no calming. He had come of late to do nothing but stare into space and obey what his father told him, and Amy thought that his fate was very merciful. Now and then Merwin's screams were answered faintly from the attic, and in response to an inquiring look, Nahum said that his wife was getting very feeble. When night approached, Amy managed to get away, for not even friendship could make him stay in that spot when the faint glow of the vegetation began and the trees may or may not have swayed without wind. It was really lucky for Amy that he was not more imaginative. Even as things were, his mind was bent ever so slightly. But had he been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, he must inevitably have turned a total maniac. In the twilight he hastened home, the screams of the mad woman and the nervous child ringing horribly in his ears. 
Three days later, Nahum lurched into Amy's kitchen in the early morning, and in the absence of his host, stammered out a desperate tale once more, while Mrs. Pierce listened in a clutching fright. It was little Merwin this time. He was gone. He had gone out late at night with a lantern and pail for water, and had never come back. He had been going to pieces for days, and hardly knew what he was about. Screamed at everything. There had been a frantic shriek from the yard then, but before the father could get to the door, the boy was gone. There was no glow from the lantern he had taken, and of the child himself no trace. At the time, Nahum thought the lantern and pail were gone too, but when dawn came and the man had plodded back from his all-night search of the woods and fields, he had found some very curious things near the well. There was a crushed and apparently somewhat melted mass of iron, which had certainly been the lantern, while a bale and twisted iron hoops beside it, both half-fused, seemed to hint at the remnants of the pail. That was all. Nahum was past imagining, Mrs. Pierce was blank, and Amy, when he had reached home and heard the tale, could give no guess. Merwin was gone, and there would be no use in telling the people around, who shunned all gardeners now. No use either in telling the city people at Arkham, who laughed at everything. Thad had gone, and now Murney was gone. Something was creeping and creeping and waiting to be seen and felt and heard. Nahum would go soon, and he wanted Amy to look after his wife and Zenas if they survived him. It must all be a judgment of some sort, though he could not fancy what for, since he had always walked uprightly in the Lord's ways so far as he knew. For over two weeks Amy saw nothing of Nahum, and then worried about what might have happened, he overcame his fears and paid the gardener place a visit. There was no smoke from the great chimney, and for a moment the visitor was apprehensive of the worst. The aspect of the whole farm was shocking, grayish, withered grass and leaves on the ground, vines falling in brittle wreckage from archaic walls and gables, and great bare trees clawing up at the gray November sky with a studied malevolence which Amy could not but feel had come from some subtle change in the tilt of the branches. But Nahum was alive after all. He was weak, and lying on a couch in the low-sealed kitchen, but perfectly conscious and able to give simple orders to Zenas. The room was deadly cold, and as Amy visibly shivered, the host shouted huskily to Zenas for more wood. Wood indeed was sorely needed, since the cavernous fireplace was unlit and empty, with a cloud of soot blowing about and the chill wind that came down the chimney. Presently Nahum asked him if the extra wood had made him any more comfortable, and then Amy saw what had happened. The stoutest cord had broken at last, and the hapless farmer's mind was proof against more sorrow. Questioning tactfully, Amy could get no clear data at all about the missing Zenus. In the well. He lives in the well, was all that the clouded father would say. Then there flashed across the visitor's mind a sudden thought of the mad wife, and he changed his line of inquiry. Abby? Why, here she is, was the surprised response of poor Nahum, and Amy soon saw that he must search for himself. Leaving the harmless babbler on the couch, he took the keys from their nail beside the door and climbed the creaking stairs to the attic. It was very close and noisome up there, and no sound could be heard from any direction. Of the four doors in sight, only one was locked, and on this he tried various keys on the ring he had taken. The third key proved the right one, and after some fumbling, Amy threw open the low white door. It was quite dark inside, for the window was small and half obscured by the crude wooden bars, and Amy could see nothing at all on the wide planked floor. The stench was beyond enduring, and before proceeding further, he had to retreat to another room and return with his lungs filled with breathable air. When he did enter, he saw something dark in the corner, and upon seeing it more clearly, he screamed outright. While he screamed, he thought a momentary cloud eclipsed the window, and a second later he felt himself brushed as if by some hateful current of vapor. Strange colors danced before his eyes, and had not a present horror numbed him, he would have thought of the globule in the meteor that the geologist's hammer had shattered, and of the morbid vegetation that had sprouted in the spring. As it was, he thought only of the blasphemous monstrosity which confronted him, and which all too clearly had shared the nameless fate of young Thaddeus and the livestock. But the terrible thing about this horror was that it very slowly and perceptibly moved as it continued to crumble. 
Amy would give me no added particulars to this scene, but the shape in the corner does not reappear in his tail as a moving object. There are things which cannot be mentioned, and what is done in common humanity is sometimes cruelly judged by the law. I gathered that no moving thing was left in that attic room, and that to leave anything capable of motion there would have been a deed so monstrous as to damn any accountable being to eternal torment. Anyone but a stolid farmer would have fainted or gone mad, but Amy walked conscious through that low doorway and locked the accursed secret behind him. There would be Nahum to deal with now. He must be fed and tended and removed to some place where he could be cared for. Commencing his descent of the dark stairs, Amy heard a thud below him. He even thought a scream had been suddenly choked off and recalled nervously the clammy vapor which had brushed by him in that frightful room above. What presence had his cry and entry started up? Halted by some vague fear, he heard still further sounds below. Indubitably there was a sort of heavy dragging and a most detestably sticky noise, as of some fiendish and unclean species of suction. With an associative sense goaded to feverish heights, he thought unaccountably of what he had seen upstairs. Good God! What eldritch dream-world was this into which he had blundered? He dared move neither backward nor forward, but stood there trembling at the black curve of the boxed-in staircase. Every trifle of the scene burned itself into his brain. The sounds, the sense of dread expectancy, the darkness, the steepness of the narrow steps, and merciful heaven, the faint but unmistakable luminosity of all the woodwork in sight, steps, sides, exposed laths and beams alike. Then there burst forth a frantic whinny from Amy's horse outside, followed at once by a clatter which told of a frenzied runaway. In another moment horse and buggy had gone beyond earshot, leaving the frightened man on the dark stairs to guess what had sent them. But that was not all. There had been another sound out there, a sort of liquid splash, water. It must have been the well. He had left Hero untied near it, and a buggy wheel must have brushed the coping and knocked in a stone, and still the pale phosphorescence glowed in that detestably ancient woodwork. God, how old the house was! Most of it built before 1670, and the gambrel roof not later than 1730. A feeble scratching on the floor downstairs now sounded distinctly, and Amy's grip tightened on a heavy stick he had picked up in the attic for some purpose. Slowly nerving himself, he finished his descent and walked boldly toward the kitchen. But he did not complete the walk, because what he sought was no longer there. It had come to meet him, and it was still alive after a fashion. Whether it had crawled, or whether it had been dragged by any external force, Amy could not say. But the death had been at it. Everything had happened in the last half hour, but collapse, graying, and disintegration were already far advanced. There was a horrible brittleness, and dry fragments were scaling off. Amy could not touch it, but looked horrifiedly into the distorted parody that had been a face. What was it, Nahum? What was it? He whispered, and the cleft, bulging lips were just able to crackle out a final answer. Nothing. Nothing. The color. It burns cold and wet, but it burns lived in the well. I seen it, a kind of smoke, just like the flowers last spring. The well shone at night. Thad and Myrny and Zenus, everything alive, sucking the life out of everything, in that stone. It must have come in that stone, pisoned the whole place. Don't know what it wants. That round thing the men from the college dug out in the stone, they smashed it. It was that same color. Just the same, like the flowers and plants. Must have been more of them. Seeds. Seeds. They growed. I seen it the fust time this week. Must have got strong on Zenus. He was a big boy, full of life. It beats down your mind and then gets you. Burns you up. In the well water. You was right about that. Evil water. Zenus never come back from the well. Can't get away. Draws you. You know some that's coming. But tain't no use. I seen it time and again since Zenus was took. Where's Nabby, Amy? My head's no good. 
Don't know how long since I fed her. It'll get her if we ain't careful. Just a color. Her face is getting to have that color sometimes towards night, and it burns and sucks. It come from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. He was right. Look out, Amy. It'll do something more. Sucks the life out. But that was all. That which spoke could speak no more because it had completely caved in. Amy laid a red checked tablecloth over what was left and reeled out the back door into the fields. He climbed the slope to the ten-acre pasture and stumbled home by the north road in the woods. He could not pass that well from which his horse had run away. He had looked at it through the window and had seen that no stone was missing from the rim. Then the lurching buggy had not dislodged anything after all. The splash had been something else, something which went into the well after it had done with poor Nahum. When Amy reached his house, the horse and buggy had arrived before him and thrown his wife into fits of anxiety. Reassuring her without explanations, he set out at once for Arkham and notified the authorities that the Gardner family was no more. He indulged in no details, but merely told of the deaths of Nahum and Nabby, that of Thaddeus already being known, and mentioned that the cause seemed to be the same strange ailment which had killed the livestock. He also stated that Merwin and Zenas had disappeared. There was considerable questioning at the police station, and in the end Amy was compelled to take three officers to the Gardner farm, together with the coroner, the medical examiner, and the veterinary, who had treated the diseased animals. He went much against his will, for the afternoon was advancing, and he feared the fall of night over that accursed place, but it was some comfort to have so many people with him. The six men drove out in a Democrat wagon, following Amy's buggy, and arrived at the pest-ridden farmhouse about four o'clock. Used as the officers were to gruesome experiences, not one remained unmoved at what was found in the attic and under the red-checked tablecloth on the floor below. The whole aspect of the farm with its gray desolation was terrible enough, but those two crumbling objects were beyond all bounds. No one could look long at them, and even the medical examiner admitted that there was very little to examine. Specimens could be analyzed, of course, so he busied himself in obtaining them, and here it develops that a very puzzling aftermath occurred at the college laboratory, where the two files of dust were finally taken. Under the spectroscope, both samples gave off an unknown spectrum, in which many of the baffling bands were precisely like those which the strange meteor had yielded in the previous year. The property of emitting this spectrum vanished in a month, the dust thereafter consisting mainly of alkaline phosphates and carbonates. Amy would not have told the men about the well if he had thought they meant to do anything then and there. It was getting toward sunset, and he was anxious to be away but he could not help glancing nervously at the stony curb by the great sweep, and when a detective questioned him, he admitted that Nahum had feared something down there, so much so that he had never even thought of searching it for Merwin or Zenas. After that nothing would do but that they empty and explore the well immediately, so Amy had to wait trembling while pail after pail of rank water was hauled up and splashed on the soaking ground outside. The men sniffed in disgust at the fluid, and toward the last held their noses against the feeder they were uncovering. It was not so long a job as they had feared it would be, since the water was phenomenally low. There is no need to speak too exactly of what they found. Merwin and Zenas were both there, in part, though the vestiges were mainly skeletal. There were also a small deer and a large dog in about the same state, and a number of bones of smaller animals. The ooze and slime at the bottom seemed inexplicably porous and bubbling, and a man who descended on handholds with a long pole found that he could sink the wooden shaft to any depth in the mud of the floor without meeting any solid obstruction. Twilight had now fallen, and lanterns were brought from the house. Then, when it was seen that nothing further could be gained from the well, everyone went indoors and conferred in the ancient sitting-room while the intermittent light of a spectral half-moon played wanly on the grey desolation outside. The men were frankly nonplussed by the entire case and could find no convincing common element to link the strange vegetable conditions, the unknown disease of livestock and humans, and the unaccountable deaths of Merwin and Zenas in the tainted well. They had heard the common country talk, it is true, but could not believe that anything contrary to natural law had occurred.
No doubt the meteor had poisoned the soil, but the illness of persons and animals who had eaten nothing grown in that soil was another matter. Was it the well water? Very possibly. It might be a good idea to analyze it. But what peculiar madness could have made both boys jump into the well? Their deeds were so similar, and the fragments showed that they had both suffered from the grey, brittle death. Why was everything so grey and brittle? It was the coroner, seated near a window overlooking the yard, who first noticed the glow about the well. Night had fully set in, and all the abhorrent ground seemed faintly luminous with more than the fitful moonbeams. But this new glow was something definite and distinct, and appeared to shoot up from the black pit like a softened ray from a searchlight, giving dull reflections in the little ground pools where the water had been emptied. It had a very queer color, and as all the men clustered round the window, Amy gave a violent start, for this strange beam of ghastly miasma was to him of no unfamiliar hue. He had seen that color before, and feared to think what it might mean. He had seen it in the nasty, brittle globule in the aerolite two summers ago, had seen it in the crazy vegetation of the springtime, and had thought he had seen it for an instant that very morning against the small barred window of that terrible attic room where nameless things had happened. It had flashed there a second, and a clammy and hateful current of vapor had brushed past him, and then poor Nahum had been taken by something of that color. He had said so at the last, said it was the globule and the plants. After that had come the runaway in the yard and the splash in the well. And now that well was belching forth to the night a pale, insidious beam of the same demoniac tint. It does credit to the alertness of Amy's mind that he puzzled even at that tense moment over a point which was essentially scientific. He could not but wonder at his gleaning of the same impression from a vapor glimpsed in the daytime against a window opening on the morning sky and from a nocturnal exhalation seen as a phosphorescent mist against the black and blasted landscape. It wasn't right. It was against nature. And he thought of those terrible last words of his stricken friend. It come from some place where things ain't as they is here. One of them professors said so. All three horses outside, tied to a pair of shriveled saplings by the road, were now neighing and pawing frantically. The wagon driver started for the door to do something, but Amy laid a shaky hand on his shoulder. Don't go out there, he whispered. There's more to this nor what we know. Nahum said something lived in the well that sucks your life out. He said it must be some that growed from a round ball like one we all seen in the meteor stone that fell a year ago June. Sucks and burns, he said, and is just a cloud of color like that light out there now that ye can hardly see and can't tell what it is. Nahum thought it feeds on everything living and gets stronger all the time. He said he's seen it this last week. It must be something from a way off in the sky like the men from the college last year says the meteor stone was. The way it's made and the way it works ain't like no way o' God's world. It's summit from beyond. So the men paused indecisively as the light from the well grew stronger and the hitched horses pawed and whinnied in increasing frenzy. It was truly an awful moment. With terror in that ancient and accursed house itself, Four monstrous sets of fragments, two from the house and two from the well, in the woodshed behind, and that shaft of unknown and unholy iridescence from the slimy depths in front. Amy had restrained the driver on impulse, forgetting how uninjured he himself was after the clammy brushing of that colored vapor in the attic room, but perhaps it is just as well that he acted as he did. No one will ever know what was abroad that night, and though the blasphemy from beyond had not so far hurt any human of unweakened mind, there is no telling what it might not have done at that last moment, and with its seemingly increased strength and the special signs of purpose it was soon to display beneath the half-clouded moonlit sky. All at once one of the detectives at the window gave a short, sharp gasp. The others looked at him, and then quickly followed his own gaze upward to the point at which its idle straying had been suddenly arrested. There was no need for words. What had been disputed in country gossip was disputable no longer, and it is because of the thing which every man of that party agreed in whispering later on that the strange days are never talked about in Arkham. It is necessary to premise that there was no wind at that hour of the evening. One did arise not long afterward, but there was absolutely none then. 
Even the dry tips of the lingering hedge mustard, gray and blighted, and the fringe on the roof of the standing Democrat wagon were unstirred. And yet amidst that tense, godless calm, the high, bare boughs of all the trees in the yard were moving. They were twitching morbidly and spasmodically, clawing in convulsive and epileptic madness at the moonlit clouds, scratching impotently in the noxious air as if jerked by some alien and bodiless line of linkage with subterrene horrors writhing and struggling below the black roots. Not a man breathed for several seconds. Then a cloud of darker depth passed over the moon, and the silhouette of clutching branches faded out momentarily. At this there was a general cry, muffled with awe, but husky and almost identical from every throat. For the terror had not faded with the silhouette. And in a fearsome instant of deeper darkness, the watchers saw wriggling at that treetop height a thousand tiny points of faint and unhallowed radiance, tipping each bough like the fire of St. Elmo or the flames that came down on the apostles' heads at Pentecost. It was a monstrous constellation of unnatural light, like a glutted swarm of corpse-fed fireflies dancing hellish sarabands over an accursed marsh, and its color was that same nameless intrusion which Amy had come to recognize and dread. All the while the shaft of phosphorescence from the well was getting brighter and brighter, bringing to the minds of the huddled men a sense of doom and abnormality which far outraced any image their conscious minds could form. It was no longer shining out, it was pouring out, and as the shapeless stream of unplaceable color left the well, it seemed to flow directly into the sky. The veterinary shivered and walked to the front door to drop the heavy extra bar across it. Amy shook no less and had to tug and point for lack of a controllable voice when he wished to draw notice to the growing luminosity of the trees. The neighing and stamping of the horses had become utterly frightful, but not a soul of that group in the old house would have ventured forth for any earthly reward. With the moments, the shining of the trees increased, while their restless branches seemed to strain more and more toward verticality. The wood of the well-sweep was shining now, and presently a policeman dumbly pointed to some wooden sheds and beehives near the stone wall on the west. They were commencing to shine, too, though the tethered vehicles of the visitors seemed so far unaffected. Then there was a wild commotion and clopping in the road, and as Amy quenched the lamp for better seeing, they realized that the span of frantic greys had broke their sapling and run off with the Democrat wagon. The shock served to loosen several tongues, and embarrassed whispers were exchanged. It spreads on everything organic that's been around here, muttered the medical examiner. No one replied. But the man who had been in the well gave a hint that his long pole must have stirred up something intangible. It was awful, he added. There was no bottom at all, just ooze and bubbles and the feeling of something lurking under there. Amy's horse still pawed and screamed deafeningly in the road outside, and nearly drowned its owner's faint quaver as he mumbled his formless reflections. It come from that stone. It growed down there. It got everything living. It fed itself on a mind and body, Thad and Myrny, Zenus and Nabby. Nahum was the last. They all drunk the water. It got strong on them. It come from beyond, where things ain't like they be here. Now it's going home. At this point, as the column of unknown color flared suddenly stronger and began to weave itself into fantastic suggestions of shape, which each spectator later described differently, there came from poor Hero such a sound as no man before or since ever heard from a horse. Every person in that low-pitched sitting-room stopped his ears, and Amy turned away from the window in horror and nausea. Words could not convey it. When Amy looked out again, the hapless beast lay huddled inert on the moonlit ground between the splintered shafts of the buggy. That was the last of Hero till they buried him next day. But the present was no time to mourn, for almost at this instant the detective silently called attention to something terrible in the very room with them. In the absence of the lamplight, it was clear that a faint phosphorescence had begun to pervade the entire apartment. It glowed on the broad planked floor and the fragment of rag carpet and shimmered over the sashes of the small paned windows. It ran up and down the exposed corner posts, coruscated above the shelf and mantel, and infected the very doors and furniture. Each minute saw it strengthen, and at last it was very plain that healthy living things must leave that house. Amy showed them the back door and the path up through the fields to the ten-acre pasture. 
They walked and stumbled as in a dream, and did not dare look back till they were far away on the high ground. They were glad of the path, for they could not have gone the front way by that well. It was bad enough passing the glowing barn and sheds and those shining orchard trees with the gnarled, fiendish contours, but thank heaven the branches did their worst twisting high up. The moon went under some very black clouds as they crossed the rustic bridge over Chapman's Brook, and it was blind groping from there to the open meadows. When they looked back toward the valley and the distant gardener place at the bottom, they saw a fearsome sight. All the farm was shining with the hideous, unknown blend of color. Trees, buildings, and even such grass and herbage as had not been wholly changed to lethal gray brittleness. The boughs were all straining skyward, tipped with tongues of foul flame, and lambent tricklings of the same monstrous fire were creeping about the ridgepoles of the house, barn, and sheds. It was a scene from a vision of Fuseli, and over all the rest reigned that riot of luminous amorphousness, that alien and undimensioned rainbow of cryptic poison from the well, seething, feeling, lapping, reaching, scintillating, straining, and malignly bubbling in its cosmic and unrecognizable chromaticism. Then, without warning, the hideous thing shot vertically up toward the sky like a rocket or meteor, leaving behind no trail and disappearing through a round and curiously regular hole in the clouds before any man could gasp or cry out. No watcher can ever forget that sight, and Ami stared blankly at the stars of Cygnus, Deneb twinkling above the others, where the unknown color had melted into the Milky Way. But his gaze was the next moment called swiftly to earth by the crackling in the valley. It was just that, only a wooden ripping and crackling, not an explosion as so many others of the party vowed. Yet the outcome was the same, for in one feverish kaleidoscopic instant there burst up from that doomed and accursed farm a gleamingly eruptive cataclysm of unnatural sparks and substance, blurring the glance of the few who saw it and sending forth to the zenith a bombarding cloudburst of such colored and fantastic fragments as our universe must needs disown. Through quickly reclosing vapors, they followed the great morbidity that had vanished, and in another second they had vanished too. Behind and below was only a darkness to which the men dared not return, and all about was a mounting wind which seemed to sweep down in black frore gusts from interstellar space. It shrieked and howled, and lashed the fields and distorted woods in a mad cosmic frenzy, till soon the trembling party realized it would be no use waiting for the moon to show what was left down there at Nahum's. Too awed even to hint theories, the seven shaking men trudged back toward Arkham by the north road. Amy was worse than his fellows, and begged them to see him inside his own kitchen instead of keeping straight on to town. He did not wish to cross the nighted, wind-whipped woods alone to his home on the main road, for he had had an added shock that the others were spared, and was crushed forever with a brooding fear he dared not even mention for many years to come. As the rest of the watchers on that tempestuous hill had stolidly set their faces toward the road, Amy had looked back an instant at the shadowed valley of desolation so lately sheltering his ill-starred friend and from that stricken, faraway spot he had seen something feebly rise, only to sink down again upon the place from which the great shapeless horror had shot into the sky. It was just a color, but not any color of our earth or heavens. And because Amy recognized that color and knew that this last faint remnant must still lurk down there in the well, he has never been quite right since. Amy would never go near the place again, it is over half a century now since the horror happened, but he has never been there and will be glad when the new reservoir blots it out. I shall be glad, too, for I do not like the way the sunlight changed color around the mouth of that abandoned well I passed. I hope the water will always be very deep, but even so I shall never drink it. I do not think I shall visit the Arkham country hereafter. Three of the men who had been with Amy returned the next morning to see the ruins by daylight, but there were not any real ruins. Only the bricks of the chimney, the stones of the cellar, some mineral and metallic litter here and there, and the rim of that nefandous well. Save for Amy's dead horse, which they towed away and buried, and the buggy, which they shortly returned to him, everything that had ever been living had gone. Five eldritch acres of dusty gray desert remained nor has anything ever grown there since. 
To this day it sprawls open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields, and the few who have ever dared glimpse it, in spite of the rural tales, have named it the Blasted Heath. The rural tales are queer. They might be even queerer if city men and college chemists could be interested enough to analyze the water from that disused well, or the gray dust that no wind seems ever to disperse. Botanists, too, ought to study the stunted flora on the borders of that spot, for they might shed light on the country notion that the blight is spreading, little by little, perhaps an inch a year. People say the color of the neighboring herbage is not quite right in the spring, and that wild things leave queer prints in the light winter snow. Snow never seems quite so heavy on the blasted heath as it is elsewhere. Horses, the few that are left in this motor age, grow skittish in the silent valley, and hunters cannot depend on their dogs too near the splotch of grayish dust. They say the mental influences are very bad, too. Numbers went queer in the years after Nahum's taking, and always they lacked the power to get away. Then the stronger-minded folk all left the region, and only the foreigners tried to live in the crumbling old homesteads. They could not stay, though, and one sometimes wonders what insight beyond ours their wild, weird stores of whispered magic have given them. Their dreams at night, they protest, are very horrible in that grotesque country, and surely the very look of the dark realm is enough to stir a morbid fancy. No traveler has ever escaped a sense of strangeness in those deep ravines, and artists shiver as they paint thick woods whose mystery is as much of the spirit as of the eye. I myself am curious about the sensation I derived from my one lone walk before Amy told me his tale. When twilight came, I had vaguely wished some clouds would gather, for an odd timidity about the deep skyey voids above had crept into my soul. Do not ask me for my opinion. I do not know. That is all. There was no one but Ami to question, for Arkham people will not talk about the strange days, and all three professors who saw the aralite and its colored globule are dead. There were other globules, depend upon that. One must have fed itself and escaped, and probably there was another, which was too late. No doubt it is still down the well. I know there was something wrong with the sunlight I saw above that miasmal brink, the rustics say the blight creeps an inch a year, so perhaps there is a kind of growth or nourishment even now. But whatever demon hatchling is there, it must be tethered to something, or else it would quickly spread. Is it fastened to the roots of those trees that claw the air? One of the current Arkham tales is about fat oaks that shine and move as they ought not to do at night. What it is only God knows. In terms of matter, I suppose the thing Amy described would be called a gas, but this gas obeyed laws that are not of our cosmos. This was no fruit of such worlds and suns as shine on the telescopes and photographic plates of our observatories. This was no breath from the skies whose motions and dimensions our astronomers measure or deem too vast to measure. It was just a color out of space, a frightful messenger from unformed realms of infinity beyond all nature as we know it, from realms whose mere existence stuns the brain and numbs us with the black extracosmic gulfs it throws open before our frenzied eyes. I doubt very much if Amy consciously lied to me, and I do not think his tale was all a freak of madness as the townsfolk had forewarned. Something terrible came to the hills and valleys on that meteor, and something terrible, though I know not in what proportion, still remains. I shall be glad to see the water come. Meanwhile, I hope nothing will happen to Amy. He saw so much of the thing, and its influence was so insidious. Why has he never been able to move away? How clearly he recalled those dying words of Nahum's. Can't get away. Draws ye. Ye know summat's coming, but tain't no use. Amy is such a good old man. When the reservoir gang gets to work, I must write the chief engineer to keep a sharp watch on him. I would hate to think of him as the gray, twisted, brittle monstrosity which persists more and more in troubling my sleep. The Dunwich Horror Gorgons and hydras and chimeras, dire stories of Salino and the harpies, may reproduce themselves in the brain of superstition, but they were there before. They are transcripts, types, the archetypes are in us, and eternal. 
How else should the recital of that which we know in a waking sense to be false come to affect us at all? Is it that we naturally conceive terror from such objects considered in their capacity of being able to inflict upon us bodily injury? Oh, least of all, these terrors are of older standing. They date beyond body, or without the body they would have been the same. That the kind of fear here treated is purely spiritual, that it is strong in proportion as it is objectless on earth, that it predominates in the period of our sinless infancy, are difficulties the solution of which might afford some probable insight into our anti-mundane condition, and a peep at least into the shadowland of pre-existence. Charles Lamb, Witches and Other Night Fears 1. When a traveler in north-central Massachusetts takes the wrong fork at the junction of the Aylesbury Pike, just beyond Dean's Corners, he comes upon a lonely and curious country. The ground gets higher, and the briar-bordered stone walls press closer and closer against the ruts of the dusty, curving road. The trees of the frequent forest belts seem too large, and the wild weeds, brambles, and grasses attain a luxuriance not often found in settled regions. At the same time, the planted fields appear singularly few and barren, while the sparsely scattered houses wear a surprisingly uniform aspect of age, squalor, and dilapidation. Without knowing why, one hesitates to ask directions from the gnarled, solitary figures spied now and then on crumbling doorsteps or on the sloping, rock-strown meadows. Those figures are so silent and furtive that one feels somehow confronted by forbidden things, with which it would be better to have nothing to do. When a rise in the road brings the mountains in view above the deep woods, the feeling of strange uneasiness is increased. The summits are too rounded and symmetrical to give a sense of comfort and naturalness, and sometimes the sky silhouettes with a special clearness the queer circles of tall stone pillars with which most of them are crowned. Gorges and ravines of problematical depth intersect the way, and the crude wooden bridges always seem of dubious safety. When the road dips again, there are stretches of marshland that one instinctively dislikes, and indeed almost fears at evening when unseen whippoorwills chatter and the fireflies come out in abnormal profusion to dance to the raucous, creepily insistent rhythms of stridently piping bullfrogs. The thin, shining line of the Miskatonic's upper reaches has an oddly serpent-like suggestion as it winds close to the feet of the domed hills among which it rises. As the hills draw nearer, one heeds their wooded sides more than their stone-crowned tops. Those sides loom up so darkly and precipitously that one wishes they would keep their distance, but there is no road by which to escape them. Across a covered bridge one sees a small village huddled between the stream and the vertical slope of Round Mountain, and wonders at the cluster of rotting gambrel roofs bespeaking an earlier architectural period than that of the neighboring region. It is not reassuring to see, on a closer glance, that most of the houses are deserted and falling to ruin, and that the broken steepled church now harbors the one slovenly mercantile establishment of the hamlet. One dreads to trust the tenebrous tunnel of the bridge, yet there is no way to avoid it. Once across, it is hard to prevent the impression of a faint, malign odor about the village street, as of the massed mold and decay of centuries. It is always a relief to get clear of the place and to follow the narrow road around the base of the hills and across the level country beyond till it rejoins the Aylesbury Pike. Afterward, one sometimes learns that one has been through Dunwich. Outsiders visit Dunwich as seldom as possible, and since a certain season of horror, all the signboards pointing toward it have been taken down. The scenery, judged by any ordinary aesthetic canon, is more than commonly beautiful, yet there is no influx of artists or summer tourists. Two centuries ago, when talk of witch-blood, Satan-worship, and strange forest presences was not laughed at, it was the custom to give reasons for avoiding the locality. In our sensible age, since the Dunwich horror of 1928 was hushed up by those who had the town's and the world's welfare at heart, people shun it without knowing exactly why. Perhaps one reason, though it cannot apply to uninformed strangers, is that the natives are now repellently decadent, having gone far along that path of retrogression so common in many New England backwaters. 
They have come to form a race by themselves, with the well-defined mental and physical stigmata of degeneracy and inbreeding. The average of their intelligence is woefully low, whilst their annals reek of overt viciousness and of half-hidden murders, incests, and deeds of almost unnameable violence and perversity. The old gentry, representing the two or three armigerous families which came from Salem in 1692, have kept somewhat above the general level of decay, though many branches are sunk into the sordid populace so deeply that only their names remain as a key to the origin they disgrace. Some of the Waitleys and bishops still send their eldest sons to Harvard and Miskatonic, though those sons seldom return to the moldering gambrel roofs under which they and their ancestors were born. No one, even those who have the facts concerning the recent horror, can say just what is the matter with Dunwich. Though old legends speak of unhallowed rites and conclaves of the Indians, amidst which they called forbidden shapes of shadow out of the great rounded hills, and made wild, orgiastic prayers that were answered by loud crackings and rumblings from the ground below. In 1747, the Reverend Abijah Hoadley, newly come to the Congregational Church at Dunwich Village, preached a memorable sermon on the close presence of Satan and his imps, in which he said, it must be allowed that these blasphemies of an infernal train of demons are matters of too common knowledge to be denied. The cursed voices of Azazel and Buzrael, of Beelzebub and Belial, being heard now from underground by above a score of credible witnesses now living. I myself did not more than a fortnight ago catch a very plain discourse of evil powers in the hill behind my house, wherein there were a rattling and rolling, groaning, screeching and hissing, such as no things of this earth could raise up, and which must needs have come from those caves that only black magic can discover, and only the devil unlock. Mr. Hoadley disappeared soon after delivering this sermon, but the text printed in Springfield is still extant. Noises in the hills continued to be reported from year to year and still form a puzzle to geologists and physiographers. Other traditions tell of foul odors near the hill-crowning circles of stone pillars and of rushing, airy presences to be heard faintly at certain hours from stated points at the bottom of the great ravines, while still others try to explain the devil's hop-yard, a bleak, blasted hillside where no tree, shrub, or grass blade will grow. And too, the natives are mortally afraid of the numerous whippoorwills which grow vocal on warm nights. It is vowed that the birds are psychopomps lying in wait for the souls of the dying, and that they time their eerie cries in unison with the sufferer's struggling breath. If they can catch the fleeing soul when it leaves the body, they instantly flutter away, chittering in demonic laughter, but if they fail, they subside gradually into a disappointed silence. These tales, of course, are obsolete and ridiculous, because they come down from very old times. Dunwich is indeed ridiculously old, older by far than any of the communities within thirty miles of it. South of the village one may still spy the cellar walls and chimney of the ancient bishop house, which was built before 1700, whilst the ruins of the mill at the falls, built in 1806, form the most modern piece of architecture to be seen. Industry did not flourish here, and the 19th century factory movement proved short-lived. Oldest of all are the great rings of rough-hewn stone columns on the hilltops, but these are more generally attributed to the Indians than to the settlers. Deposits of skulls and bones found within these circles and around the sizable table-like rock on Sentinel Hill sustain the popular belief that such spots were once the burial places of the Pecumtucks, even though many ethnologists, disregarding the absurd improbability of such a theory, persist in believing the remains Caucasian. 2. It was in the township of Dunwich, in a large and partly inhabited farmhouse set against a hillside four miles from the village and a mile and a half from any other dwelling, that Wilbur Waitley was born at 5 a.m. on Sunday, the 2nd of February, 1913. This date was recalled because it was Candlemas, which people in Dunwich curiously observe under another name, and because the noises in the hills had sounded and all the dogs of the countryside had barked persistently throughout the night before. Less worthy of notice was the fact that the mother was one of the decadent Waitleys, a somewhat deformed, unattractive albino woman of thirty-five, living with an aged and half-insane father, about whom the most frightful tales of wizardry had been whispered in his youth. 
Lavinia Waitley had no known husband, but according to the custom of the region made no attempt to disavow the child, concerning the other side of whose ancestry the country folk might, and did speculate as widely as they chose. On the contrary, she seemed strangely proud of the dark, goatish-looking infant who formed such a contrast to her own sickly and pink-eyed albinism and was heard to mutter many curious prophecies about its unusual powers and tremendous future. Lavinia was one who would be apt to mutter such things, for she was a lone creature given to wandering amidst thunderstorms in the hills and trying to read the great, odorous books which her father had inherited through two centuries of Waitley's and which were fast falling to pieces with age and wormholes. She had never been to school, but was filled with disjointed scraps of ancient lore that old Waitley had taught her. The remote farmhouse had always been feared because of old Waitley's reputation for black magic, and the unexplained death by violence of Mrs. Waitley, when Lavinia was twelve years old, had not helped to make the place popular. Isolated among strange influences, Lavinia was fond of wild and grandiose daydreams and singular occupations. Nor was her leisure much taken up by household cares in a home from which all standards of order and cleanliness had long since disappeared. There was a hideous screaming which echoed above even the hill noises and the dogs barking on the night Wilbur was born, but no known doctor or midwife presided at his coming. Neighbors knew nothing of him till a week afterward, when old Waitley drove his sleigh through the snow into Dunwich Village and discoursed incoherently to the group of loungers at Osborne's general store. There seemed to be a change in the old man— an added element of furtiveness in the clouded brain which subtly transformed him from an object to a subject of fear, though he was not one to be perturbed by any common family event. Amidst it all he showed some trace of the pride later noticed in his daughter, and what he said of the child's paternity was remembered by many of his hearers years afterward. I don't care what folks think. If Lavinie's boy looked like his pa, he wouldn't look like nothing ye expect. You needn't think the only folks is the folks hereabouts. Lavinie's read some, and has seed some things the most of ye only tell about. I calculate her man is as good a husband as ye can find this side of Aylesbury. And if ye knowed as much about the hills as I do, ye wouldn't ask no better church wedding nor hern. Let me tell you something. Some day you folks will hear a child o' Lavinie's a-callin' its father's name on the top o' Sentinel Hill. The only persons who saw Wilbur during the first month of his life were old Zechariah Waitley of the undecayed Waitleys and Earl Sawyer's common-law wife, Mamie Bishop. Mamie's visit was frankly one of curiosity, and her subsequent tales did justice to her observations. But Zechariah came to lead a pair of Alderney cows which old Waitley had bought of his son Curtis. This marked the beginning of a course of cattle buying on the part of small Wilbur's family, which ended only in 1928 when the Dunwich horror came and went. Yet at no time did the ramshackle Waitley barn seem overcrowded with livestock. There came a period when people were curious enough to steal up and count the herd that grazed precariously on the steep hillside above the old farmhouse, and they could never find more than ten or twelve anemic, bloodless-looking specimens. Evidently some blight or distemper perhaps sprung from the unwholesome pasturage or the diseased fungi and timbers of the filthy barn caused a heavy mortality among the Waitley animals. Odd wounds or sores, having something of the aspect of incisions, seemed to inflict the visible cattle, and once or twice during the earlier months certain callers fancied they could discern similar sores about the throats of the grey, unshaven old man and his slatternly, crinkly-haired albino daughter. In the spring after Wilbur's birth, Lavinia resumed her customary rambles in the hills, bearing in her misproportioned arms the swarthy child. Public interest in the Waitleys subsided after most of the country folk had seen the baby, and no one bothered to comment on the swift development which that newcomer seemed every day to exhibit. Wilbur's growth was indeed phenomenal, for within three months of his birth he had attained a size and muscular power not usually found in infants under a full year of age. His motions and even his vocal sounds showed a restraint and deliberateness highly peculiar in an infant and no one was really unprepared when at seven months he began to walk unassisted, with falterings which another month was sufficient to remove. It was somewhat after this time, on Halloween, that a great blaze was seen at midnight on the top of Sentinel Hill, where the old table-like stone stands amidst its tumulus of ancient bones. 
Considerable talk was started when Silas Bishop of the undecayed bishops mentioned having seen the boy running sturdily up that hill ahead of his mother about an hour before the blaze was remarked. Silas was rounding up a stray heifer, but he nearly forgot his mission when he fleetingly spied the two figures in the dim light of his lantern. They darted almost noiselessly through the underbrush, and the astonished watcher seemed to think they were entirely unclothed. Afterward, he could not be sure about the boy, who may have had some kind of a fringed belt and a pair of dark trunks or trousers on. Wilbur was never subsequently seen alive and conscious without complete and tightly buttoned attire, a disarrangement or threatened disarrangement of which always seemed to fill him with anger and alarm. His contrast with his squalid mother and grandfather in this respect was thought very notable, until the horror of 1928 suggested the most valid of reasons. The next January, gossips were mildly interested in the fact that Lavinia's black brat had commenced to talk, and at the age of only eleven months. His speech was somewhat remarkable, both because of its difference from the ordinary accents of the region, and because it displayed a freedom from infantile lisping of which many children of three or four might well be proud. The boy was not talkative, yet when he spoke he seemed to reflect some elusive element wholly unpossessed by Dunwich and its denizens. The strangeness did not reside in what he said, or even in the simple idioms he used, but seemed vaguely linked with his intonation or with the internal organs that produced the spoken sounds. His facial aspect, too, was remarkable for its maturity. For though he shared his mother's and grandfather's chinlessness, his firm and precociously shaped nose united with the expression of his large, dark, almost Latin eyes to give him an air of quasi-adulthood and well-nigh preternatural intelligence. He was, however, exceedingly ugly despite his appearance of brilliancy, there being something almost goatish or animalistic about his thick lips, large-pored, yellowish skin, coarse, crinkly hair, and oddly elongated ears. He was soon disliked even more decidedly than his mother and grandsire, and all conjectures about him were spiced with references to the bygone magic of old Waitley, and how the hills once shook when he shrieked the dreadful name of Yog sototh in the midst of a circle of stones with a great book open in his arms before him. Dogs abhorred the boy, and he was always obliged to take various defensive measures against their barking menace. 3. Meanwhile, old Waitley continued to buy cattle without measurably increasing the size of his herd. He also cut timber and began to repair the unused parts of his house, a spacious, peaked-roof affair whose rear end was buried entirely in the rocky hillside and whose three least-ruined ground-floor rooms had always been sufficient for himself and his daughter. There must have been prodigious reserves of strength in the old man to enable him to accomplish so much hard labor. And though he still babbled dementedly at times, his carpentry seemed to show the effects of sound calculation. It had already begun as soon as Wilbur was born, when one of the many tool sheds had been put suddenly in order, clabbered and fitted with a stout, fresh lock. Now, in restoring the abandoned upper story of the house, he was a no less thorough craftsman. His mania showed itself only in his tight boarding up of all the windows in the reclaimed section, though many declared that it was a crazy thing to bother with the reclamation at all. Less inexplicable was his fitting up of another downstairs room for his new grandson, a room which several callers saw, though no one was ever admitted to the closely boarded upper story. This chamber he lined with tall, firm shelving, along which he began gradually to arrange, in apparently careful order, all the rotting ancient books and parts of books which during his own day had been heaped promiscuously in odd corners of the various rooms. I made some use of them, he would say as he tried to mend a torn black-letter page with paste prepared on the rusty kitchen stove, but the boy's fitten to make better use of them. He ought to have them as well sought as he kin, for they're going to be all of his larning. When Wilbur was a year and seven months old, in September of 1914, his size and accomplishments were almost alarming. He had grown as large as a child of four, and was a fluent and incredibly intelligent talker, he ran freely about the fields and hills and accompanied his mother on all her wanderings. At home he would pore diligently over the queer pictures and charts in his grandfather's books while old Waitley would instruct and catechize him through long, hushed afternoons. By this time the restoration of the house was finished, and those who watched it wondered why one of the upper windows had been made into a solid plank door. 
It was a window in the rear of the east gable end, close against the hill, and no one could imagine why a cleated wooden runway was built up to it from the ground. About the period of this work's completion, people noticed that the old tool house, tightly locked and windowlessly clabbered since Wilbur's birth, had been abandoned again. The door swung listlessly open, and when Earl Sawyer once stepped within after a cattle-selling call on old Waitley, he was quite discomposed by the singular odor he encountered, such a stench, he averred, as he had never before smelt in all his life except near the Indian circles on the hills, and which could not come from anything sane or of this earth. But then, the homes and sheds of Dunwich folk have never been remarkable for olfactory immaculateness. The following months were void of visible events, save that everyone swore to a slow but steady increase in the mysterious hill noises. On May Eve of 1915 there were tremors which even the Aylesbury people felt, whilst the following Halloween produced an underground rumbling queerly synchronized with bursts of flame, them which Waitley's doings, from the summit of Sentinel Hill. Wilbur was growing up uncannily, so that he looked like a boy of ten as he entered his fourth year. He read avidly by himself now, but talked much less than formerly. A settled taciturnity was absorbing him, and for the first time people began to speak specifically of the dawning look of evil in his goatish face. He would sometimes mutter an unfamiliar jargon and chant in bizarre rhythms which chilled the listener with a sense of unexplainable terror. The aversion displayed toward him by dogs had now become a matter of wide remark, and he was obliged to carry a pistol in order to traverse the countryside in safety. His occasional use of the weapon did not enhance his popularity amongst the owners of canine guardians. The few callers at the house would often find Lavinia alone on the ground floor, while odd cries and footsteps resounded in the boarded-up second story. She would never tell what her father and the boy were doing up there, though once she turned pale and displayed an abnormal degree of fear when a jocose fish peddler tried the locked door leading to the stairway. That peddler told the store loungers at Dunwich Village that he thought he heard a horse stamping on that floor above. The loungers reflected, thinking of the door and runway, and of the cattle that so swiftly disappeared. Then they shuddered as they recalled tales of old Waitley's youth, and of the strange things that are called out of the earth when a bullock is sacrificed at the proper time to certain heathen gods. It had for some time been noticed that dogs had begun to hate and fear the whole Waitley place as violently as they hated and feared young Wilbur personally. In 1917 the war came, and Squire Sawyer Waitley, as chairman of the local draft board, had hard work finding a quota of young Dunwich men fit even to be sent to a development camp. The government, alarmed at such signs of wholesale regional decadence, sent several officers and medical experts to investigate, conducting a survey which New England newspaper readers may still recall. It was the publicity attending this investigation which set reporters on the track of the Waitleys and caused the Boston Globe and Arkham Advertiser to print flamboyant Sunday stories of young Wilbur's precociousness, old Waitley's black magic, the shelves of strange books, the sealed second story of the ancient farmhouse, and the weirdness of the whole region and its hill noises. Wilbur was four and a half then and looked like a lad of fifteen. His lips and cheeks were fuzzy with a coarse, dark down, and his voice had begun to break. Earl Sawyer went out to the Waitley place with both sets of reporters and cameramen and called their attention to the queer stench which now seemed to trickle down from the sealed upper spaces. It was, he said, exactly like a smell he had found in the tool shed abandoned when the house was finally repaired, and like the faint odors which he sometimes thought he caught near the stone circles on the mountains. Dunwich folk read the stories when they appeared, and grinned over the obvious mistakes. They wondered, too, why the writers made so much of the fact that old Waitley always paid for his cattle and gold pieces of extremely ancient date. The Waitleys had received their visitors with ill-concealed distaste, though they did not dare court further publicity by violent resistance or refusal to talk. 4. For a decade the annals of the Waitleys sink indistinguishably into the general life of a morbid community, used to their queer ways and hardened to their May Eve and All Hallows orgies. Twice a year they would light fires on the top of Sentinel Hill, at which times the mountain rumblings would recur with greater and greater violence, while at all seasons there were strange and portentous doings at the lonely farmhouse. In the course of time, callers professed to hear sounds in the sealed upper story, even when all the family were downstairs, and they wondered how swiftly or how lingeringly a cow or bullock was usually sacrificed. 
There was talk of a complaint to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, but nothing ever came of it, since Dunwich folk are never anxious to call the outside world's attention to themselves. About 1923, when Wilbur was a boy of ten, whose mind, voice, stature, and bearded face gave all the impressions of maturity, a second great siege of carpentry went on at the old house. It was all inside the sealed upper part, and from bits of discarded lumber people concluded that the youth and his grandfather had knocked out all the partitions and even removed the attic floor, leaving only one vast open void between the ground story and the peaked roof. They had torn down the great central chimney, too, and fitted the rusty range with a flimsy outside tin stovepipe. In the spring after this event, Hold Waitley noticed the growing number of whippoorwills that would come out of Cold Spring Glen to chirp under his window at night. He seemed to regard the circumstance as one of great significance, and told the loungers at Osborne's that he thought his time had almost come. They whistle just in tune with my breathing now, he said, and I guess they're getting ready to catch my soul. They know it's a going out, and don't calculate to miss it. You'll know, boys, arter I'm gone, whether they get me or not. If they do, they'll keep up a singin' and laughin' till break a day. If they don't, they'll kinder quiet down like. I expect them and the souls they hunts fur have some pretty tough tussles sometimes. On Lammas night, 1924, Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury was hastily summoned by Wilbur Waitley, who had lashed his one remaining horse through the darkness and telephoned from Osborne's in the village. He found old Waitley in a very grave state, with a cardiac action and stertorous breathing that told of an end not far off. The shapeless albino daughter and oddly bearded grandson stood by the bedside, whilst from the vacant abyss overhead there came a disquieting suggestion of rhythmical surging or lapping as of the waves on some level beach. The doctor, though, was chiefly disturbed by the chattering night birds outside, a seemingly limitless legion of whippoorwills that cried their endless message in repetitions timed diabolically to the wheezing gasps of the dying man. It was uncanny and unnatural. Too much, thought Dr. Houghton, like the whole of the region he had entered so reluctantly in response to the urgent call. Toward one o'clock old Waitley gained consciousness and interrupted his wheezing to choke out a few words to his grandson. More space, Willie. More space soon. You grows, and that grows faster. It'll be ready to sarve ye soon, boy. Open up the gates to Yog Sototh with the long chant that you'll find on page 751 of the complete edition, and then put a match to the prison. Fire from earth can't burn it nohow. He was obviously quite mad. After a pause, during which the flock of whippoorwills outside adjusted their cries to the altered tempo, while some indications of the strange hill noises came from afar off, he added another sentence or two. Feed it regular, Willie, and mind the quantity, but don't let it grow too fast for the place, for ef it busts quarters or gets out afore ye opens the yog sototh, it's all over and no use. Only them from beyond can make it multiply and work. Only them, the old uns, as wants to come back. But speech gave place to gasps again, and Lavinia screamed at the way the whippoorwills followed the change. It was the same for more than an hour when the final throaty rattle came. Dr. Houghton drew shrunken lids over the glazing gray eyes as the tumult of birds faded imperceptibly to silence. Lavinia sobbed, but Wilbur only chuckled whilst the hill noises rumbled faintly. They didn't get him, he muttered in his heavy bass voice. Wilbur was by this time a scholar of really tremendous erudition in his one-sided way, and was quietly known by correspondence to many librarians in distant places where rare and forbidden books of old days are kept. He was more and more hated and dreaded around Dunwich because of certain youthful disappearances which suspicion laid vaguely at his door, but was always able to silence inquiry through fear or through use of that fund of old-time gold which still, as in his grandfather's time, went forth regularly and increasingly for cattle buying. He was now tremendously mature of aspect, and his height, having reached the normal adult limit, seemed inclined to wax beyond that figure. In 1925, when a scholarly correspondent from Miskatonic University called upon him one day and departed pale and puzzled, he was fully six and three-quarters feet tall. 
Through all the years, Wilbur had treated his half-deformed albino mother with a growing contempt, finally forbidding her to go to the hills with him on May Eve and Hollow Mass, and in 1926 the poor creature complained to Mamie Bishop of being afraid of him. "'They's more about him as I knows than I can tell ye, Mamie,' she said, "'and nowadays they's more nor what I know myself. "'I vow a fur God. "'I don't know what he wants, nor what he's a-trying to do.' "'That Halloween hill noises sounded louder than ever, "'and fire burned on Sentinel Hill as usual, "'but people paid more attention to the rhythmical screaming "'of vast flocks of unnaturally belated whippoorwills "'which seemed to be assembled near the unlighted Waitley farmhouse.' After midnight, the shrill notes burst into a kind of pandemoniac cachination, which filled all the countryside, and not until dawn did they finally quiet down. Then they vanished, hurrying southward where they were fully a month overdue. What this meant, no one could quite be certain till later. None of the country folk seemed to have died, but poor Lavinia Waitley, the twisted albino, was never seen again. In the summer of 1927, Wilbur repaired two sheds in the farmyard and began moving his books and effects out to them. Soon afterward, Earl Sawyer told the loungers at Osborne's that more carpentry was going on in the Waitley farmhouse. Wilbur was closing all the doors and windows on the ground floor and seemed to be taking out partitions as he and his grandfather had done upstairs four years before. He was living in one of the sheds, and Sawyer thought he seemed unusually worried and tremulous. People generally suspected him of knowing something about his mother's disappearance, and very few ever approached his neighborhood now. His height had increased to more than seven feet, and showed no signs of ceasing its development. 5. The following winter brought an event no less strange than Wilbur's first trip outside the Dunwich region. Correspondence with the Widener Library at Harvard, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Museum, the University of Buenos Aires, and the Library of Miskatonic University of Arkham had failed to get him the loan of a book he desperately wanted, so at length he set out in person, shabby, dirty, bearded, and uncouth of dialect, to consult the copy at Miskatonic, which was the nearest to him geographically. Almost eight feet tall and carrying a cheap new valise from Osborne's general store, this dark and goatish gargoyle appeared one day in Arkham in quest of the dreaded volume kept under lock and key at the college library, the hideous Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Alhazred in Oleus Wormius's Latin version as printed in Spain in the seventeenth century. He had never seen the city before, but had no thought save to find his way to the university grounds, where indeed he passed heedlessly by the great white-fanged watchdog that barked with unnatural fury and enmity and tugged frantically at its stout chain. Wilbur had with him the priceless but imperfect copy of Dr. D.'s English version, which his grandfather had bequeathed him, and upon receiving access to the Latin copy, he at once began to collate the two texts with the aim of discovering a certain passage which would have come on the 751st page of his own defective volume. This much he could not civilly refrain from telling the librarian, the same erudite Henry Armitage, A.M. Miskatonic, Ph.D. Princeton, Lit D. Johns Hopkins, who had once called at the farm, and who now politely plied him with questions. He was looking, he had to admit, for a kind of formula or incantation containing the frightful name Yog sototh and it puzzled him to find discrepancies, duplications, and ambiguities which made the matter of determination far from easy. As he copied the formula he finally chose, Dr. Armitage looked involuntarily over his shoulder at the open pages the left-hand one of which, in the Latin version, contained such monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world. "'Nor is it to be thought,' ran the text as Armitage mentally translated it, "'that man is either the oldest or the last of earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be, not in the spaces we know, but between them. They walk serene and primal, undimensioned and to us unseen. Yog sototh knows the gate. Yog sototh is the gate. Yog sototh is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yog sototh He knows where the old ones broke through of old and where they shall break through again. 
He knows where they have trod earth's fields, and where they still tread them, and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind. And of those are there many sorts, differing in likeness from man's truest idolon, to that shape without sight or substance which is them. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places where the words have been spoken, and the rites howled through at their seasons. The wind gibbers with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They bend the forest and crush the city, yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Cadeth in the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows Cadeth? The ice desert of the south and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraven. But who hath seen the deep frozen city, or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Thulu is their cousin, yet can he spy them only dimly? Ya! Shub Negurath! As a foulness shall ye know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. Yog Sototh is the key to the gate whereby the spheres meet. Man rules now where they ruled once. They shall soon rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter summer. They wait, patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. Dr. Armitage, associating what he was reading with what he had heard of Dunwich and its brooding presences, and of Wilbur Waitley and his dim, hideous aura that stretched from a dubious birth to a cloud of probable matricide, felt a wave of fright as tangible as a draft of the tomb's cold clamminess. The bent, goatish giant before him seemed like the spawn of another planet or dimension, like something only partly of mankind and linked to black gulfs of essence and entity that stretch like titan phantasms beyond all spheres of force and matter, space and time. Presently Wilbur raised his head and began speaking in that strange, resonant fashion which hinted at sound-producing organs unlike the run of mankind's. "'Mr. Armitage,' he said, "'I calculate I've got to take that book home.' There's things in it I've got to try under certain conditions that I can't git here, and it'd be a mortal sin to let a red-tape rule hold me up. Let me take it along, sir, and I'll swear they won't nobody know the difference. I don't need to tell you I'll take good care of it. It wa'n't me that put this D copy in the shape it is. He stopped as he saw the firm denial on the librarian's face, and his own goatish features grew crafty. Armitage, half ready to tell him he might make a copy of what parts he needed, thought suddenly of the possible consequences and checked himself. There was too much responsibility in giving such a being the key to such blasphemous outer spheres. Waitley saw how things stood and tried to answer lightly. Wow. All right, if you feel that way about it. Maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. And without saying more, he rose and strode out of the building, stooping at each doorway. Armitage heard the savage yelping of the great watchdog and studied Waitley's gorilla-like lope as he crossed the bit of campus visible from the window. He thought of the wild tales he had heard and recalled the old Sunday stories in the advertiser, these things and the lore he had picked up from Dunwich rustics and villagers during his one visit there. Unseen things not of earth, or at least not of tridimensional earth, rushed fetid and horrible through New England's glens and brooded obscenely on the mountaintops. Of this he had long felt certain. Now he seemed to sense the close presence of some terrible part of the intruding horror and to glimpse a hellish advance in the black dominion of the ancient and once passive nightmare. He locked away the Necronomicon with a shudder of disgust, but the room still reeked with an unholy and unidentifiable stench. As a foulness shall ye know them, he quoted. Yes, the odor was the same as that which had sickened him at the Waitley farmhouse less than three years before. He thought of Wilbur, goatish and ominous once again, and laughed mockingly at the village rumors of his parentage. Inbreeding, Armitage muttered half aloud to himself, Great God, what simpletons! 
Show them Arthur Mackin's great god Pan, and they'll think it a common Dunwich scandal. But what thing, what cursed, shapeless influence on or off this three-dimensioned earth was Wilbur's father? Born on Candlemas, nine months after May Eve of 1912, when the talk about the queer earth noises reached clear to Arkham, what walked on the mountains that May night? What rude mass horror fastened itself on the world in half-human flesh and blood? During the ensuing weeks, Dr. Armitage set about to collect all possible data on Wilbur Waitley and the formless presences around Dunwich. He got in communication with Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury, who had attended old Waitley in his last illness, and found much to ponder over in the grandfather's last words, as quoted by the physician. A visit to Dunwich Village failed to bring out much that was new, but a close survey of the Necronomicon, in those parts which Wilbur had sought so avidly, seemed to supply new and terrible clues to the nature, methods, and desires of the strange evil so vaguely threatening this planet. Talks with several students of archaic lore in Boston, and letters to many others elsewhere, gave him a growing amazement which passed slowly through varied degrees of alarm to a state of really acute spiritual fear. As the summer drew on, he felt dimly that something ought to be done about the lurking terrors of the upper Miskatonic Valley, and about the monstrous being known to the human world as Wilbur Waitley. 6. The Dunwich Horror itself came between Lammas and the Equinox in 1928, and Dr. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Waitley's grotesque trip to Cambridge, and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. Those efforts had been in vain, since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians, having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared the results of being away long. Early in August, the half-expected outcome developed, and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of the savage watchdog on the college campus. Deep and terrible, the snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued, always in mounting volume, but with hideously significant pauses. Then there rang out a scream from a wholly different throat, such a scream as roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterward such a scream as could come from no being born of earth or wholly of earth. Armitage, hastening into some clothing and rushing across the street and lawn to the college buildings, saw that others were ahead of him and heard the echoes of a burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. An open window showed black and gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance, for the barking and the screaming, now fast fading into a mixed growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. Some instinct warned Armitage that what was taking place was not a thing for unfortified eyes to see, so he brushed back the crowd with authority as he unlocked the vestibule door. Among the others he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, men to whom he had told some of his conjectures and misgivings, and these two he motioned to accompany him inside. The inward sounds, except for a watchful, droning whine from the dog, had by this time quite subsided but Armitage now perceived with a sudden start that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a damnably rhythmical piping, as if in unison with the last breaths of a dying man. The building was full of a frightful stench, which Dr. Armitage knew too well, and the three men rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second nobody dared to turn on the light. Then Armitage summoned up his courage and snapped the switch. One of the three, it is not certain which, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before them among disordered tables and overturned chairs. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half-bent on its side in a fetid pool of greenish-yellow ichor and tarry stickiness was almost nine feet tall, and the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. Bits of shoe leather and fragments of apparel were scattered about the room, and just inside the window an empty canvas sack lay where it had evidently been thrown. Near the central desk a revolver had fallen, a dented but undischarged cartridge later explaining why it had not been fired. 
The thing itself, however, crowded out all other images at the time. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it, but one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life-forms of this planet and of the three known dimensions. It was partly human beyond a doubt, with very manlike hands and head, and the goatish, chinless face had the stamp of the Waitleys upon it. But the torso and lower parts of the body were teratologically fabulous, so that only generous clothing could ever have enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest, where the dog's rending paws still rested watchfully, had the leathery, reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black, and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst, for here all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long, greenish-gray tentacles with red, sucking mouths protruded limply. Their arrangement was odd, and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system. On each of the hips, deep-set in a kind of pinkish, ciliated orbit, was what seemed to be a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of a tail there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. The limbs, save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians and terminated in ridgy-veined pads that were neither hooves nor claws. When the thing breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed color, as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles this was observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance which alternated with a sickly grayish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Of genuine blood there was none, only the fetid greenish-yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor beyond the radius of the stickiness and left a curious discoloration behind it. As the presence of the three men seemed to rouse the dying thing, it began to mumble without turning or raising its head. Dr. Armitage made no written record of its mouthings, but asserts confidently that nothing in English was uttered. At first the syllables defied all correlation with any speech of earth, but toward the last there came some disjointed fragments evidently taken from the Necronomicon, that monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. These fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like Nagai, Naga, Ga, Bug Shugag, Yaha, Yog Sototh, Yog Sototh. They trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwills shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. There came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised its head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. Outside the windows the shrilling of the whippoorwills had suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd there came the sound of a panic-struck whirring and fluttering. Against the moon vast clouds of feathery watchers rose and raced from sight, frantic at that which they had sought for prey. All at once the dog started up abruptly, gave a frightened bark, and leaped nervously out of the window by which it had entered. A cry rose from the crowd, and Dr. Armitage shouted to the men outside that no one must be admitted till the police or medical examiner came. He was thankful that the windows were just too high to permit of peering in, and drew the dark curtains carefully down over each one. By this time two policemen had arrived, and Dr. Morgan, meeting them in the vestibule, was urging them for their own sakes to postpone entrance to the stench-filled reading room till the examiner came and the prostrate thing could be covered up. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice. But it is permissible to say that, aside from the external appearance of face and hands, the really human element of Wilbur Waitley must have been very small. When the medical examiner came, there was only a sticky whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently Waitley had had no skull or bony skeleton, at least in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father.
7. Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Waitley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging, lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Waitley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to be still in progress amongst the innumerable Waitleys, decayed and undecayed, of the upper Miskatonic Valley. An almost interminable manuscript in strange characters, written in a huge ledger and adjudged a sort of diary because of the spacing and the variations in ink and penmanship, presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it on the old bureau which served as its owner's desk. After a week of debate, it was sent to Miskatonic University, together with the deceased's collection of strange books, for study and possible translation, but even the best linguists soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. No trace of the ancient gold with which Wilbur and old Waitley always paid their debts has yet been discovered. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening, and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps, Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey. "'Up there in the rud beyond the glen, Miss Corey, they suthin' been there. It smells like thunder, and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the rud like they'd a house been moved along of it. And that ain't the wust, nother. There's prints in the rud, Miss Corey, great round prints as big as barrel heads all sunk down deep like a elephant had been along, only they's a sight more nor four feet could make.' I looked at one or two afore I run, and I see every one was covered with lines spreadin' out from one place like as if big palm-leaf fans, twice or three times as big as any they is, had have been pounded down into the rud, and the smell was awful, like what it is around Wizard Waitley's old house. Here he faltered, and seemed to shiver afresh with the fright that had sent him flying home. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors, thus starting on its round the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, housekeeper at Seth Bishop's, the nearest place to Waitley's, it became her turn to listen instead of transmit, for Sally's boy Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward Waitley's and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place and at the pasturage where Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. "'Yes, Miss Corey,' came Sally's tremulous voice over the party wire. "'Chancy, he'd just come back a-postin' and couldn't half talk for being scared. "'He says old Waitley's house is all blowed up, "'with the timbers scattered round like they'd been dynamite inside, "'only the bottom floor ain't through, "'but is all covered with a kind o' tar-like stuff "'that smells awful and drips down often the ages onto the ground, "'while the side timbers is blown away.' And they's awful kinder marks in the yard, too, great round marks, bigger round than a hogshead, and all sticky with stuff like is on the blowed-up house. Chancy, he says they leads off into the meadows, where a great swath wider than a barn is matted down, and all the stun walls tumbled every which way, wherever it goes. And he says, says he, Miss Corey, as how he sought to look for Seth's cows, frightened as he was, and found em in the upper pasture nigh the devil's hop-yard in an awful shape. Half on em's clean gone, and nigh half of them that's left is sucked most dry of blood, with sores on em like they's been on Waitley's cattle ever since Lavinia's black brat was born. 
Seth, he's gone out now to look at him, though I'll vow he weren't keer to get very nigh Wizard Waitley's. Chancy didn't look careful to see where the big matted down swath led after it left the pasturage, but he says he think it pinted toward the Glen Rudd to the village. I tell you, Miss Corrie, they something abroad, as hadn't daughter be abroad, and I for one think that Black Wilbur Whateley, as come to the bad een he desarved, is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He want all human hisself, I allus says to everybody, and I think he and old Whateley must a raised something in that there nailed up house as ain't even so human as he was. They's allus been unseen things around Dunwich, living things as ain't human and ain't good for human folks. The ground was a talkin' last night, and towards mornin', Chancy he heard the whippoorwills so loud in Call Spring Glen he couldn't sleep none. Then he thought he heard another faint like sound over towards Wizard Waitley's, a kind of rippin' or tearin' a wood, like some big box or crate was bein' opened fur off. What with this and that, he didn't get to sleep at all till sun up, and no sooner was he up this mornin', but he's got to go over to Waitley's and see what's the matter. He see enough, I tell you, Miss Corey. This don't mean no good, and I think as all the men folks ought to get up a party and do something. I know something awful's about, and feel my time is nigh, though only God know just what it is. Did your Luther take account o' where them big tracks led to? No? Well, Miss Corey, if they was on the Glen Rudd this side of the Glen, and ain't got to your house yet, I calculate they must go into the Glen itself. They would do that. I always says Call Spring Glen ain't no healthy nor decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was creatures o' God. And they's them as says ye can hear strange things a rushin' and a talkin' in the air down there, if ye stand in the right place, atween the rock falls and bear's den. By that noon, fully three quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new-made Waitley ruins and Cold Spring Glen. Examining in horror the vast, monstrous prince, the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great sinister ravine, for all the trees on the bank were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice hanging underbrush. It was as though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable fetter. And it is not to be wondered at that the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue, rather than descend and beard the unknown Cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than concoct a humorous paragraph about it, an item soon afterward reproduced by the Associated Press. That night everyone went home, and every house and barn was barricaded as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage. About two in the morning, a frightful stench and the savage barking of the dogs awakened the household at Elmer Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, and all agreed that they could hear a sort of muffled swishing or lapping sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed telephoning the neighbors, and Elmer was about to agree when the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came apparently from the barn, and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stamping amongst the cattle. The dogs slavered and crouched close to the feet of the fear-numbed family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit, but knew it would be death to go out into that black farmyard. The children and the womenfolk whimpered, kept from screaming by some obscure vestigial instinct of defense which told them their lives depended on silence. At last the noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moaning, and a great snapping, crashing, and crackling ensued. The Fries, huddled together in the sitting-room, did not dare to move until the last echoes died away far down in Cold Spring Glen. Then, amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demoniac piping of late whippoorwills in the Glen, Selina Fry tottered to the telephone and spread what news she could of the second phase of the horror. The next day all the countryside was in a panic, and cowed, uncommunicative groups came and went where the fiendish thing had occurred. 
Two titan paths of destruction stretched from the glen to the fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle, only a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Waitley, of a branch that hovered about halfway between soundness and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practiced on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition ran strong, and his memories of chantings in the great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside too passive to organize for real defense. In a few cases, closely related families would band together and watch in the gloom under one roof. But in general, there was only a repetition of the barricading of the night before and a futile, ineffective gesture of loading muskets and setting pitchforks handily about. Nothing, however, occurred except some hill noises, and when the day came, there were many who hoped that the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. There were even bold souls who proposed an offensive expedition down in the glen, although they did not venture to set an actual example to the still reluctant majority. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, though there was less huddling together of families. In the morning, both the Fry and the Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs and vague sounds and stenches from afar, while early explorers noted with horror a fresh set of the monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemously stupendous bulk of the horror, whilst the conformation of the tracks seemed to argue a passage in two directions, as if the moving mountain had come from Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a thirty-foot swath of crushed shrubbery saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that even the most perpendicular places did not deflect the inexorable trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff of almost complete verticality, and as the investigators climbed around to the hill's summit by safer routes, they saw that the trail ended, or rather reversed, there. It was here that the Waitleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by the table-like stone on May Eve and Hallow Mass. Now that very stone formed the center of a vast space thrashed around by the mountainous horror, whilst upon its slightly concave surface was a thick and fetid deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Waitley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. Then they looked down the hill. Apparently the horror had descended by a route much the same as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ideas of motivation stood confounded. Only old Zebulon, who was not with the group, could have done justice to the situation or suggested a plausible explanation. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and about 3 a.m. all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receivers heard a fright-mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh, my God! And some thought a crashing sound followed the breaking off of the exclamation. There was nothing more. No one dared do anything, and no one knew till morning whence the call came. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and found that only the fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered, only a stench and a tarry stickiness. The Elmer Fries had been erased from Dunwich. 8. In the meantime, a quieter yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed door of a shelf-lined room in Arkham. 
The curious manuscript record or diary of Wilbur Waitley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in languages both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaded Arabic used in Mesopotamia, being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher, though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue, even when applied on the basis of every tongue the writer might conceivably have used. The ancient books taken from Waitley's quarters, while absorbingly interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science, were of no assistance whatever in this matter. One of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp was in another unknown alphabet, this one of a very different cast and resembling Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Waitley matter and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formulae of antiquity in the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from old times and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital, since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that, considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formulae and incantations. Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Dr. Armitage knew, from the repeated failures of his colleagues, that the riddle was a deep and complex one, and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a trial. All through late August he fortified himself with the massed lore of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of his own library, and wading night after night amidst the arcana of Trithemius's Polygraphia, Giambattista Porta's De Furtivis Literarum Notis, De Viginaire's Traité des Chiffres, Falconer's Cryptomenesis Patefacta, Davies and Thickness's eighteenth-century treatises, and such fairly modern authorities as Blair, von Martin, and Kluber's Cryptographic. He interspersed his study of the books with attacks on the manuscript itself, and in time became convinced that he had to deal with one of those subtlest and most ingenuous of cryptograms in which many separate lists of corresponding letters are arranged like the multiplication table and the message built up with arbitrary keywords known only to the initiated. The older authorities seemed rather more helpful than the newer ones, and Armitage concluded that the code of the manuscript was one of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long line of mystical experimenters. Several times he seemed near daylight, only to be set back by some unforeseen obstacle. Then, as September approached, the clouds began to clear. Certain letters, as used in certain parts of the manuscript, emerged definitely and unmistakably, and it became obvious that the text was indeed in English. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and Dr. Armitage read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Waitley's Annals. It was in truth a diary, as all had thought, and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that Armitage deciphered, an entry dated November 26, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, he remembered, by a child of three and a half, who looked like a lad of twelve or thirteen. Today learned the Aklo for the Sabworth, it ran, which did not like, it being answerable from the hill and not from the air. That upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain. Shot Elam Hutchins' collie Jack when he went to bite me, and Elam says he would kill me if he dast. I guess he won't. Grandfather kept me saying the dough formula last night, and I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off, if I can't break through with the dough na formula when I commit it. They from the air told me at Sabbat it will be years before I can clear off the earth, and I guess Grandfather will be dead then, so I shall have to learn all the angles of the plains and all the formulas between the Ur and the Ninger. 
They from outside will help, but they cannot take body without human blood. That upstairs looks it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the Vorish sign or blow the powder of Ibn Ghazi at it, and it is near like them at May Eve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared and there are no earth beings on it. He that came from the Aklo Saboth said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under the electric light, turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. He had nervously telephoned his wife he would not be home, and when she brought him a breakfast from the house he could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day he read on, now and then halted maddeningly as a reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought him, but he ate only the smallest fraction of either. Toward the middle of the next night he drowsed off in his chair, but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to man's existence that he had uncovered. On the morning of September 4th, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing him for a while and departed trembling and ashen gray. That evening he went to bed, but slept only fitfully. Wednesday, the next day, he was back at the manuscript, and began to take copious notes both from the current sections and from those he had already deciphered. In the small hours of that night, he slept a little in an easy chair in his office, but was at the manuscript again before dawn. Sometime before noon, his physician, Dr. Hartwell, called to see him and insisted that he cease work. He refused, intimating it was of the most vital importance for him to complete the reading of the diary and promising an explanation in due course of time. That evening, just as twilight fell, he finished his terrible perusal and sank back exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half-comatose state, but he was conscious enough to warn her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander toward the notes he had taken. Weakly rising, he gathered up the scribbled papers and sealed them all in a great envelope, which he immediately placed in his inside coat pocket. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, But what, in God's name, can we do? Dr. Armitage slept, but was partly delirious the next day. He made no explanations to Hartwell, but in his calmer moments spoke of the imperative need of a long conference with Rice and Morgan. His wilder wanderings were very startling indeed, including frantic appeals that something in a boarded-up farmhouse be destroyed, and fantastic references to some plan for the extirpation of the entire human race and all animal and vegetable life from the earth by some terrible elder of beings from another dimension. He would shout that the world was in danger, since the elder things wished to strip it and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen by gentillions of eons ago. At other times he would call for the dreaded Necronomicon and the Demonolatria of Remigius, in which he seemed hopeful of finding some formula to check the peril he conjured up. Stop them! Stop them! he would shout. Those Waitleys meant to let them in, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur came here to his death, and at that rate... But Armitage had a sound physique despite his seventy-three years, and slept off his disorder that night without developing any real fever. He woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference, and the rest of that day and evening the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculation and the most desperate debate. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stacked shelves and from secure places of storage, and diagrams and formulae were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism there was none. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Waitley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. Opinions were divided as to notifying the Massachusetts State Police, and the negative finally won. 
There were things involved which simply could not be believed by those who had not seen a sample, as indeed was made clear during certain subsequent investigations. Late at night the conference disbanded without having developed a definite plan, but all day Sunday Armitage was busy comparing formulae and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more he reflected on the hellish diary, the more he was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Waitley had left behind him, the earth-threatening entity which, unknown to him, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the memorable Dunwich Horror. Monday was a repetition of Sunday, with Dr. Armitage, for the task in hand required an infinity of research and experiment. Further consultations of the monstrous diary brought about various changes of plan, and he knew that even in the end a large amount of uncertainty must remain. By Tuesday he had a definite line of action mapped out, and believed he would try a trip to Dunwich within a week. Then on Wednesday the great shock came. Tucked obscurely away in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser was a facetious little item from the Associated Press telling what a record-breaking monster the bootleg whiskey of Dunwich had raised up. Armitage, half-stunned, could only telephone for Rice and Morgan. Far into the night they discussed, and the next day was a whirlwind of preparation on the part of them all. Armitage knew he would be meddling with terrible powers, yet saw that there was no other way to annul the deeper and more malign meddling which others had done before him. 9. Friday morning, Armitage, Rice, and Morgan set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about one in the afternoon. The day was pleasant, but even in the brightest sunlight a kind of quiet dread and portent seemed to hover above the strangely domed hills and the deep, shadowy ravines of the stricken region. Now and then on some mountain top, a gaunt circle of stones could be glimpsed against the sky. From the air of hushed fright at Osborne's store, they knew something hideous had happened and soon learned of the annihilation of the Elmer Fry house and family. Throughout that afternoon they rode around Dunwich, questioning the natives concerning all that had occurred, and seeing for themselves with rising pangs of horror the drear Fry ruins with their lingering traces of the tarry stickiness, the blasphemous tracks in the Fry yard, the wounded Seth Bishop cattle, and the enormous swathes of disturbed vegetation in various places. The trail up and down Sentinel Hill seemed to Armitage of almost cataclysmic significance, and he looked long at the sinister altar-like stone on the summit. At length the visitors apprised of a party of state police, which had come from Aylesbury that morning in response to the first telephone reports of the fried tragedy, decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, they found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in a car, but now the car stood empty near the ruins in the fry yard. The natives, all of whom had talked with policemen, seemed at first as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. Then old Sam Hutchins thought of something and turned pale, nudging Fred Farr and pointing to the dank, deep hollow that yawned close by. "'God!' he gasped. I told em not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody'd do it with them tracks and that smell and the whippoorwills a-screechin' down there in the dark o' noonday. A cold shudder ran through natives and visitors alike, and every ear seemed strained in a kind of instinctive, unconscious listening. Armitage, now that he had actually come upon the horror and its monstrous work, trembled with the responsibility he felt to be his. Night would soon fall, and it was then that the mountainous blasphemy lumbered upon its eldritch course. Negotium perambulans in tenebris. The old librarian rehearsed the formulae he had memorized and clutched the paper containing the alternative one he had not memorized. He saw that his electric flashlight was in working order. Rice beside him took from a valise a metal sprayer of the sort used in combating insects, whilst Morgan uncased the big-game rifle on which he relied despite his colleagues' warnings that no material weapon would be of help. Armitage, having read the hideous diary, knew painfully well what kind of a manifestation to expect, but he did not add to the fright of the Dunwich people by giving any hints or clues. He hoped that it might be conquered without any revelation to the world of the monstrous thing it had escaped. 
As the shadows gathered, the natives commenced to disperse homeward, anxious to bar themselves indoors, despite the present evidence that all human locks and bolts were useless before a force that could bend trees and crush houses when it chose. They shook their heads at the visitors' plan to stand guard at the fry ruins near the glen, and as they left, had little expectancy of ever seeing the watchers again. There were rumblings under the hills that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while a wind sweeping up out of cold spring glen would bring a touch of ineffable fetor to the heavy night air, such a fetor as all three of the watchers had smelled once before, when they stood above a dying thing that had passed for fifteen years and a half as a human being. But the looked-for terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and Armitage told his colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanly, and the night sounds ceased. It was a gray, bleak day, with now and then a drizzle of rain, and heavier and heavier clouds seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. The men from Arkham were undecided what to do. Seeking shelter from the increasing rainfall beneath one of the few undestroyed fry outbuildings, they debated the wisdom of waiting, or of taking the aggressive and going down into the glen in quest of their nameless, monstrous quarry. The downpour waxed in heaviness, and distant peals of thunder sounded from far horizons. Sheet lightning shimmered, and then a forky bolt flashed near at hand, as if descending into the accursed glen itself. The sky grew very dark, and the watchers hoped that the storm would prove a short, sharp one followed by clear weather. It was still gruesomely dark when, not much over an hour later, a confused babble of voices sounded down the road. Another moment brought to view a frightened group of more than a dozen men, running, shouting, and even whimpering hysterically. Someone in the lead began sobbing out words, and the Arkham men started violently when those words developed a coherent form. "'Oh, my God, my God!' the voice choked out. "'It's a-goin' again, and this time by day. "'It's out, it's out, and a-movin' this very minute, "'and only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all.' The speaker panted into silence, but another took up his message. Nigh on an hour ago, Zeb Waitley here heard the phone a ringin', and it was Miss Corey, George's wife that lives down by the junction. She says the hired boy Luther was out driving in the cows from the storm out of the big bolt when he see all the trees abendin' at the mouth o' the glen opposite side ter this, and smelt the same awful smell like he smelt when he found the big tracks last Monday morning. "'And she says he says there was a swishin', lappin' sound, "'more nor what the bendin' trees and bushes could make, "'and all on a sudden the trees along the rud "'begun to get pushed one side, "'and they was a awful stompin' and splashin' in the mud. "'But mind ye, Luther, he didn't see nothin' at all, "'only just the bendin' trees and underbrush. "'Then fur ahead where Bishop's Brook goes under the rud, "'he heard a awful creakin' and strainin' on the bridge, "'and says he could tell the sound o' wood a-startin' to crack and split, "'and all the whiles he never see a thing, "'only them trees and bushes a-bendin'. "'And when the swishin' sound got very fur off, "'on the rud toward Wizard Waitley's and Sentinel Hill, "'Luther, he had the guts to step up where he'd heard it first "'and look at the ground. "'It was all mud and water, and the sky was dark, and the rain was wiping out all tracks about as fast as could be, but beginning at the glen mouth where the trees had moved, there was still some of them awful prints, big as barrels, like he seen Monday. At this point the first excited speaker interrupted. But that ain't the trouble now. That was only the start. Zeb here was calling folks up, and everybody was a-listening in when a call from Seth Bishop's cut in. His housekeeper Sally was carrying on fit to kill, She'd just seen the trees abandoned beside the rud, and says they was a kind of mushy sound, like a elephant puffin' and treadin' a headin' for the house. Then she up and spoke sudden to a fearful smell, and says her chancy was a screamin' as how it was just like what he smelt up to the weighty ruins Monday morning, and the dogs was all barkin' and whinin' awful. And then she let out a terrible yell and says the shed down the rud had just caved in like the storm had blowed it over, only the wind wasn't strong enough to do that. Everybody was a-listening, and we could hear lots of folks on the wire a-gaspin. 
All to once, Sally, she yell again, and says the front yard picket fence had just crumbled up, though they want no sign o' what done it. Then everybody on the line could hear Chancy and old Seth Bishop ye yellin' too, and Sally was shrieking out that something heavy had struck the house, not lightning nor nothing, but something heavy agin the front, and kept a launchin' itself again and again, though ye couldn't see nothing out the front winders, and then, and then, lines of fright deepened on every face, and Armitage, shaken as he was, had barely poise enough to prompt the speaker, and then. Sally, she yelled out, Oh, help, the house is a caving in. And on the wire we could hear a terrible crashing and a whole flock of screaming, just like when Elmer Fry's place was tuck, only wuss. The man paused, and another of the crowd spoke. That's all. Not a sound nor squeak over the phone arter that. Just still like. We that heard it got out fords and wagons and rounded up as many able-bodied men folks as we could get at Corey's place and come up here to see what you thought best to do. Not but what I think it's the Lord's judgment for our iniquities that no mortal can ever set aside. Armitage saw that the time for positive action had come and spoke decisively to the faltering group of frightened rustics. We must follow it, boys. He made his voice as reassuring as possible. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You men know that those Waitleys were wizards. Well, this thing is a thing of wizardry, and must be put down by the same means. I've seen Wilbur Waitley's diary, and read some of the strange old books he used to read, and I think I know the right kind of spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course, one can't be sure, but we can always take a chance. It's invisible. I knew it would be, but there's a powder in this long-distance sprayer that might make it show up for a second. Later on we'll try it. It's a frightful thing to have alive, but it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world has escaped. Now we've only this one to fight, and it can't multiply. It can, though, do a lot of harm, so we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. We must follow it, and the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I don't know your roads very well, but I've got an idea that there might be a shorter cut across lots. How about it? The men shuffled about a moment, and then Earl Sawyer spoke softly, pointing with a grimy finger through the steadily lessening rain. I guess you can get to Seth Bishop's quickest by cutting across the lower meadow here, wading the brook at the low place and climbing through Carrier's Mowen and the timber lot beyond. That comes out in the upper road, might nigh Seth's, a little t'other side. Armitage, with Rice and Morgan, started to walk in the direction indicated, and most of the natives followed slowly. The sky was growing lighter, and there were signs that the storm had worn itself away. When Armitage inadvertently took a wrong direction, Joe Osborne warned him and walked ahead to show the right one. Courage and confidence were mounting though the twilight of the almost perpendicular wooded hill which lay toward the end of their shortcut, and among whose fantastic ancient trees they had to scramble as if up a ladder, put these qualities to a severe test. At length they emerged on a muddy road to find the sun coming out. They were a little beyond the Seth Bishop place, but bent trees and hideously unmistakable tracks showed what had passed by. Only a few moments were consumed in surveying the ruins just around the bend, it was the fry incident all over again, and nothing dead or living was found in either of the collapsed shells which had been the bishop house and barn. No one cared to remain there amidst the stench and tarry stickiness, but all turned instinctively to the line of horrible prints leading on toward the wrecked Waitley farmhouse and the altar-crowned slopes of Sentinel Hill. As the men passed the site of Wilbur Waitley's abode, they shuddered visibly and seemed again to mix hesitancy with their zeal. It was no joke tracking down something as big as a house that one could not see, but that had all the vicious malevolence of a demon. Opposite the base of Sentinel Hill, the tracks left the road, and there was a fresh bending and matting visible along the broad swath, marking the monster's former route to and from the summit. Armitage produced a pocket telescope of considerable power and scanned the steep green side of the hill. Then he handed the instrument to Morgan, whose sight was keener. After a moment of gazing, Morgan cried out sharply, passing the glass to Earl Sawyer and indicating a certain spot on the slope with his finger. 
saw you're as clumsy as most non-users of optical devices are, fumbled a while, but eventually focused the lenses with Armitage's aid. When he did so, his cry was less restrained than Morgan's had been. God almighty, the grass and bushes is a-moving. It's a-going up. Slow-like, creeping up to the top this minute. Heaven only knows what fur. Then the germ of panic seemed to spread among the seekers. It was one thing to chase the nameless entity, but quite another to find it. Spells might be all right, but suppose they weren't. Voices began questioning Armitage about what he knew of the thing, and no reply seemed quite to satisfy. Everyone seemed to feel himself in close proximity to phases of nature and of being utterly forbidden and wholly outside the sane experience of mankind. 10. In the end, the three men from Arkham, old, white-bearded Dr. Armitage, stocky, iron-gray Professor Rice, and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan, ascended the mountain alone. After much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use, they left the telescope with the frightened group that remained in the road, and as they climbed they were watched closely by those among whom the glass was passed around. It was hard going, and Armitage had to be helped more than once. High above the toiling group, the great swath trembled as its hellish maker repassed with snail-like deliberateness. Then it was obvious that the pursuers were gaining. Curtis Waitley, of the undecayed branch, was holding the telescope when the Arkham party detoured radically from the swath. He told the crowd that the men were evidently trying to get to a subordinate peak which overlooked the swath at a point considerably ahead of where the shrubbery was now bending. This indeed proved to be true, and the party were seen to gain the minor elevation only a short time after the invisible blasphemy had passed it. Then Wesley Corey, who had taken the glass, cried out that Armitage was adjusting the sprayer which Rice held, and that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling that this sprayer was expected to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Two or three men shut their eyes, but Curtis Waitley snatched back the telescope and strained his vision to the utmost. He saw that Rice, from the party's point of vantage above and behind the entity, had an excellent chance of spreading the potent powder with marvelous effect. Those without the telescope saw only an instant's flash of gray cloud, a cloud about the size of a moderately large building near the top of the mountain. Curtis, who had held the instrument, dropped it with a piercing shriek into the ankle-deep mud of the road. He reeled and would have crumpled to the ground had not two or three others seized and steadied him. All he could do was moan half inaudibly, Oh, oh, great God, that, that... There was a pandemonium of questioning, and only Henry Wheeler thought to rescue the fallen telescope and wipe it clean of mud. Curtis was past all coherence, and even isolated replies were almost too much for him. Bigger in a barn. All made of squirming ropes. All things sort of shaped like a hen's egg, bigger than anything, with dozens of legs like hogsheads that have shut up when they step. Nothing solid about it, all like jelly, and made of separate wriggling ropes pushed close together, great bulging eyes all over it, Ten or twenty mouths or trunks are sticking out all along the sides, big as stovepipes, and all a tossin' and openin' and shuttin', all gray with kind of blue or purple rings, and God in heaven, that half face on top. This final memory, whatever it was, proved too much for poor Curtis, and he collapsed completely before he could say more. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins carried him to the roadside and laid him on the damp grass. Henry Wheeler, trembling, turned the rescued telescope on the mountain to see what he might. Through the lenses were discernible three tiny figures apparently running toward the summit as fast as the steep incline allowed. Only these, nothing more. Then everyone noticed a strangely unseasonable noise in the deep valley behind and even in the underbrush of Sentinel Hill itself. It was the piping of unnumbered whippoorwills, and in their shrill chorus there seemed to lurk a note of tense and evil expectancy. Earl Sawyer now took the telescope and reported the three figures as standing on the topmost ridge, virtually level with the altar stone, but at a considerable distance from it. One figure, he said, seemed to be raising its hands above its head at rhythmic intervals, and as Sawyer mentioned the circumstance, the crowd seemed to hear a faint, half-musical sound from the distance, as if a loud chant were accompanying the gestures. 
The weird silhouette on that remote peak must have been a spectacle of infinite grotesqueness and impressiveness, but no observer was in a mood for aesthetic appreciation. "'I guess he's saying the spell,' whispered Wheeler as he snatched back the telescope. The whippoorwills were piping wildly, and in a singularly curious, irregular rhythm quite unlike that of the visible ritual. Suddenly the sunshine seemed to lessen without the intervention of any discernible cloud. It was a very peculiar phenomenon, and was plainly marked by all. A rumbling sound, brewing beneath the hills, mixed strangely with a concordant rumbling which clearly came from the sky. Lightning flashed aloft, and the wondering crowd looked in vain for the portents of storm. The chanting of the men from Arkham now became unmistakable, and Wheeler saw through the glass that they were all raising their arms in the rhythmic incantation. From some farmhouse far away came the frantic barking of dogs. The change in the quality of the daylight increased, and the crowd gazed about the horizon in wonder. A purplish darkness, born of nothing more than a spectral deepening of the sky's blue, pressed down upon the rumbling hills. Then the lightning flashed again, somewhat brighter than before, and the crowd fancied that it had showed a certain mistiness around the altar stone on the distant height. No one, however, had been using the telescope at that instant. The whippoorwills continued their irregular pulsation, and the men of Dunwich braced themselves tensely against some imponderable menace with which the atmosphere seemed surcharged. Without warning came those deep, cracked, raucous vocal sounds which will never leave the memory of the stricken group who heard them. Not from any human throat were they born, for the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather would one have said they came from the pit itself, had not their source been so unmistakably the altar stone on the peak. It is almost erroneous to call them sounds at all, since so much of their ghastly, infrabase timbre spoke to dim seats of consciousness and terror far subtler than the ear. Yet one must do so, since their form was indisputably, though vaguely, that of half-articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and the thunder above which they echoed, yet did they come from no visible being. And because imagination might suggest a conjectural source in the world of non-visible beings, the huddled crowd at the mountain's base huddled still closer and winced as if in expectation of a blow. Nay! Nay! Thing! Na yog sototh rang the hideous croaking out of space. Ib think hey Kurgulf. The speaking impulse seemed to falter here, as if some frightful psychic struggle were going on. Henry Wheeler strained his eye at the telescope, but saw only the three grotesquely silhouetted human figures on the peak, all moving their arms furiously in strange gestures as their incantation drew near its culmination. From what black wells of acherontic fear or feeling, from what unplumbed gulfs of extracosmic consciousness or obscure, long-latent heredity were those half-articulate thunder croakings drawn? Presently they began to gather renewed force and coherence as they grew in stark, utter, ultimate frenzy. A ya 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 ha! A ya 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 ya! Nya! Nya! Ya! Ya! Help! Help! Father, father, Yog Sototh. But that was all. The pallid group in the road, still reeling at the indisputably English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone, were never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently at the terrific report which seemed to rend the hills. The deafening, cataclysmic peal whose source, be it inner earth or sky, no hearer was ever able to place. A single lightning bolt shot from the purple zenith to the altar stone, and a great tidal wave of viewless force and indescribable stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside. 
Trees, grass, and underbrush were whipped into a fury, and the frightened crowd at the mountain's base, weakened by the lethal feeder that seemed about to asphyxiate them, were almost hurled off their feet. Dogs howled from the distance, green grass and foliage wilted to a curious, sickly yellow-gray, and over field and forest were scattered the bodies of dead whippoorwills. The stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day there is something queer and unholy about the growths on and around that fearsome hill. Curtis Waitley was only just regaining consciousness when the Arkham men came slowly down the mountain, in the beams of a sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. They were grave and quiet, and seemed shaken by memories and reflections even more terrible than those which had reduced the group of natives to a state of cowed quivering. In reply to a jumble of questions they only shook their heads and reaffirmed one vital fact. The thing has gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of and can never exist again. It was an impossibility in a normal world. Only the least fraction was really matter in any sense we know. It was like its father, and most of it has gone back to him in some vague realm or dimension outside our material universe, some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy could ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence, and in that pause the scattered senses of poor Curtis Waitley began to knit back into a sort of continuity, so that he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up where it had been left off, and the horror of the sight that had prostrated him burst in upon him again. Oh, oh, my God, that half-face, that half-face on top of it, that face with the red eyes and crinkly albino hair and no chin like the Waitley's. It was a octopus, centipede, spider sort of thing, but there was a half-shaped man's face on top of it, and it looked like Wizard Waitley's, only it was yards and yards across. He paused, exhausted, as the whole group of natives stared in a bewilderment not quite crystallized into fresh terror. Only old Zebulon Waitley, who wanderingly remembered ancient things, but who had been silent heretofore, spoke aloud. Fifteen year gone, he rambled. I heard old Waitley say as how some day we'd hear a child o' Lavinies a callin' its father's name on top of Sentinel Hill. But Joe Osborne interrupted him to question the Arkham men anew. What was it anyhow? And however did young wizard Waitley call it out o' the air it come from? Armitage chose his words very carefully. It was, well, it was mostly a kind of force that doesn't belong in our part of space, a kind of force that acts and grows and shapes itself by other laws than those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things from outside, and only very wicked people and very wicked cults ever try to. There was some of it in Wilbur Waitley himself, enough to make a devil and a precocious monster of him, and to make his passing out a pretty terrible sight. I'm going to burn his accursed diary, and if you men are wise, you'll dynamite that altar stone up there, and pull down all the rings of standing stones on the other hills. Things like that brought down the beings those Waitleys were so fond of, the beings they were going to let in tangibly to wipe out the human race and drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as to this thing we've just sent back, the Waitleys raised it for a terrible part in the doings that were to come. It grew fast and big from the same reason that Wilbur grew fast and big, but it beat him because it had a greater share of the outsideness in it. You needn't ask how Wilbur called it out of the air. He didn't call it out. It was his twin brother, but it looked more like the father than he did.'